So as we are getting ready to go live, we're, we're uh, initially planning on starting by talking about the riots that erupted in Philadelphia last night, because I covered this earlier. And as you know, uh, I still live there. We've been setting up the new, stu- uh, new studio in the new space, but I was literally just back in the Philly area, in the Philly burbs the other day. And so uh, chaos, riots, looting, it, it erupted. There was a, a pickup truck rammed into, a, 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 a was driving at a high rate of speed, went through a row of cops. A bunch of the cops jumped out of the way, but one got run o- ran over, broke her leg, got taken to the hospital. So it's pretty serious stuff. But as we were doing this, we got breaking news that the Trump campaign website got hacked. And I was like, we, that's breaking right now. Probably should talk about it. And then it turns out like nothing really happened. Hmm. It was just like, so, so we'll, we'll briefly talk about it, I suppose, because I thought it was very, very significant. But as there's a ton of people already in the chat because we are joined today by libertarian socialist, anti-fascist, Vosh. Thank, uh, yeah, just about Vosh. Hey, how you Vosh. doing? Vosh, yeah, there we go. There you go. And uh, look, we had, uh, we had Enrique Tari of the Proud Boys. I said, we'll get, we'll get somebody from the left in. It's very difficult to get a lot of people on the left. So I, I appreciate you, you coming in and hanging out. We've been we've we've been hanging out and talking. I think we're gonna we're, we're probably gonna have some arguments about the riots, about a ton yes. of stuff. But I, to, I just want to say to anybody who thinks that we're gonna have like a blood sports style debate, you're you're not correct. We don't do this. And so I'm just gonna tell you right now, fair warning. You're mostly all gonna be dissatisfied. I, I'm we're, we're, I don't I don't I don't I, you know I didn't bring on uh, the Enrique Tario to literally just attack him and get into a big debate with him. I ask him some questions. I, you know, I challenge him on some of his ideas and mostly just try to understand him. We're going to do the same thing with, with Vosh. Vosh, right? I'm pronouncing it right. Yes. Yeah, yeah excellent. And, we're going to, and, I, and I think uh, we're, we're going to have a, a good insight into just a lot of the things we, we don't normally get to hear from, from, I guess, leftists. Is that appropriate? Yeah. Uh, uh, the Real Blood Sports is the upcoming me versus Enrico Tario uh, conversation. <laughs> oh, no. Obviously, that one will be, you know. The, I mean, I, I'd be down if you wanted to have, like, have a, a debate and like because I don't Let's debate do people I'll have a discussion we can talk about stuff Enrique actually mentioned I think ha- debating with you real no way. when he was real? here was it Vosh that he wanted no, to debate no 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 no, no. Oh, probably Hassan, Hassan's the I, I know we look up. so similar yeah. but yeah, Hiker, yeah. Um, yeah um, well I'm terrified of flying so we'll pace him out one at a time but um, I'm not Try principally and opposed have your mic like Right in your mouth and gotcha. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. There yeah, we yeah. go. There, there you go. go. Nailing yeah. it. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Yeah. Yeah. Better. Perfect. So, so just like because the story just broke, I don't want to. I don't, don't want to just ignore it. But apparently, it's like a big nothing burger. Okay. But I, I do want to show this real quick before we do. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Tim Castaro podcast. Of course, Ian. Yo. You know, I didn't. We, we got Ian here. What it is? Uh, mm-hmm. Lydia is producing, as I'm most of you are corner. aware, and I am Tim Pool. And uh, as you all know, uh, Vosh is it's our Vosh guest. V. So we're Vosh V. We're gonna we're gonna uh, argue about a lot of stuff, probably, and we'll talk about news. But uh, uh, hit the like button, subscribe, notification bell. We do the show Monday through Friday, live at eight p.m. And and just so everybody knows, we're totally down to have literally anybody come into the studio and and have a debate. I know there are some people who are like, Tim, why won't you have the far right on? I'm like. Oh, Do said it. We wouldn't. We'll, no we'll, one said we wouldn't. I, I, interviewed a, I interviewed a Soviet general in Ukraine during the Euromaidan stuff. I interviewed a Brazilian gang leader. Well, it just it, look, there's, there, there are some limits. Like, I'm not going to bring, like, you know, some just, lunatic know. serial killer into my house. What about, like, a good content, though? It would be great. Be awesome. Like he's trapped to the cherry screaming, I'll kill you. And I was like, that's interesting. Why do you want to kill me? To kill it's me? true. Before I came on, they were actually, there was a possum outside they were going to bring into my place. So I'm not special. <laughs> it really is. Um, it's true. And that also would be good content. Also oh, true. yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. I like what you think. Well, let's, 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 let's first do this. Uh, you know, this is a breaking story. Uh, Trump's campaign website is seized by hackers who claim to have what? evidence that proves his criminal what? involvement with foreign actors to manipulate the 2020 election. Mm. Of course, as of right now, his website is back to normal. We checked. And so I saw this and I was like, whoa, this this is like, you know, something's going to come. Let's 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 launch with this. And then it's just a big nothing burger. These things happen. But the gist of the story is his campaign website was seized by Hackers Tuesday. A message reading this site was seized appeared briefly on the homepage of DonaldJTrump.com before the website was taken offline completely just after 7.20 p.m. The message continued that the world has had enough of fake news spreaded Mm -hmm. daily by the president. It is time to allow the world to know the truth. The hackers behind the stunt claimed to have compromised multiple of the president's devices Seems like uh, grammatical errors aren't unique to the hackers. Daily Mail, come on, get a copy of it. <laughs> that gave them full access to Trump and his relatives, along with access to confidential information. Strictly classified information is exposed, proving that the Trump government is involved in the origins of the coronavirus, the Post read. We have evidence that completely discredits Mr. Trump as president, proving his criminal involvement and cooperation with foreign actors manipulating the 2020 elections. The U.S. citizens have no choice. Okay. Hmm. 
it's a nothing burger. Mm-hmm. I, I almost feel kind of dumb that we even decided to bring it up because oh, I was I like, like it. it was like breaking news, and I'm like, oh wow, we got we got it. what's going on. Oh, I think you've got it though. Same typos in the actual Daily Mail writing and in the thing. Maybe they did it. The Daily Mail. Yeah, the the, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the inside mail. scoop. Yeah, man, there it is. That makes perfect sense. We've we've busted. Nah, you they're know, making the news. I, right. I, I, I gotta really be honest. Are. Daily Mail has needs needs to hire some copy editors to like you know they have grammatical errors all the time. Of 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 all the outlets, you know, there's 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 that. But uh, we we so look that's that's the gist of it. So Tim, was it true what they were saying that they were trying to blame Trump for the COVID crisis? What's going on there? What the hackers? Yeah, that's what I heard. I heard that they were trying to blame Trump for this, and they were like, "This so is a big deal." I mentioned earlier is the U.S. government and the Chinese government are all these governments working together to create a bioweapon in a Chinese lab that then got out. That's like Tim a movie said, script, dude. Yeah. That's just one, no. I'm 100 percent behind it. <laughs> yes, the, the, I like what it. I really? Well, the, well, the incorrect well half the 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 bad grammar kind of leaves like involved in the origins i mean i think trump flubbed the covid response sure but involved in creating coronavirus i don't know like um that that'd be a pretty sensational claim right it's pretty ridiculous maybe they saw borat they were inspired you know creative flourish but i don't know maybe could explain why the grammar was wrong they made it put it in china so they could blame china i've heard that it wasn't just a chinese company working out of that lab like other where did you hear this um i read it on the oh, internet no. yeah oh, no, okay uh, I, I read that it was like some company that fauci was involved with was working at the oh, lab no. in wuhan i do uh, i don't have the documents That's in front lot, of me man. yeah i give up i met but but uh, i met fauci he admitted to it though it's true oh it's oh, true. really yeah. oh snap so so uh, well let's let's dive cool. in you just let's said you think there, trump yeah. uh you think trump flubbed the the response oh yeah 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 for sure i think i mean one of the problems is we don't actually have a metric for knowing what success looks like every pandemic response Absolutely is unique you know um would hillary clinton have done better or worse the fact of the matter is america is its own country no other country is a perfect comparison we also have a very decentralized government states are given a lot of autonomy when it comes to responses which can be a downside when it comes to stuff like this i think there were a lot of things that he did wrong from a sort of habitual tendency to downplay the severity of the virus we know of course that he was informed of its severity but didn't want people to panic which seems like it was an effort to keep stock investors from sort Mm -hmm. of you know hard selling uh, which may or may not have worked. We know, of course, there was a crash later anyway. But the thing that bothers me the most about the whole response is that I don't actually think there's a metric that Republicans would, like a line where they would say, that's too many deaths. Because right now it's at 225,000-ish. Yeah. And I feel like, and Trump's saying, well, you know, they said it was going to be 2 million, which was the estimate if nothing was done. So what if it had hit a million? Would they say, well, that's half of what was expected? If it hit 2 million, would Trump have said, well, that's exactly what they said was going to happen? To, to be fair, know. you could say the same thing about the Democrats. Or, you know, if it's right versus left, the Democrats would not have accepted any number at all. Oh, I mean, and if they were in power, I'd be perfectly willing to criticize for them. Absolutely. Yeah. But right now, I mean, we, we this is, I mean, Trump has had, his hands have covered this whole thing. It's true, but it feels like then the, the, the real issue is, do you like Trump or not? I mean, look, 200, 225,000 is, is, is really, really bad. It's horrifying, right? And I mean, even, even Trump has, has said that. We don't know what it could have been or would have been. There's no metric for success, which you pointed out. So it's either, do you... Do you trust him or do you like him or do you not? Well, there are things that he did that I'm reasonably sure like a Hillary Clinton. And by the way, please, for everyone, I don't like Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <They> never, <laughs> we can write that on my tombstone. What about okay. Joe Biden? Do, no, no, no. <laughs> Though I'll, I'll admit, I do like him more than Hillary Clinton. I think he is marginally yeah. more likable okay, than, bad, than yeah. Hillary Clinton. Yeah, Hillary, Hillary Clinton is the bottom of the barrel, man. Yeah. Right, really right. Is. So we're, we're only nowhere to go but up. That's oh, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. But um, oh. yeah, with, so with Trump, when it comes to stuff like, for example, um, uh, downplaying the severity of the virus. I feel like Democrats would have done that to an extent. But when it comes to stuff like habitually like ignoring masks or like sort of arguing with Fauci back and forth to the point where Fauci now needs a security detail to go in his runs because there are a lot of far right groups who think that he's trying to lock down the whole country with him sort of promoting the anti-lockdown protests saying they were taking back the respective states, which has led to additional threats of violence. I feel like stuff like that refers to a particular kind of far-right populism that the Democrats don't have the ability to tap into, you know? What do you, what do you mean? I don't think the Democrats really have the same base of fanatical support in the way that the Trump supporters do. They have, now there are like K-Hive lunatics and those people exist and they're real, but I feel like their antagonism is more directed at sort of uh, 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 chauvinism or anti-progressivism or just in, against any candidate their preferred candidate doesn't like, but this like hardcore ultra-nationalist rejection of a national 
uh, response to COVID. That I think is a particular to the Trump fandom. What what groups, like For, what right wing groups are uh, engaging in this kind of violence and 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 going after people? Well, the violence is fairly. Uh, I mean, a violence like political violence is always going to be a fairly small percentage of the actual harm done here. No political group could ever do harm to rival the two hundred twenty five thousand dead. You know, right. but we tend to wipe that stuff under the rug. This is one of the criticisms that I have as a libertarian socialist, like with the general system that we live in. You know, we'll say like news media will focus a terrorist attack, seven dead. That's horrible, of course. But at the same time, you know, um, pharmaceutical companies are pushing doctors to give unneeded opiates mm -hmm. to people. And in the same yes. period of time, 13,000 people might die. But that that's a statistic. That's not a news story. That just keeps happening. So what I'm worried about isn't the actual political violence. It's about the attitudes we've taken that have allowed COVID to continue to this point. Just today, Trump said, well, as one of his like campaign achievements prior to the election, yeah. conquering COVID-19 on Saturday, highest recorded number of cases in the history of the country in a single day. There, Horrifying. And Mike, Mike Pence has said, I think he said during the debate, he tweeted it and deleted the tweet that Trump locked everything down, which is not the case. There's, there's a lot of complicated stuff here because we're going now from COVID, we're getting into political violence. So I think the simple point I can make, which, which I did, I guess, is when it comes to the COVID response, there's nothing to base it off of. For, for me, I'm kind of like, okay, well, Early on, Trump took action very early on, like it was in January, to form the task force to to to, to spend most uh, to restrict most travel. There was there were some cases in which people could travel from China, eventually to Europe. And Anthony Fauci in March said no one could have done it better. So that was the early response. Dr. Fauci said, "Don't wear masks." We had who was the Surgeon General guy? Don't wear masks. Oh, yeah. I don't know. They both did. They tw they tweeted about it. Fauci Fauci is now saying it was a mistake for him to say not to wear masks. There's a video that the Republicans put out where you've got Kamala Harris and Joe Biden criticizing things Trump has said. And then they show that was Fauci was the one advising, like Fauci was the one saying it publicly. So in this capacity, I, I've been covering this since it started. And I remember Anthony Fauci saying Trump is doing the best. I don't think anyone could do anything better. Now we're several months, you know, we're several months on, we're getting close to election. And all of a sudden, everyone's saying Trump has done a miserable job. Well, to be fair, it's not all of a sudden. I mean, there have been points where Fauci's, and I disagree, by the way, I think initially Fauci's arguing you don't need to use masks was, I mean, the, 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 the logic he used there was that he was trying to disincentivize the purchase of PPE that otherwise needed to go to medical professionals. Yes. And I think it's irresponsible to put that out saying masks aren't effective, or we don't know masks are effective. I think a more responsible way would have been to sort of implore Americans to be responsible with their consumerism you know? you know the weird you know the weirdest thing about it is though early on conservatives are the ones like i'm gonna go buy masks i was getting messaged by people like hey, don't listen to fauci go buy your mask I remember. Well, and now all of a sudden contrarians it's, yeah. yeah exactly but, but it's but it's both like you had you had democrats saying don't wear masks and the conservatives saying wear masks, then it flipped at some point. And now it's the Democrats, or well, I should say the left or whatever it is. I don't think it was that unanimous. I think that for the most part, people were on board with wearing masks. And there was a brief period where we were very concerned about making sure there was enough materials available for the, for the, you know, for the hospitals and for the nurses and what have you. But even early on, and Fauci's in a, in a difficult position here because I have a strong feeling that if Fauci was too critical of the president, he would be replaced for somebody yeah. less so. So Fauci's- Like Dr. Atlas? Yeah, yeah. So if Fauci praises the president, there's kind of like that, okay, how much of this is like the kid getting patted on the shoulder by the teacher and how much of this is like a real political assessment, you know? I don't know. I just think it's a degree of skepticism that we have to apply. With regards to the early response, though, with Trump, though, we know that he defunded the CDC. He eliminated Obama's pandemic response team. He pulled the 44 researchers out of Wuhan who were supposed to investigate the origins of that virus. And while he did stop travel from China quickly, um, he did basically nothing for the next month before stopping it from Europe, by which point it, I think we now know it was pretty much too late. What should he have done? I, I think that um, I think that his and he says this now, like uh, Biden called me xenophobic for locking down China. Which is not true. Biden called him xenophobic, comma, but also. But he was responding to Trump's tweet. Sure, but that's because Trump is pretty xenophobic when it comes to China. If you, you can lock down China without it being like this weird nationalist condemnation of China, you know, you can just say like, oh, they're, they're going through their own stuff right now. Um, what, what could he have done? I think obviously a lockdown from uh, Europe faster would have been preferable. I think a, a um, regardless of what Fauci said, you know, once it was known that masks were available for everyone, that the PPE line was secure. Um, he should have been very on board with promoting their use instead of like tacitly supporting the anti-lockdown, anti-masker protests with his tweets. And most importantly, I think he should have laid out a national plan to help states, to guide states, to give the money necessary. He did. 
to help them. Well, he kind of held it over some of their heads. It was well, like there, there was the three phase plan that he launched earlier in the year of like what to do and how to do it. And then he and then he did this press conference where it was like phase one, phase two, phase three. Here's what you need. I'm the president. I can't control the states. Now it's up to the governors. Sure. But he but he can, though. Like he can, there can, you can do a national mandate. You can order national distribution of resources. And it feels like, and if we get down to the dates, it gets particular here, but there were times when it felt like he was like blackmailing states with support. Like, oh yeah, I'll give you this. I'll give you this, your hospitals need. I'll give you these resources, you know, but you're doing so terribly lately. Just recently he said, I think this was one of the debates. You'll have to forgive me if I don't remember the exact source. He said that, um, he, he didn't care so much about aid for, for some of the stimulus deals um, because they would have gone to high crime Democrat cities. And what this suggests to me is the partisanship of a president who is going to give preferential treatment to bases of support that he knows will vote for him doesn't really care so much is this, about is, other groups. Uh, I, I respect your point. I think it's complicated uh, in terms of Trump's ability to accurately and charismatically convey an idea. I would say he <laughs> lacks that substantially. But one of the one of the issues with giving money to a lot of these states, whether he's legally allowed to do it, there's going to be a lawsuit. You've got these jurisdictions because we'll now move into sort of the political violence stuff when we, we can get into what's going on in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. You've got these jurisdictions that are cutting people loose over and over and over again, and the riots keep going. Mm -hmm. So why should I, as somebody who is, uh, you know, I pay my I pay taxes in a state not having these problems? Mm -hmm. Why should I have those fe federal tax dollars go to a state that's just dumping it into a sinkhole? So now what we have is we have states that have a budget crisis, notably New York is a really good example. Cuomo said, uh, I believe it was last year, God help us if the rich mm -hmm. leave. Then you get Ocasio-Cortez leading a protest in the financial district, which triggers, I guess it was a catalyst for Amazon saying we don't want to bring, bring our 40, 20 to 40,000 jobs here, mm -hmm. which is $30 billion over, over a decade. So now you've got New York City in a budget crisis, and then they go to Trump and say, bail us out. And then Trump says, no. And particularly because you've defunded a billion dollars from your police. You had widespread rioting and looting that wasn't taken care of. You've used taxpayer dollars to put a political message in the street. Why should federal tax dollars go towards what New York is doing when they're acting extremely irresponsibly? Well, I think there are a lot of issues being conflated here. First of all, if we just look broadly at like a state level, we know that's generally red states who underperform when it comes to the investment they need from the federal government as opposed to what they pay in taxes, in large part because red states tend to have a, a, a smaller portion of their population in big cities, which tend to be more mm -hmm. efficient economically. But then like you say, so New York's in a, in a, in a tiff, as it is, undeniably. Yeah. Um, and like Ocasio-Cortez and the marches and the protests, the BLM protests, uh, have caused an amount of damage which is infinitesimal compared to like um, say for example the amount of money that the New York City Police Department spends every year on settlements from police brutality or other miss about a billion uh, a quarter billion a year which exceeds the damage done by any of the protests and that's an every year thing not a uh, 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 an exorbitant you know like once in a half century civil rights protest thing um, when we're talking about the reason why New York is struggling right now it's undeniably because of the impact of COVID and, uh, and that, I mean, that's hurting everyone. New York is a massive city, which means that its supply lines and its industries are going to be more on the razor's edge when it comes to their ability to support the population. Like a farm in a bad economy can hold itself for a while, but 8 million people in a dense urban network needs a lot of support. And I, I just, when it comes to like, how, why should I help these people? I mean, I understand the frustration, I guess. I mean, I grew up in California. Well, oh, 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 hold on. Mm -hmm. Not not so much why should I help these people. I totally understand people of New York need help for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's more of a, if I give money to the city, to the government, are they going to light it on fire? Is it actually going to go to help the people or are they just burning money? Well, I, I mean, I don't I haven't looked at their budget registry for the past. I imagine that most of it goes to the people. But I mean, when it comes to you said defunding the police, I mean, that would mean there's less money going towards yeah. very high, you know, powerful institutions in that in that city. So I feel like if anything, that would aid in the responsible allocation of those funds. What we're talking about right now, ultimately, is how much do you trust city governments to support their people? And my answer unequivocally would be I absolutely do not. But I don't think the solution to that is denying them funds. I think that's the solution to that is a uh, grassroots organization or network or uprising that tries to make our government more accountable to its own people. Yeah, like a blockchain or some sort of database that shows where the money went. I, 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 it's Knowing, a transparency in our cities, like absolute 100%. Everyone should believe in that. I'm, I, I don't think these cities have done a good job at all. I think we are seeing a lot of problems with gross mismanagement. And even before COVID and before the riots, New York was in trouble. That's why I brought up Cuomo saying, you know, God help us if the rich leave. Doesn't that suck, though? 
like, that they're doing a terrible job? Well, I, I mean, that's the thing. Like, again, this could be my libertarian leaning here. I just don't like the fact that, like, cities, in order to function properly, have to suck up to big corporations in the way they currently do. Now, I understand, of course, business is a part of how cities operate. That's how life is. But it feels very often that politicians are more interested in levying the money that they get to suck up to these corporations than they are using other people. Studi uh, stadiums being a big, big, big part of that, you know? Like, well, so, so the, the, I, I don't like Amazon, man. And and, yeah, and, and and yeah, I agree with you for the most part. Politicians sucking up to corporations is a problem. It's a lot of what we're seeing now and we've seen over the past several decades, which has led to the erosion of the manufacturing base in this country. But I, I digress. Uh, where does the money come from? You know, the government doesn't it runs the post office, I guess. What other what other like actual services do the government have in terms of giving a, a service like and making money? It's the post office, I guess. Apart from taxes. So uh, the, the, the government uh, the government doesn't generate revenue in the sense that like a business, the, the government taxes mm -hmm. the existing market. It, it, I think only the post office actually creates an exchange medium for the government where people can exchange currency or whatever. Maybe I'm forgetting something obvious. Tolls? You're talking about the uh, federal government? I'm, what, what I'm saying is like, if Amazon comes into New York, they're bringing currency in that people then trade with Amazon and then the government takes pieces of that. Mm -hmm. And then it says, we're going to allocate, we're going to take this much and then we're going to allocate it to fixing certain things. And I, I got no problem with that. But that's why they need Amazon sure, or they need these companies. But it's but ultimately it is the people who vote politicians in, not corporations. I think that cor we because we don't treat other like interest groups the same way. For example, here's another thing essential to the functioning of society. Teachers. Teachers are we literally need them. Absolutely we do. And yet teachers unions, while powerful in slim areas, teachers are constantly getting their budgets cut. Schools are constantly getting defunded despite this essential element of a functioning society. Um, being something that we need to function in a modern tech-based economy, it's we get they get like no relative power. Corporations get everything when it comes to the delegation of interest from politicians. You know, I think you're right, but I think we need well, one of the problems with government is that what do you do when it goes bad? When when the government programs are no longer working properly, when the teachers are no longer teaching, when the schools are broken, do we just just keep putting money into it, keep spending tax tax and tax, or do we finally cut it off and say? We got to shut it down, turn it off, turn it back on again, because whatever we're doing isn't working. Sure, but denying New York City money during a pandemic isn't going to functionally change the way its government operates. It's only going to hurt people. I think that, and if and also just from a functional perspective, it also bolsters democratic political will. If you're not interested in seeing that happen, seeing the president like hold his hands up and let cities like wilt because of some presumption of you know poor city management it's certainly not just new york you know in fact when it comes to actual like percentage of wealth that goes back to its citizenry in a meaningful way i think new york is fairly in line with a lot of other large cities including some republican one run ones but we don't have those discussions about those cities in, well how are, how are they comparable to republicans in, uh, with regards to um these cities like in terms of the proportion of the money that goes into the city and how it's used how it's distributed new york isn't like some magic sinkhole it's a very large city, but there are other cities that are in comparable spots. I think the big challenge, I guess, is Trump is looking at it from the perspective of, and I can only assume, I don't know, uh, why is a citizen of Wyoming going to pay for what New York is doing? We all if, 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 look, so do you know what happened with Cuomo and the nursing homes? Yeah, but we've been paying for Wyoming for like a century, though. Yeah, but there's like, it's way, way, way less. Because so there are less I, I get people it. in I, Wyoming, I mean. Right, right, right. So the issue is Andrew Cuomo puts sick people in nursing homes. People die. Well, I'm it, not going to defend that. I no, mean, no, right. But, but like the problems were caused by them. You know what I mean? Sure. But and they're like, but I, the I, I'll, I'll be honest. Wyoming, right? You could say the same thing. Like, well, why is Wyoming as a state so poor? Like, why is, does it have to take so much federal money compared to what it earns in taxes? Well, what are those governors doing? What are those city mayors doing? We just never have those conversations. Every time it comes to talk about like um, the responsibility of city government, we always focus it on well, on democratic run strongholds, which is in part because cities tend to be more democratic for a number of really complicated sociological reasons, but also because I don't think we want to acknowledge the fact that this poor city management thing isn't a Democrat problem. There's a functional rot in the way this country treats its citizens, and that operates everything from county all up to the national level. And I wish when we had that conversation, it was less, less partisan, less... Um, Less, less about like getting owns for one or the other. Because I can tell you, if Biden wins, uh, and I hope he does, 
I hope to spend the next four years ruthlessly criticizing him and everyone who supports him <laughs> on these same fundamental points. Right. Because they, they do matter to me. And I agree. New York City is in a lot of ways a you know, irresponsibly run. I want to ask you about Biden, but I feel like we, 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 we kind of glossed over That's before. You mentioned Fauci and uh, threats of violence from the right and things mm -hmm. like that. You, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The general idea you're saying is that Trump, Trump and the right have like fervent supporters of them that are ultra nationalists and willing to be violent. Yeah, I would say more so than the left, at least if we look at like FBI data and crime statistics and such. So this past year, how many uh, like pro Trump things have happened where, you know, like pro Trump groups have gone out and committed mass acts of violence or, or targeted people or killed people or anything like that? I can't tell you if I remember the number. Um, I, I will say, though, it's not I mean, the, the most the, the most thing the, that immediately comes to mind would probably be the Michigan uh, governor kidnapping. And you could argue but those like, guys weren't right wing. Well, they were. I mean, that that one guy was po they said he was an anarchist, but he was well, posting well, memes about killing commies on Facebook. So he definitely wasn't left wing. Um, some, some of them were, uh, I, I think this is one of the things where it gets really complicated. Yeah. But, but these I guys will, are clearly just anti-government. I mean. Sure, I will. But I mean, and then they went after a, a Democratic governor who was being very heavily targeted by the right. And they were seemed to doesn't mean they're right wing. Well, they were reflecting a lot of the rhetoric that was being used. And some of the people out there, pretty sure I, they were MAGA hats. I would need to look back. They were at Black Lives Matter protests, actually, to the guys. So so I'm, I'm not going to pretend those guys were left wing. Mm -hmm. They were just crazy, like, anarchists. Like the guy actually, oh, I, I, as an anarchist, I thoroughly disavow. They were yeah. they were ANCAPs. They were a very different. I don't breed. even know if they were ANCAPs though. Like they were marching with Black Lives Matter. They clearly have some of their social values aligning with leftist groups. Ideologically idiosyncratic, perhaps. But I'm not going to call them leftists. Yeah. I think that's. I think it's absurd. The media says these are right wing militias or whatever, and it's like it's a bunch of crazy guys. It, like you look, you'll see a Trump rally. Mm -hmm. The people in Trump rallies aren't going around attacking people. Well, the, yeah, the, the, that's a little bit simplistic, though, isn't it? I mean, again, political violence, terrorist attacks, these always represent a very small fraction of actual deaths in a country at any given point in time. Absolutely. Like, but it, since we started talking right now, probably you could chalk up 50, 100 people who've died in this country to some sort of pharmaceutical yeah. or, oh, or yeah, military totally. or something like that. Food-induced. Opioids, yeah. man. But I'll be waiting a while until I get to see the next news story about, like, a terrorist attack. I just, when, when I'm concerned about far-right violence, I'm less concerned with, like, the individual terror attacks and more concerned with the fact that their actions seem to reflect a disposition prominent in the Republican Party. Whereas with Antifa, for example, nobody in the Democratic Party is going to defend Antifa. I'll defend Antifa, but they wait, wait, won't. Wait, wait. Has any Democrat disavowed Antifa? Uh, I'm pretty, didn't Biden say he would arrest the, the anarchists and looters? He has never said Antifa or Black Lives Matter extremists. Well, what is a Black Lives Matter extremist? The people in Portland who are wearing Black Lives Matter sweaters and waving flags and throwing explosives at cops. Sure. Well, I mean, I think he said anarchists and looters. I'm pretty sure there's been firm disavowal of people who have committed he's, violence he's, against the he's cops. He's disavowed. So he said violence is wrong and, you know, these people should be arrested. And then when asked, like, will you condemn? What about Antifa? He doesn't say it. Then he yells at the Proud Boys. So I think I would have I think it's I'm pretty sure I remember that him going over that. I know like Antifa doesn't have like a, a base of support amongst the Democratic Party. It tends to be very far left people who hate the Democratic Party. What about Ocasio Cortez, Ilan Omar, and you know, their cohorts? They're soak Dems. I mean they're left leaning compared to America, but if you put them in Europe, they'd be considered center left politicians. But, I, lo but I love I love them, don't get me wrong, but I mean when you start talking about Europe and the US, left and right becomes rather meaningless. Because I know we're talking about Revolution versus status quo? Are we talking about economic policy? Are sure. we well, talking about cultural policy? I think it's fair to say that if you look at Ilhan Omar or AOC, they're probably not on the revolutionary side of the argument, just judging by the career paths they've chosen. But uh, the, the Antifa people are, are almost to a man going to be very far left, very uh, anti-establishment types who are, are probably as disgusted by the Democrats as they are the Republicans. So. A lot of people like to bring up Antifa all the time. Mm -hmm. And when, like a lot of the stuff we saw in Portland, I've actually said repeatedly, stop calling them Antifa. They're wearing Black Lives Matter sweaters. They're flying flags that say Black Lives Matter. They have plastic shields that say Black Lives Matter on it. Mm -hmm. The way I explain it to people is if you go to a large group of people and say, how many of you want to protest in the name of Antifa or anti-fascism, whatever, you'll get a decent people saying yes. If you go to the average person, a group of people and say, how many of you want to go protest for Black Lives Matter? More of them will say yes. So I definitely think you have people who were previously flying the Antifa flag, now flying Black Lives Matter. But you have way more people joining in the ranks of, the, of that violence in the name of Black Lives Matter, which is funded through 
uh, uh, Act Blue, which is the Democrats fundraising platform, has been re- routinely supported by almost every, I would, I would say every national Democratic politician. Well, my problem is that this is the exact same logic that people use to condemn the civil rights protesters of the 1960s. Anytime you have a lot of civil unrest, there are going to be groups at different levels of radicalization that get involved. Most of the civil rights protesters, ye back in the day 50, 60 years ago, probably boomers, you know, just like middle class, fairly progressive black or non-black people who just wanted to see their rights achieved. And amongst those people, there have always been socialists and anarchists and much more left-leaning people. And sometimes those groups, or sometimes even the regular moderate folk, will clash with the police. And the problem is is that when we focus on this violence, especially with a movement as large as Black Lives Matter, which, if judging by the number of people who participate in these rallies goes, the largest civil rights protest in all of American history. When we start saying like, well, these few people threw rocks at cops here, and then we're talking about fractions of millions of people. So I'd like to say Black Lives Matter as a movement is with Biden, reformist, and generally quite nonviolent as protests go. And then amongst them, are there more radical people? I'm Absolutely. But I'll, I'll even defend to an extent radical action when it comes to protesting against injustice like this. What, so what, do you know how many people last year, how many unarmed black men were shot and killed by police? Um, I think, I mean, it was like a unarmed black man. Unarmed like, black man shot and killed by police. Somewhere between 20 and 40. I don't remember 13. the exact. 13. Do you, uh, but that, that, I, I would want to be clear. It's It's unarmed black men shot and killed. There are instances, you know, like George Floyd was not shot and killed. But it seems like if you have an estimated 375 million interactions with police, if we're having double digits of unjust killings, it's not so much a widespread problem, but just areas where we need to hold people accountable. Sure. And I definitely think police are often not held accountable for sure. But does that warrant millions of people, you know, protesting? Does that warrant, uh, like changing banners at every single park, every major corporation adopting these slogans? Does it warrant street paintings with taxpayer dollars and then using police to protect it? Does it warrant those who would commit violent in their name for 140 plus days? And will any of the Democrats call them out? Well, the corporations and the politicians doing all of that is just... um I'm trying not to use the term virtue signaling. They're doing it because it makes the (laughs) money. Well, that's the thing. But I'm not going to defend corporations who are throwing up like the black, uh, like uh, I app icon for 30 days. Then they throw (laughs) it up. Of course. course. But they're only doing that to appeal to a popular narrative. But I'm not going to defend their virtue. Their CEOs could be racist. They could be not. I don't care. Like, it doesn't matter. They'll do whatever makes them money. When it comes to like the... um, the, the protest itself, you have to recognize that the um, police killings of unarmed black men are very much the tip of, a, of an iceberg, even a glacier here, where that is the most easily and objectively verifiable injustice. Like George Floyd, I think a lot of people recognize. Not great. Uh, Breonna Taylor, likewise. Mm-hmm. But underneath all of that, those... Do you, com- uh, do you mean when you say not great, like those stories were not clear-cut acts of... Like, what do you mean by that? No, I, I mean that they're very, they're very easy things to protest against because yeah. I think I disagree. That you think that the George Floyd thing was like people should see that and go like, eh, you know, I think when the George Floyd thing happened, I covered it shocked that we had a video of this cop kneeling on this guy for eight you know, minutes. And I think it was like, was it 43 seconds or whatever yeah. that shouldn't have happened. But more information comes out later. So I recognize that protest. I do. But I don't the, think any info came out that made that any less horrible. Though. That he uh, had fentanyl in his system, a lethal, a lethal uh, dose, of, dose of fentanyl, and that uh, when the body camera footage got released, he's actually kicking his way out of the car saying, please hold me on the ground, hold me on the ground. So I, I, w- I have to push back against this. The, the, um, he, he would not have died if that knee had not been on his neck. It is the, the, degree, the degree to which fentanyl was in his system is something of a matter of contention. There are people who say that sure. it was a lethal amount. There are people who say that it was, uh, while a substantial amount, something that was decreasing or indicative of a previous dose and that his death was directly caused from constriction of his airflow. Well, I, can't, I am not a doctor. I do think the undisputed sort of decision here is that it was because he was kneeled upon. Did and you body, did you watch the body camera footage? Yeah, I don't think that changed anything. Where I mean, he's saying, he hold high me on his... the ground, hold me on the ground, hold me on the ground, three his, times. Not by his neck with a knee. Did you see the, the manual that was released by the police defense showing them training the police to do that? Uh, then I think that's a terrible manual. I agree. And, I, and so what I see with Brianna Taylor and with the George Floyd incident is not 
massive systemic injustice. But well, actually, I take that back. I think it's a broken system but, that needs to be amended. But that's but not what I'm saying. Individual acts of, of malice. These are the tips of the iceberg with these two, you know. But if you actually look at the history of black people in this country, and this is what people are fundamentally angry about, because people don't go out and protest because one thing happened. Nobody does that. It's always the accumulation of a large number of unfortunate events. And when you look at black people in this country, if you take a look at average household income or average like schooling quality in your neighborhood or the continued presence of redlining, which hasn't changed in 70 years, and all these things building up, and it's actually the product of like this incredibly complicated network of interconnected systems that a lot of which aren't even being managed by racist people. A lot of it is just the system is stacked in a way that if you were I, once disadvantaged, you'll still be disadvantaged. And black people sure were disadvantaged a while ago, and that pattern's continued. And that's the underlying sentiment. And that's, I think, what people really want to address. Here, here's, here's the issue. I agree completely. I did a documentary on blockbusting, redlining, Pruitt, Igo, St. Louis, all that stuff. And the issue is race, racialized policies, and th that's not the answer. It's not, that's not what's going to solve the problem. It's, a cl it's become a class issue because we've removed the racial component legally, but now we have issues of, okay, you changed the law. You, we, we made redlining and blockbusting illegal, though it definitely still happens. We've changed those laws. Now, how do we address the actual inequality? It's a class-based issue. So what ends up happening now is you get the likes. This, this, this is what really bothers me about You've, you, 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 you create Black Lives Matter. I think it was created from Trayvon Martin. It, yeah, it was yeah, following Trayvon Martin. Obama, yeah. And then people counter with All Lives Matter, which instead of, become, instead of being a unifying thing becomes an, an, a, like an adversarial thing. Then you get All Black Lives Matter. And, it just, and then you get Blue Lives Matter. I think Blue Lives Matter probably came second. And instead of people saying like, let's, let's work together to solve all of these problems as friends, we get my issue is the issue and you're wrong and how dare you. And everyone just points the finger at each other saying, how dare you? Well, the, the issue is, is that all Lives Matter types don't really have an issue. They're just counter protesting Black Lives Matter. If the All Lives Matter thing was a legitimate effort to try to de-racialize a broader class issue, I think that it would have turned out very differently. But we have to be clear, that's not what it was being used for. It was being used to say like, oh, you say Black Lives Matter. Well, you're implicitly suggesting mine doesn't. So all lives matter. So it's well, a counteraction. This is the point I'm making. If you have an area, say like uh, Ferguson, where it's predominantly black, but there are white people who live there, mm -hmm. you're cutting out people based on race and it makes people angry. Well, what policy are you referring to here? Because I haven't- no, I'm just talking about the slogan. So when you, so uh, for, for me growing up on the South side, uh, it was a very mixed race area. Mm -hmm. you, had, you had white people, black people, uh, but there was a segregating line, 47th street. The, I watched the cops brutalize everybody. I watched the cops plant drugs on whoever. I watched white people die of heroin overdoses. Or I shouldn't say watch, but I've had friends who died of heroin. And so you then start, you know, you, you start talking about Black Lives Matter because of brutality. And then you're going to get a bunch of poor people. And, and of course, there are more poor white people in the United States than poor black people. I'm not saying proportionally. I'm just right, saying well, yeah, a hard more, number. More white folk, yeah. Well, so, right, exactly. So what ends up happening then is you create a movement that tells someone we are not focused on your problems. We're focused on their problems. And they say, but what about, what about me? Everyone's going to say, what about me? And I think that's a simple solution but to addressing all of the problems. This is my Class. thing, though. The All Lives Matter thing was not made up by poor white people who are trying to get, to get that solidarity. It was made up mostly by Republican counter protest. Like I, I just, I the the All Lives Matter thing was never made in a in a good faith effort to try to broaden the net. I I, I, I think you're in a bubble, man. I really don't think I, so. But I, was I can in, tell you, I was in Cincinnati. But I can tell you, even even if that wasn't the case, though, even if that wasn't the case, even if I were to accept your premise, back in the civil rights protests, the original ones, you know, there was a slogan that was used pretty frequently amongst the black folk marching. It was, "Am I not a man? You know, am I not a person?" And to me, when we're saying like, "Well, Black Lives Matter," you're leaving out the white people who are poor. This sounds to me like if a woman of that era was to walk up to a man with that sandwich board over his chest and say, "Well, I'm not a man." What about me? I recognize that the language can seem exclusionary, but if you pull back, you recognize the Black Lives Matter movement is not exclusionary. Even if the language may suggest some sort of exclusionary focus on black people, the, the people marching out there and the policies proposed by BLM advocates are generally very, very progressive when it comes to class-based issues and class-based solutions. And they also protest white folk getting killed by the police or black folk getting killed by black police. Too. Your, your analogy, uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe fits what we're talking about right now. If, if you had you know, black people in the civil rights era saying segregation is wrong, we need equality under the law. And, and we're also talking about 
you know, ban, uh, getting rid of miscegenation laws. Those were actual laws in place. What we're talking about right now is are people facing injustice at the hands of police and are people facing disadvantages in life based on class and, and wealth issues? The answer is yes, it affects everybody. So why would you choose to exclude somebody? If we go back in time, we're talking about civil rights and a woman went up to, you know, a civil rights activist who was black and said, well, what about me? It's like, I'm actually fighting for something that has nothing to do with you. Whereas today, you do have white people, Latinos, Asians, and everybody who has fa who have faced injustice at the hands of cops. I meant a black woman. If a black woman went up and said, like, oh, oh I'm not right. a man. But, like, with, with the exclusionary thing, I just, I, I guess from what I've seen from BLM advocates that protest the movement, and even the organization, which is far to the left of what the general BLM actual marcher believes, I just, I, I guess I just don't see these exclusionary tendencies. Even if we were to believe there was an exclusionary element here outside of the mere language of the movement, um, there are racialized elements of this disparity that can't be solved just with class solutions. It's like um, it's like if you if a hundred years ago you put all the black folk in section A and all the white folk in section B, and then a hundred years later you're like, oh, well, I'm really sorry about that. So anyway, people in section A uh, make half as much as people in section B. I'm sorry, that's the law. No race mentioned. Just what neighborhood are you born in? And the breadlining and the distribution of wealth has reflected a distinct racialized oppression in this country that I think we can solve with race neutral policies, but we must acknowledge that it exists. But Black Lives Matter isn't advocating for race neutral policies. They're advocating for racial policies, like racialization. What? Like so in, in uh, uh, for instance, in Seattle, they're doing, you know, POC and non-POC separate events. At the University of Michigan, we saw the non-POC and the P like literal neo-segregation popping up in response to this movement. And, and the most notable thing and shocking thing to me was California's proposition, uh, I believe it's Prop 16, repeal Prop 209, mm -hmm. which would strike the civil rights language from their constitution. I want to be specific about those two. So the POC, non-POC separate thing, this is... I don't really think that this is like an official BLM thing that's being pushed for. I think that's woke... Uh, crap as well, by the way. I don't think that... The, you can make an argument for it, provide a safe space, whatever. I don't think it does what it's supposed but they, to. But the, the organizers of Black Lives Matter say these things. Sure, yeah, but w or when we're talking about, like, what BLM wants, I don't mean, like, these little events or soirees which may have, like, these weird elements that are kind of, like, misappropriated woke culture. What I mean is, like, broadly, how are we fixing this multi-trillion dollar economic gap that we have? Yeah. And when it comes to the California thing, I'm mixed on this. The reason they're doing that is because the language of their law prevents prevents them from implementing affirmative action the same way other states in this country do. It's just optically, it looks terrible. Like, wow, you know, uh, uh, California gone so woke that they're getting rid of civil rights and it looks terrible. And I recognize that if I if don't it, know if, if I it, support it, if it if it was a civil rights, if it was a if it was an affirmative action amendment, as they claim it was, mm -hmm. then they would have amended it to add language protecting affirmative action instead of stripping all civil rights from the Constitution. Well, they, well, they, I mean, they still are, um, they're still, they have to adhere, of course, to national law regarding that would uh, require federal classes. intervention. So California is paving the way for internally. So, so for instance, uh, California legalized medicinal marijuana when it was federally illegal and then complained when the DEA would go in and raid. Mm -hmm. If California strips away the civil rights language, thanks to unanimous support from Democrats and federal Democrats, then they're going to start implementing racist and racial segregation policies statewide. Like what? And then a specific program saying no to this race and no to that race. I mean, if you're talking about affirmative action, we can start with that institutional racism outright. Do you think that affirmative action is an inherently wrong thing? I think it's an institutional racism. Sure. Well, Whether do you think it's wrong? Personally, for me, yes, absolutely. Okay. And that's because I come from a mixed race family. Mm -hmm. So I've already experienced being a second class citizen from, from uh, groups uh, aligned with whatever you want to call it, intersectionality or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not fun. It's, I believe it flies in the face of everything my, my uh, grandparents fought for in terms of civil rights. They were a mixed race couple. It was illegal. They faced prison time over this and they had to flee several states because of it. Um, my mom was born before civil rights and Loving v. Virginia as an illegal person, like wasn't allowed to exist in this country because of miscegenation laws. They're bringing these things back. I don't think they're bringing back miscegenation. No, 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 no. They're bringing back. I'm talking about the, 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 they're stripping away the civil rights law. They're well, bringing back segregation. I, I, I really, given the, um, the reasons and the unilateral or the multilateral support that this proposition have received, the idea to me that they're removing a specific California set of policies, um, 
to imp to to then become the most racist state in in the in the nation even though they're equally beholden because let's be clear once california removes these laws they're going to be at the same point a lot of other states in this country are other states in this country also rely on a set of federal protections when it comes to discrimination in workplaces and what have you california is going to be an equal standing with them i think we're being really uncharitable when we assume that they're doing this as part of a step one to like you know bring back like racism in this country well th well it 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 is. I mean, well, it depends on whether or not you think affirmative action, something which is already done in a bunch of other states. Yeah, it is racist. Sure. But if that's the case, then let's not pretend that California is like backsliding past the civil rights movement. Let's just acknowledge that they're, I guess, awkwardly moving towards the implementation of policies that a bunch of other states already have. I think I'm 50-50 on affirmative action. I think that's like conceptually it disgusts me, you know. Um, but on the other hand, like if you think about it in certain neighborhoods of like Los Angeles, for example, where I grew up, if you get like um, a college admission uh, or a college, um, yeah, like um, um, application, sorry, from a black person, to a white person, you don't know anything about these two people apart from what they send you. Statistically, the black person has had to work harder because their neighborhoods on average are way worse. Same with worse schooling. This is actually a really good point. Uh, it's really funny when we hear. What was this? There was something about they wanted to do they wanted to do blind hiring mm -hmm. because they felt like names were I, I saw a post on this on Facebook actually. People were advocating it was leftists saying we should get rid of, you know, your names and your your address and let people choose based on what their, you know, uh, uh, what their merit is and blah blah blah. Well, they didn't say merit, but that was a general idea. You put an application their concern is that white culture, that, you know, or, or mainstream American culture favors anglicized names. Therefore, people are at a disadvantage. They actually found, there was a study that found the opposite. And it's actually exactly what you said. If you take a person, uh, on, uh, statistically on average, a white person's more likely to have family wealth, more likely to have, to grow up in a, a wealthier suburb, less likely to have encounters with police for a variety of reasons. And then they're going to have a resume that says, I went to this school, I went to this school, I went to this college. Whereas people in the black community, Latino community are going to have less. On, a, you know. on average, yeah, because they've had to put up with more historical. And so you end up with a racial disparity. But I don't, I don't see if the, how, how, you know, that being said, I don't see how the solution is affirmative action or racializing. Well, I, I completely agree. Yeah. Of, and that's why affirmative action is at best a stopgap. And you could argue maybe it makes the world slightly more fair. In I think a it makes it worse. Well, you could argue in a right. consequential sense, because personally, when I think who deserves to get this spot in a college, who deserves to get that job, I think of how hard they've worked, what effort has been put in, what what is the in, in a consequential sense, what is the income to outcome there? And affirmative action in some cases helps. In some cases, it actually quite hurts people when it comes to that, especially with the treatment of, say, for example, Asian immigrants in Los Angeles, UCLA, the negative affirmative action points that they get because a lot of those students are sent over here from wealthy families in China, and you get this really complicated situation. And ultimately, we can avoid all of this, all of this, and I'd love to avoid all of this, if we just um, put more effort into addressing the underlying racial disparities in this country. But nobody wants to do that. Which, and, which would be and and what, what real real anti redlining policies and reparations not on race it gets messy but on class because if you're if you were poor a hundred years ago and white you had it better than if you're poor a hundred years ago and black for sure but there are still issues you can fix across the board and that way you don't get a lot of really messy racial politics that might otherwise have felt like what do you do like you test people's blood you know exactly yeah, right. I agree that, with yeah, that for yeah, sure yeah that gets really really messy but nobody wants to do this I mean Republicans Democrats neither of them want to do this how do you feel about oh sorry to interrupt man oh, oh how no, do you feel no. about universal basic income yeah I think I, so as a, as a socialist my one contention is my concern would be that universal basic income would assist in perpetually commodifying the standards of life. I don't want people to have the money necessarily to afford medical care or food. I want those things to just be available to people with that wealth maybe being divested to or diverted to like luxury goods, that sort of stuff. Um, but I think that like right now in this country, this is me like picking which two beautiful delectable fruits I want to eat from a tree. If we could get UEI in this country done properly, like a good UBI, absolutely. And that would go a long way too to fixing the situation poor folk are in. So we got two, we got two routes to go. I definitely want to talk about UBI, socialism, et cetera. But I want to make sure, because we, we were originally talking about Antifa and, and right-wing violence. So going back to what we were talking about before, with, with Antifa on the far left, we have people engaged in violence consistently. Uh, I mean, 
I, I mean, if we look at the death count. Uh, but what is that? I mean, that doesn't change the fact that someone gets bashed over the head with a brick. Sure. But I think that generally speaking, if we're looking to quantify the amount of violence done by any given number of groups, the fact that we've had historic racial protests in this country with Antifa involvement at some of these protests. And we have, I think we have one death and it was that 100% Antifa guy who was in Portland. I believe. Well, you had the security security guard who shot the guy in the face. No, that guy wasn't Antifa. No, no, no. He was just the Bernie bro. Or, but he was there as yeah. an unofficial security guard. Sure, but he wasn't operating the capacity of like a revolutionary protester. He was there and I, I, I don't know the circumstance of the death, but he wasn't like black block. Um, you have that. And the fact that there's only been so and so much death from these groups, I think, when we're looking at over the past 10 years, hundreds of deaths from the far right groups indicates something, whether that indicates the far right group uses more lethal methods, you know, uh, yes. guns opposed to bricks. I'd be willing to bet that Antifa yep. don't carry guns for the most part. Except for that one guy. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every once in a while, you know, but when you see a far right militia group, these people are not carrying flags and bricks. These people but, carry firearms. But I think that ultimately discussions on stochastic violence are distractions from greater systemic violence that I think that we all need to pay a greater level of attention I, to. I think if you got uh, the left and the right in a room and talked about the opi opioid crisis in pharmaceutical companies, they're going to they're gonna agree. Yeah, I, oh, think, yeah. I, think, I genuinely I think agree with that. Yeah. The problem for me is, man, these, these guys in, in, in Michigan, I don't care what you want to call them. Lock them up. You know, they, they, they're plotting a kidnapping, whatever it is. They're staking out some governor's house. The courts had already won in Michigan. The, 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 the legislation ruled she had, she, her powers, were, you know, they, they stripped her powers from her. The courts ruled unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And then the AG said, I will not enforce any of her laws. And these guys were plotting what, for what reason? Like the system we built, it worked. And so these guys were nuts. They got caught. The FBI staked them out, locked them up. Congratulations. But when we look at Portland, when we look at Seattle, when we look at what happened in Chicago, in the Pacific Northwest, we get what, what is it, like 140 nights now. I, I, that's, that's a bit unfair because it's 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 simmered down quite a bit. But we had a, a sustained period of about 90 or so days where it was just riot every single night, explosives being thrown. And when these people would get arrested for doing things that were like serious, you know, like you had, you had cops who had like burns, cuts, lesions. They would a lot get of protesters who did too. And well, for sure. But I mean, if you're if so, so I'll, I'll get to that. You have these people getting arrested, and then the DA, Mike Schmidt, says, you're free to go. So it was so bad, the state police said, what's the point of being here if they're getting released as soon as we arrest them? And they That's left. A good question. Well, Trump came in and deputized them, then later deputized the police, and now the feds are dealing with it. So death is, death is the worst possible outcome. And we have Michael Reinhold, who killed that Trump supporter, and that is extremely horrifying. And we didn't get mass national press coverage about it. Wait, uh, wh which instance is this? Michael Reinhold, the guy in Portland who said, we got him right here, and then he Shut fired two shots. We don't know if it's horrifying, because he never lived to see trial. He was murked by, by Trump. That's, but, 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 no, it, was, it was definitely horrifying, and it was definitely horrifying well, that he is, got killed. Death by, is horrifying, but I mean, like, we didn't even get to see a trial there. Like, you're right. And, yeah. that's, and that's something that the right doesn't really experience, by the way, too. You know, you, like, you have, uh, you, you, like Fort Hood, for example, you know, you treat these people with kid gloves. But that guy... That guy outside the house, apparently, according to like a bunch of eyewitness testimony and the conflicting narratives of the police who were there, he didn't draw a gun. They just I'll, I'll, saw him. Well, I'll tell you this. There's, they just shot there's conflicting him. witness statements. But, but only with minor variations, the vast majority affirm that the cop story isn't true, that he That's, did not draw I, I I read that there was a witness who said they saw him drawing. But I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter. You know why? Because uh, uh, even if we have witnesses saying he did and he didn't, Trump said twice, oh, he, he, he was at a rally. And he goes, they, they knew who he was. It took him 15 minutes. They didn't want to arrest him. Retribution. And, that, and, and, and the other time he said it was retribution. And that's, that's, that's messed up. I saw I'm you, trying I, to avoid swearing. No, I saw it. you tweet that, by the way. When, when I saw it, I was, I was yeah, I'm I'm, happy the, to see the, that. The, the, the president claiming that we should just get retribution and go kill people? No, we want that guy on trial so we can hear everything about him and make sure we know who he is. We know what he's doing. We know why he's doing it. Now, to, me, to me, it shows to an extent fear as well. If you are confident in your case, legally speaking, you want them to stand trial because a trial is a years long, prolonged shaming of them and everything yes. they represent right. whereas them being murdered martyrized them the only reason you wouldn't want that is if you were concerned that a trial would bring out information or would be inconvenient to you in some way that that's why look i think uh, i'm not a big fan of trusting the government but we've yeah, got a couple we, we got a couple statements and it just seems like inconclusive 
I mean, I'm, I'm not inherently going to distrust the cops who are there. I'm not inherently going to trust them either. Inconclusive is the best you can ever get when it comes to conflicting witness testimonies. Well, I mean, so, so to my point, mm -hmm. just because sometimes one group of extremists kills people doesn't mean we ignore the other group of extremists. Oh, I'm not arguing that, though. But, I but, will defend. I will defend a lot of the, the protest violence that's been taking place. Um, I know, and this is contended among a lot of conservative circles, but I think an economist recently estimated that the damage done to the black community in this country could be monetarily represented by a figure of like 14 trillion. And that's one estimate, of course. But it's but, just political. But, I mean, how do you actually estimate well, that of stuff? Course, of course, you know, there are different methods and methodologies. I'm not uh, an economist. I can't fact check him. I know there are lower estimates as well. But we, we, we know this, you know. Uh, in, in the United States of America, for the longest time, the western reaches of this country, they didn't have roads and they didn't have electricity and they didn't have phone lines. And through an enormous expenditure of federal wealth, we put effort into um, uh, bringing that infrastructure westward because the investment brings about more educated people, encourages uh, the development of more land, which allows for more people to live there, which means more money. And we're facing now the same issue, albeit in a much more sophisticated way, with a lot of poor communities in this country, a lot of which are black or Latino, where we now know these communities are uh, black holes of wealth. People will make fun of this. Like, well, well, why well, give money to the schools? It's a well, black hole. We could invest. We could prevent that from being a problem. But there are more poor white people than poor black people. Sure, and we and we should invest absolutely. Right, right, but right. there are specific elements of black poverty. To, to to be fair, I think you already said reparations on class, not race, anyway. Yeah, I so think, I yeah I get it. There are some there are some elements that are heavily racialized. There are studies, for example, about the criminal justice system where uh, that are non sensationalized, like just flat out the likelihood of given charges or what your sentence will be, even if every other factor is accounted for, just race is left. And then you have things like implicit bias, but those things are cultural shifts. I don't think we can fix that with law. I, I certainly don't want there to be like a federal mandate, all judges must give black men 10% lower sentences to compensate for the racism we assume they have. But when it comes to non-cultural issues like that, the deficit we see in these black communities, this is something worth protesting. And I think for a lot of people, people who grow up there, this is something worth fighting for. I don't think it's good to drive a car through cops. I don't think it's good to hurt police officers. But I recognize that riots and violence at protests just seem to be an inevitable product of great civil strife. And to me, the solution to this would be to say, what can we do to alleviate that strife? Arrest people as needed it's, it's, along but the way. Giving, but giving them what they want just justifies their tactics. Well, what do they want? Well, I, honestly, I don't know. Well, I, can, I mean, the Black Lives Matter on their website, they want to disrupt the nuclear yeah, family. What they what they, they, they did remove it. Healthy food, mm -hmm. man. It's a no. class war being subsidized by the No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. We're, we're, we're talking. No, no, dude, industry. dude, dude. We're talking specifically about what the protesters they are want asking healthy for. healthy lives. No, they don't. I mean, dude, chill. Do you know? They're not. Yes. What have they asked for specifically? The They've, movement or the, 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 the specific organization? Because they tend to operate. There, kind there's of at there's arms no cohesive life. ask. Well, that's always the way. I mean, you were at Occupy Wall Street. You know, there's but when there, it comes but to there protests. were a few general asks mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street had. Yeah, and it I, was and it was a lot of leftist stuff like healthcare, transit, schools. But sure, well, we, that was a big problem with Occupy for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have. I mean, there are fairly specific requests. We do have, of course, police reform, which I think is best represented in its most moderate form by Joe Biden's policies. I think what, what's it called? I, I, I'm actually blanking right now. It's like eight main policies that have been scientifically proven to improve police. Well, there's a name oh. for it. Yeah, there's like a, I don't know. yeah. Well, whatever the case is, that's great, that's fine. But then you have other things like reinvestment back in the community. That's what defund the police is mostly about. Terrible slogan optics wise, mind you, but defund the police, where does that money go? You know, not to politicians pockets, hopefully. It would go back towards stuff like social work or towards investment in education or people forget about this uh, waste management you know these parts of these cities are absolutely filthy it means nobody wants to go outside travel to businesses or work outside which means that Here, here's here's why here's why i disagree i think uh if people aren't motivated to serve their own communities i don't think any amount of money is going to change that and i think it actually could make a bigger problem so we we had uh, are you familiar with scott pressler you'll have to uh he's, bonk me on the head he's this uh trump supporting guy who goes around cleaning up that's about it. it cleans up. So uh, that's awesome. He went to L.A. He went to Baltimore. Literally cleaning, like literally, literally cleaning. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he brings a bunch of uh, and it's a bunch of Trump supporters come out and they'll just start cleaning things up. And he actually got smeared in the media for this. Like they said, his real motivations were to like help Trump or whatever. And I'm like, okay, you know, like carry on cleaning do, up. Do you think there's an element of that that could be true under certain conditions? Like, what if just hypothetically? I'm just curious before you go on. Like, what if 
it had been like he'd go to black communities. That's know? what he's doing, yeah. right? And he'd clean up. He'd be like, "See how easy it is, you know?" And no, he'd like clean no, up, no. and he'd get like the the picture, you know. And and to me, and to me, it would it would feel almost like a more patronizing, you know, like when the white evangelicals go to Africa to help build one house over three months or something like that. I actually think I'm it, just asking. I don't know the circumstance. I'm just curious. I, I I I don't think so. But I think you absolutely could make that argument, and you can make the exact same argument for the fact that Black Lives Matter is overwhelmingly white. To have a bunch of white people claiming they're representing the minorities. There's one viral video where it's like two white Antifa women are spray painting and two black women are yelling at him to stop. And they're like, no, we're doing this for you. Like, okay, I don't I don't defend that. Right. right. But the white participation <laughs> at these rallies, I think, is a good thing. I think it supports my argument that, broadly speaking, this is a fight for a sort of plurality of social justice but, rather than a hyper specific race war. Basically. But it's not popular. Like, so, so the general movement has right now, according to civics and the polling, 48% approval. Then you've got 39% opposition and then 11% like unaffiliated. That's the civics numbers. Yeah, that's so, better than the civil rights movement was at well, its time. Well, so, so Black Lives Matter as a general movement, when you don't get into the specifics, you don't talk about the protests, regular people just say, oh, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. um, but 48%, so it's not a majority. It was after George Floyd, but they lost ridiculous amount of support yeah. after the riots heated up. But to be fair, and again, I just, as, as a person who's very critical of the narratives media tries to push to us, how much of this is because the movement functionally changed and how much of it is because of the hyper-targeted media coverage of all the violence to the exclusion of, again, for every person who dies at a BLM protest, 100 black people die of COVID, 100 black people die of malnutrition or of gang violence or of other issues that can be fixed through the systemic solutions that Black Lives Matter people tend to support. I... I agree with you. I think the media is garbage in this country. And I think it's an issue of human behaviors and the incentives of the media machine as it exists. That's capitalism, baby. I got a uh, socialism pill. You it is. And no, no, no. I've, I was talking to some Trump supporters a couple years ago, and I said, I'm for a mixed economy. I want regulation on these companies. And these three, it was three guys. They were Trump supporters. They were like, we think that's wrong. And I, I said, I, I do not believe in manip uh, coercive force, physical force, and manipulative force to, to make people do things. And they asked me what I meant by manipulative force. And I was like tricking people, fraud. And they were like, no, 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 no. If you convince someone to exchange something for whatever, that, that's their choice. And I was like, I'm talking about the media lying to everybody all the time. And, it's, and they're allowed to do it. So the problem is I believe in free speech. They're allowed to do it. That's what it is. I just don't think it's ethical the way our, our, our media machines function like this. And I don't think there's a way to solve for that problem because you can't put someone in charge of what's acceptable speech. Of course, that so would be. You, a, you yeah. end up with media machines designed to make people go crazy. And I got to be fair, I think there's criticism you can point towards me for that, absolutely, because I have my personal biases and the things I don't like. And I think if you look at this, this is why I'm actually okay with YouTubers, like whether you're left, right, or whatever. Like for you, for instance, you're a socialist YouTuber, like we're, we're, we clearly have disagreements, but you're one dude. By all means, make all the videos you want saying, you know, Trump is awful and, you know, all will, the and Republicans <laughs> and I'll and I'll talk about what I what, what I don't like. And I don't like, you know, intersectionality and, and Democrats for uh, the current iteration of the Democrats. For sure about that intersectionality thing, by the way, for sure. When we, when we get to that, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think YouTube creates a space where individuals will be like, here's my world as I see it. Here are the things I have problems with. The thing about these 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 companies is that they editorially choose to hyper target and ignore things. So to go back to your point, they'll never talk about the opioid crisis. I mean, they will like a little bit, but they're not going to be like today another X amount of people. It's just whenever it's convenient and shocking and politically advantageous for like an election cycle, for instance. So to, to basically say, yes, the media is trash. I think when it comes to what we saw with the riots, they kept calling it peaceful and they kept making excuses for everything. Well, how about, some, how, some did. There, there's that very highly publicized clip of the guy saying, despite some fires, mostly peaceful. Well, like a yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that I, I will say, absolutely hilarious. Um, not great. I don't know if that's representative of the general coverage. I do think, for example, that a lot of it was necessary to push back on the narrative that like cities were burning. I hear this phrase all the time. Portland burning, Seattle burning. Nothing's burning. One or two buildings in a block on a sporadically once in a week. That's not good. That's semantics. I'm not, of course, but when you, know, you use hyperbole. the term, but there is a reason why that hyperbole is employed. And it's not just a rhetorical flourish. It's to give the person the impression that these cities are actually collapsing. Which is of course not true. I've been to Portland, but have you have you seen all these small towns that had those problems that are struggling to recover because the like when you have a small town, uh, Michael Tracy, 
traveled to these places, journalist, he, he went around to a bunch of small towns that people didn't care about or know about because they're not going to get national coverage. Mm -hmm. And they had widespread lootings and were putting things on their doors like, we support Black Lives Matter, please don't hurt us. Yeah. Yeah, but I think, they, I they, think that's they, terrible. But their recovery is, like, it's it's not going to happen but because what, they're a small town that, that money doesn't exist. Right, but, I mean, there is nothing I would propose that wouldn't try to solve that. I mean, the death of small-town America has been one of the greatest, like, demographic crises that, w that we have to, We don't even care about small-town America anymore in anything other than a folksy aphorism we can use to drum up voters. When it comes to actual investment, we don't do anything about these communities. And the way our businesses consolidate makes it easier and easier for everyone to just live in big cities. Yep. I live in a big city. I like living in a big city. I would like it if people could choose between that or more rural life without knowing they will have fewer opportunities in the latter, or at least severely hampered opportunities but with with regards to that like the we support BLM please don't you know loot us looting's illegal I'm not defending um, looting or I don't think most beyond people are defending looting you just said you know there there's were, a book called in defense of looting and the, I think it was the new was it the new republic did or Biden write it? <laughs> no. uh, it was written by a I think it was a, a trans activist trans Black Lives Matter and this is coming from an article that may have been I don't think it's the new republic but uh, so uh, this is this is all, all stems for where, like, I started getting more upset with this level of activism because I've been covering civil unrest. But that's not broadly representative, you know. You said it yourself, those two, like, black women trying to keep the two white people from spray painting. When I see videos of these protests, one of the first things they teach you, if you protest consistently, and I used to protest more um, before I decided I hated going outside and that I didn't like being, uh, you know, sunburned, was that um, you, you want to minimize negative engagement with the community that you're in. Looting, uh, arson, tagging, these things, the definition of negatively affecting the community. But they defend right? it. Well, who? Because people keep saying they, they defended a book or a activist. Communist. Sure, some activists. Media calling it peaceful over and over again. But I mean, there's like memes. Most of the protests were peaceful, though, like a vast majority of but them. But what, what does that mean, most? Well, like that's that's the joke we make, mostly peaceful. 97%, so, 93%. Well, 93. So yeah. it's 90, well, but there's the, and that's a tricky statistic, too, because at 7% of all the BLM rallies, you know, mm -hmm. there was violence. Who started that violence? They, now, you're based in Cop Pilled, I know. You know cops will regularly initiate violence against protesters either by putting one of their own amongst their rank throwing a rock and then using it as justification or by just starting themselves we have plenty of video and uh, data-based evidence to defend that but that's that's not enough to indict the officers in specific places no no no. but i'm just saying and so only seven percent of these protests had violence but we don't know how much of that was actually protester initiated violence and even of those that were how much of it was like one or two guys we don't know most of these protests were peaceful. The data on that is very clear. Well, that's 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 we're, fine. We're arguing I, like, over margins. No, so so uh, I, I, then if that's the case, why is it so difficult for anyone to come out and be like, screw those guys? I don't think it is. I see that all the time amongst the left. Usually, you have these hyper woke eighteen year olds who have never been to a protest in their life who will say, yeah, arson, yeah, you showing the system. No. And there was more of that at the very beginning with Minneapolis because people were very angry right after George Floyd. And, there, you know, that leads people to make perhaps dumb decisions. But in terms of the broader movement, and I guess we don't have data because we're talking about people's perceptions, I don't think people are all out here defending rioting, looting. What they are saying is hyper fixating on those things is a distraction from the real issues the protests are about. So I've had many discussions with people and I'm sure people in the audience uh, who are watching can absolutely un understand this. How many conversations have you had where someone says it's righteous anger or you don't understand their anger? I recently had a conversation with someone where I was talking about they said something like if you are against Antifa, that means you are pro fa, which means you're pro fascist. And I'm, my response was, if I don't like, say, Islamophobes, mm -hmm. does that make me pro Islam? And they were like, yes. I'm like, no, it doesn't. It means I don't like it when you go and beat random people. Huh. So if you've got people wearing masks going around, look, I, I, I can't go out. There's, there's a viral video of uh, there's like a black dude. And this Infowars reporter is like, come with me to this Trump, this line of Trump people coming to a Trump rally. And he was like, oh, OK, I guess, you know, it's kind of worried. And everyone there is like, he says, I don't I don't like Trump. I'm not a big fan. They're like, hey, man, that's cool. No problem. Shook his hand, gave him hugs. Some ladies were like, oh, that's fine. We just love that you're, you're here talking to us. Gave him a kiss in the cheek. And this guy's like, man, I get more of those. I'm going to come hang out here. This is great. And then she goes, now let's go over to the protest side. And they start screaming, vile, disgusting insults. And the guy's face just that's drops like random black guy. It was so I don't know the exact context of who this guy was, but he was talking to a reporter from Infowars. 
Well, they might have been screaming at the. I can. They were screaming at the Info Wars lady. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. No, that's totally fine. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with being no, no, no. black. There is something wrong with being an Info Wars reporter. So I'm fine so with the respective the, levels. The of point I'm bringing out is this vile hatred exists, like, but that's overwhelmingly. That's fine. Shouting at people you don't like is fine. That's no, I'm, but but I'm just giving that as an example to talk about. If I were to go out right now to a Trump rally. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be, if I said, I don't like Trump, that's fine. In fact, I called, I called uh, Trump a very disparaging term on Twitter, laughing about it. And I've done it like 10 times in the past two weeks. And people are just like, I disagree with you, Tim, but you know, I respect that you're giving us your, your thoughts on this one and you're, you're treating the news seriously. If I, I, I went out in 20, I think it was 2017 or 2018. I think it was 2017. It was in Berkeley. They were, Antifa was posting pictures of my mom, like, and me and threatening me. And I went to a skate park minding my own business. And I had guys come to me and start threatening me for no reason. So I can't, I can't defend all these individual. Obviously, I think going after people's family members is unconscionable, regardless of the people you're targeting. You know, um, I can't. I mean, these are these are very spread out. The broad argument that I'm making is I genuinely do believe that the sentiment behind Black Lives Matter is about the things they're protesting for and not the defense of the most violent extreme hyperbolized actions that take place in a movement that tens of millions have participated two billion dollars in damages i mean and that was just the insurance cap yeah so beyond that it's way but more what do you want but what do you want to do about it condemn it call it out and say stop but yeah. people but I, I i guess i mean i i'm in some pretty far left circles i think that when i what i remember is this after george floyd and after the minneapolis riots there were a lot of people who were very gung-ho about the rioting and uh, just a couple of weeks later, I remember there was a live stream segment from a far right. I don't know if it was a YouTuber, or Twitch streamer. I think he was a neo-Nazi. The chat on screen had a lot of wacky stuff in it. And, um, and he, he was there at a, at a BLM protest. And he was saying, hey, hey, you guys, can you flip that truck? And he was trying to get other people to flip. And the people who were there who were BLM protesters all turned on him. They were like, no, what are you? <laughs> Absolutely not. Right. And they started like trying to chase him out. The guy ran away and chat was like, oh, got to run. And when I saw that clip, that made its way around the Twitter, the YouTubes, and people were celebrating it because the goal For sure. of protests should always be to affect positive change. And you aren't going to affect positive change with the looting, the burning, the rioting. Those things do happen, but an overfixation can be detrimental to the actual message being made by the vast majority. There's a video of some guy with a hammer and he's smashing up the sidewalk and like pulling bricks. Yeah. And have you seen this? They run I've up, seen, I've seen that. they grab the guy and they throw him to the cops. And then the cops grabbed two guys, and one of the guys was actually helping, and then they cut the, the, the good guy out, and they arrest the guy who was vandalizing the street. So I definitely praise that. By all means, like, peaceful protest is what this, is the foundation of this country. We have, a, we have the First Amendment right to do so, and it's amazing when we do. Violent protest is the foundation of this country. Technically, but, you know, uh, when, we, when we told the Crown, uh, you know, the American, the American colonists, stop oppressing us, stop sleeping in our homes, stop murdering our people— and they didn't live here. They were from, you know, like they, like you had people who were born and raised in the colonies. And what did they say? They said, We've, we're severing ties from you. So what did the crown do? They sent the regulars to the states. And then we said, F off. So it's a bit different than a bunch of people showing up, you know, uh, an extreme minority of a community that is that is at odds with what the community wants, burning it down, getting defended by the press, and then just only getting like, well, let's not focus on the extremists. I, I just I think that's a really sensationalized narrative because we are focusing on the extremes here. The va so we're, we have to remember we're focusing on a very slim minority, probably exclusively you know stuff that's gone on in New York, Portland. There are cities, of course, that have greater levels of agitation. No, just no, based no, no, on no, the no, demographic. no. But there there are actions like that that take place otherwise. But when we talk about persistent media coverage, you know, say Portland, for example. You know, um, the uh, uh, I would be willing to bet that for the most part, the people in the city of Portland are largely behind what goes on there uh, for the most part. But even if they are not, I still just I, I guess I just don't understand why this is as much of a talking point as it should be. Like if we want to fix it's, this, it's I, I, I think you should check out. Uh, I wish I, I, we don't have it. But Michael Tracy drove to small towns that never I, made the press. I, I talk with Michael Tracy. I was very critical of him for uh, for his work in that uh, in that bit. What you, you think he went to all these small towns and showed that the riots reached places that didn't make the news. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. my uh, my I have family members who live 60 miles outside of Chicago. And for some reason, 
Black Lives Matter activists showed up to these towns of a couple thousand people, demanded that the mayors allow them to march. And when they did, they started trashing the place. This is directly from a family member of mine saying, I don't understand why this is happening. We're a small, sleepy suburb out 60 miles outside of the city. And then here's the here's the issue in Minneapolis. You keep hearing things like they have insurance. And we've heard that from prominent activists in Black Lives Matter. They have insurance. They don't. So in Minneapolis, for example, there were several stories covered by the Star Tribune that insurance only covers up to $25,000 for hauling away debris, mm-hmm. which the, the, the cost of hauling away totally demolished buildings was, was five times that, which meant they just said goodbye and they walked away. The business never to come back. Well, you won't find me defending insurance companies. Well, for sure. But, but the issue is... But what the, do you want the, to do about it? So my, what I'm looking for specifically is the prosecutors in Chicago, New York, Fort Worth, Seattle, and, and Portland to actually start prosecuting these people. I, I have heard many accusations. I have not seen many claims to indicate, or I've not seen much evidence to indicate that there are legitimately people just being let out. What often happens is that police will gra- gather up big batches of people that are even associated with an area surrounding a crime that took place. And then because there isn't enough evidence to find out which one of them actually did it, the whole group of them gets let go. There's a video. But that's due process, right? There's there. a video of a guy fighting with cops and grabbing his baton something Andy No posted. I know a lot of people on the left don't like him. It's a guy fighting with the cops. He grabs their baton. A bunch of cops grab him, throw him to the ground. He got cut loose. Okay. I don't know any like, of the circumstances. So yeah, but, but again, in, in, why, in, are we, I just, why are we arguing about individual statistics when we're talking about a civilization-wide problem in a country with a population of a third of a billion? I'm okay with Black Lives Matter rioters or Antifa or whatever have done damage. This is bad. This is bad. I'm totally okay with that. But when people say this, they don't stop there. They then go on to say, and this is why I don't support Black Lives Matter. And that's the association I can't abide. Because if you do care about fixing these problems, you should care about addressing the underlying sociological disparities that have created them. This wasn't created by... uh, uh, far left DAs who are letting them get off easy. This was all created by class and race based issues and it's going to boil up again in five or 10 or 15 years if we don't do something about it. It's an inevitable product of historic inequality. And if you want to condemn those people, I have no issue with that. It's not just about that. It's what do we do to stop it when we have district attorneys and county attorneys being elected that will let these people go but now we have actual stories where people who would defend their property are the ones getting charged, right? We're seeing this. When? Uh, the McCloskeys. They th- brandish illegally. They on have- their own private property, legally in Missouri. I am, so I am uh, not familiar with Missouri specific law. Are you telling me that brandishing firearms at people uh, without according, provocation is okay as long as you're on your property? According to the Attorney General of Missouri, yes. Okay. So it's not It's not for me, like, I'm not, look, it, you can say then, the, then the Attorney go, General is wrong and biased and all that stuff, but they're, they're being charged with felonies. Now they're being charged with evidence tampering because they claimed, and it was reported, that the, the, the government, uh, the prosecutor, actually took the gun and dismantled it and reassembled it and then accused them of tampering. I can't speak to the specificity of these claims. This almost, I, I don't know if this borders on conspiracy, but I'd have to look more into it. If they're innocent, the courts will find in their favor. They are very wealthy. I have no doubt they're going to get a good lawyer. I'm well, not they're saying, good lawyers, I guess, themselves. Oh, right, true. I, I shouldn't say yeah. they're good lawyers. I say they're wealthy lawyers. You know, right. the, well, they, they uh, yeah, they um, uh, can't represent themselves, of course. But. So, so I, guess, I guess the issue is we have, this, we have, we ha- we have widespread rioting. It's consistent and it's sustained. So we, we have the, uh, not as sustained as the systemic biases they're fighting against, though. But what systemic biases? I mean, all the stuff regarding class and race that has led to these conditions boiling up here. I guess it really just is a matter of like, what do you think the solution to this is? Is it class, like, class based? Right. But is it yeah. like arresting a given number of people and replacing some left leaning DAs? Or is it like a we fix this like from the ground up? You know, I think the first thing that needs to happen is acknowledgement and condemnation which is what we're not getting from the media. I just, I think we have. And even, uh, by the but way. But they're just saying peaceful protests over and over again with the flames yeah, behind. But that's, I, know, that I, know it's, one, I know, I know, yeah, I know. but you're doing it now. You're like, well, there was one. For the most part, the protests are peaceful. So calling them peaceful protests is an accurate and factually no, verifiable no, 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 no. description. I, I went through this today. They were calling what happened in Philadelphia demonstrations. Like every outlet I read was like demonstrations took place and a pickup truck rammed a cop, knocking her to the ground and breaking her I leg. I'm like, you got to acknowledge CNN's crap but wait weren't they demonstrations msnbc no no no, no. When, when people when and, people and are going around smashing windows and stealing down. things from all of these stores that's not a demonstration was that the whole th- what wasn't there like a large part they were of that calling was... that a demonstration the media doesn't say they don't rioters call it riots ever they yeah. don't ever call it a riot 
be, well, I, I mean, I conservative know outlets fa- well. I know for a fact that's not true. I've, no, I've seen even liberal or neutral outlets that have referred to these as riots. Who, as liberal right, liberal. Some, sometimes, well, I perhaps. I mean, I can't. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll say this. Uh, I don't think either of us have an example, but I'm, I'm willing to concede, yes, absolutely. But I'm just being hyperbolic in that, for the most part, they overwhelmingly say demonstration. And every time I read one of these stories, I'm like, dude throwing a brick at the head of a cop is not a demonstrator now, or here, a protester. Here's where I have to turn this on you, okay? So I assume you and I have similar goals when it comes to class, uh, race-based justice. You don't like redlining. Good. I'm glad we don't have Good, to argue yeah. on that. Right. Um, but you seem very concerned about the inaccuracies in the way that the left-leaning media has covered this. But And I've seen this on your channel, too. Many videos pertaining to that general trend. I see none of it with regards to how the right miscovers these. How many views does the right get? Views? Like how big is how big is right wing media versus left wing media? The right wing, at least on YouTube, the right wing media is absolutely larger. Have you looked equipment. at the actual data on that? Uh, yeah, it's I mean, half. if you if you, I mean, it depends on um, it depends on what your metric is for left leaning. There are some like uh, t- like neutral leaning. Like I don't consider CNN to be left by any metric, for example. But They're anti Trump, and he and think, Cuomo ha- uh, Cuomo specifically said, "Since when do protests have to be peaceful?" I think that for, well, that's a true statement. There have so been I mean, many that's definitely left. No, there have been plenty of non peaceful protests. Some of them led by right leaning people in the history of this country. Protest does not inherently mean peaceful. And also, um, the, the, um, the point I'm making there is that he's clearly on the side of of the unrest. I don't think I don't think being anti Trump makes you left leaning. I think that just makes you a fan of human decency and in, life in, on this in, planet. In terms of how the media covers what's going on, we, but you, CNN's on clearly you, one side. You skid- I think I think that CNN is at best neutral. They are absolutely not on my side. But when it comes to this, again, you have an enormous media platform. We have people like the President of the United States saying that Black Lives Matter people, they aren't American. They hate America. They want to destroy it. This is up to the presidency of the United States. Right-leaning media, you think the left-leaning media has been inaccurate in their coverage of these issues. The right-leaning media is insane. Bosh. When it comes but who, to talking but who about and this. what? Sorry, I just had a quick Box. question. Huh? So I really wanted to ask you, uh, one of the things that you mentioned was that you did not like Michael Tracy's coverage of these small cities. Mm-hmm. And I kind of wanted to loop back a little bit because we are still talking about riots and we're going to go to Super Chats, maybe eventually. Um, and I wanted to ask, what was your issue with Michael Tracy's coverage? And why did you think that he was unfair in his representation of talking about these small towns? I think we have a really bad issue, especially with commentary on YouTube, mm-hmm. of people who will try to amass a series of descriptive positions and then use them to imply a prescript of one without actually ever making that argument. So for example, if your argument is that Black Lives Matter it has led to damage in some small communities, or that Black Lives Matter has increased the propensity of COVID-19 spread, which seems to not be true, those are descriptive claims that you can make, but you're not making the prescriptive claim, which is that BLM is bad. The problem that I had with Michael Tracy is it seems like he wanted to do everything possible to supply the right wing with arguments that would support their idea that BLM is bad without actually making the case himself, just That's making so sort of hodgepodge descriptive claims to Why? support it. Why the, 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 right, the right is on the outs. The uh, Breitbart is flagged, deranked, banned. They, their, their live stream of a, of a, of a congressional uh, uh, pre- a press conference was, was removed immediately from well, YouTube. I would consider you far right and you have 110 million views. Far right? Month. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, the actual the I like talking to you. Don't get me wrong. The actual stuff that you do on your channel, though, is hyper partisan, like almost conspiracy bait. Like, like the, what? Like there was the clip you did where you said that if Joe Biden wins, they're going to rewrite all the definitions in your dictionary. People are going to come to your house with fireworks and guns. It's all going to be over. Those Which things is, have already happened. People individual. First of all, bad things have happened to people on the left and the right. Second of all, this has nothing to do with Biden winning. This all happened under Trump, under protest that Trump has exacerbated with this poor response. And third of all, don't you think it's a little bit disingenuous of you to imply that just because something has happened at some point in this country, that means that it's the product of an upcoming presidential election? Like at some point over the past four years, you know, there's probably been like a sewer explosion in somebody's toilet in an apartment. But if I said if Trump wins again, there will be toilets exploding in your home. I feel like it would be a disingenuous. Do you, do you think Joe Biden would reinstate critical race theory trainings at the government level? I think that your opposition before to critical, before Trump banned it, I guess I he, think it was there. Your opposition to it is one of the most anti free speech positions that you have possibly Crit- the most. Yeah. So it's just, we, we, it's we, just we, you're, you're, get, you're getting off on this one. We got to go back to the initial claim you made and, and where I'm going with this. Sure. When I said that if Biden wins, and uh, I don't know the exact quote that, that you're referring to, 
They're changing the definitions, which they've already been doing. Your, wait, definitions wait, have changed your, dramatically to the point where Wikipedia makes no sense def, anymore. Wait, no, it makes perfect sense. And definitions no, 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 change no, no. all no, the hold time. Hold on, hold on. If you go to Wikipedia right now, and I brought this up before, and look up the, the word woman, it has nothing to do with the word trans woman, and they both disagree with each other on reality. So it's, a, it's a Wikipedia article. What does that right. have to do with Biden? That happened under Trump or Obama. What so does the that have to do with Biden? The, the point is... You have Donald Trump, who just recently banned critical race theory, and any company that co that that does critical race theory trainings is banned from contracting with the government, yeah, and it's actually insane. reversing this. Well, that's fantastic. Critical race theory is neo segregationist. It's you, it's, wait, it's overtly. Can you describe to me what critical race theory is? So, in layman's terms, I'm not. Gonna, I don't have the academic def definition up uh, pulled pull up for you, but specifically like uh, privilege plus power, whiteness, minorities. White uh, traits of whiteness would be specifically like hard work, scheduling. I'll tell you. I'll, t I'll tell you this: the tenets of critical race theory. Though I've definitely done segments on the over academic definition of it. I don't have it pulled up. But when they put out a, a list that says whiteness, uh, they, they say things like down with whiteness. Um, traits of whiteness include schedules, hard work, planning for the future, two point five kids, you're, and all of those things. You're just listing the one Smithsonian Museum pamphlet that was passed out and largely criticized. Critical race theory is criticized by who? It was it was in the Smithsonian for decades. By ever, that specific pamphlet, no, it was not. This pamphlet that you're referring to right now, I know because I covered on my stream and made fun of it as well. Uh, no, it was made specifically, probably some new in student or somebody who was in their 20s made it. It got taken away almost immediately afterwards, following bad reception. To pretend that this is indicative of an entire academic theory is very silly. I I learned critical race theory in sociology. That was my major. It's very very simple. Critical race theory is just the racialized element of critical theory. That is to say, you analyze racial relations based on distinctive power relationships between different groups. So, so how about how about instead, I guess, the application of? There's, but there's that's not, probably the best way to put the, it. There is something terrifyingly despotic about banning the teaching of a certain idea because it leads people to conclusions that are unfavorable to the president of the United States mm -hmm. of America. I, but I, I think you're now ascribing an assumption on the intent. What From, I'm saying is, what, why was it? Why is it good that it's banned then? Well, you're, so you, the first assumption you made was, you know exactly why Trump did it, made him look bad. I think actually Trump doesn't know anything about it. Trump, it was no. Yeah, Trump specifically yeah. said that it promoted anti-American values, which, which is the same which, tin pot dictator excuse that every authoritarian is ever given for their. And excuse so to, the context here is that Christopher Rufo appeared on, I think, Tucker Carlson and said that, and then Trump just parroted it and didn't actually know what he was talking about. So when it came to the debate, he had no idea what he was talking. He's about. He's the president. I'm going to hold him accountable for of his course. language. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, he, Trump didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah, for the, sure. But he's, yeah, yeah, but he said that. I mean. It's irritated me. Too. So we, we have now the emergence of an ideology that is targeting specific races. It's not an ideology. It's just a mode no, 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 of no, no, academic no, no. analysis. Cr 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 critical race theory is just, I guess, a broad term. This, this, is, this is the challenge I always get it's, whenever it's, I have conversations it's about this. It's broad because it's been made broad, so you have something to criticize. So what, whatever happens is when I say something like, hey, I think these things are bad, I get semantic arguments about, well, then define it. What is this? You have to prove what the specific academic... What I'm telling you is when they say things like, uh, I worked for Fusion, for example, and the editor-in-chief changes Twitter by a down with whiteness, like overtly racist. They use it to justify race, racial segregation, neo-segregation. I have seen How? protests... By, by claiming that privilege, uh, uh, racism is only privilege plus power. That's, that's only not an white academic people. argument, though. I've only heard that from right. So, so what I'm saying is you have but then, but a you colloquial have understanding the, of what's happening no, versus you demanding I make a specific definition and then attack it, which is not a fair argument. The colloquial understanding you have is as much an ideological mishmash as the anti-SJW compilations of 2015. If you don't like That's certain, not an argument. What are you talking about? The argument that I'm making is that the president of the United States is trying to engage in a modern form of book burning. And that is what this is, by the way, taking certain forms of knowledge and removing them from the public discourse, certainly with regards to federal funding, he is doing this. And the reason he is doing this, as for his public comments, are because they lead people to become un-American. The, the, no, 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 the, the trainings are a violation of Title, I believe, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. You I, can't tell people that there are certain races that are inherently good or bad. And that's, that not, we, that's not critical. But that's Nobody's what the trainings that. were what doing. What is critical race? Wait, 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 I'm sorry, wait, wait. What, what federal yeah. trainings were saying that certain races are good or bad? Let's pull up Christopher Rufo. He's got yeah, a huge see. list of it. This is what happened. Christopher Rufo went on Tucker Carlson, gave a list of all these things that were happening. Trump saw it, reacted, didn't know what he was 
was talking about. Do we have about. information outside of Christopher Rufo's sure like testimony? Do. Yeah. We have the articles and the documents and everything, all the research he's okay. done. Okay. So, so, so th th look, this is just one individual so I'm citing right now. This is we like also we also white have the stripping. People are bad. Black people are good. Like that's no, we message. have down with whiteness. We have. Uh, racism can only be only white people can be racist. Racism is privilege plus power. We have these components that make up some mishmash of intersectionality, leftist identitarianism, critical race theory, which form a, a, a nightmarish ideology. And it's very, very simple. Actually, when Trump bans this, it's a violation of title, I believe, title seven of the 1964 Civil Rights Act to do trainings where you say white people, this white people that. And why did it wait? So. It's so, so Trump is actually just enforcing existing no, law I, when he no, says I, you can't do those, this. Those policies aren't against the law. The, uh, the app, critical race theory is nothing more than a tool that helps us understand the reason why things are the way they are in this country when it comes to people's racial divides. The application of this tool is completely ideologically neutral. You can arrive at right-leaning conclusions through it. The only reason this is being discussed now is because it is being used as an academic scapegoat for the ideology that has led to Black Lives Matter. I think I think the issue is disavowed. you haven't you haven't read any of this. I absolutely so I have. We have Christopher Rufo. The Treasury Department held a training session telling employees that quote virtually all white people contribute to racism, and demanding that white staff members struggle to own their racism what, what and accept this? their. This is Christopher Rufo's uh, so, cited research on where did this happen? So this is the Treasury Department. Okay. Uh, we also have the National Credit Union Administration, Sandia National Laboratories, Argonne National Laboratories, the Department of Homeland Security, and the FBI all cited. And these are overt violations of Title VII of the 1964 so, Civil Rights so Act. So all of those departments said that exact thing? So National Credit Union Administration says they held a session for 8,900 employees arguing that America was founded on racism and built on the backs of people who were enslaved. How is that false? Founded on racism? Absolutely. Well, that's yes. an ideological position. I don't think we should have that in, in, in government. All, wait, all government training involves ideological positions. Even the understanding that our constitution is the founding document of the land is an ideological disposition, a bias that we adhere to. So, yeah, absolutely. We, we founded a constitution that said all are created equal. We had black slaves. Yeah, of course. this kind okay. of so, murdered so, a bunch so, of natives. So, yeah. I'll, well, well, to be fair. Had fun with I'll, that, too. I'll, 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 to be fair, we'll, we'll say the National Credit Administration. That one's more of an opinion that I think actually is based on a history. I, I could agree with. We definitely built this country off of off of slaves and racism. And, and definitely racism, for sure. sure. It was only we only got the 19, the Civil Rights Act in 64. Sandia National Laboratories, which produces our nuclear arsenal, held a three day reeducation camp for white males teaching them how to deconstruct their white male culture and forcing them to write letters of apology to women and people of color. Whistleblowers from inside the labs tell me that critical race theory is now endangering our national security. How is that endangering our national uh, security? It, uh, well, regardless of whether that opinion is correct, okay. well, holding, holding if, camps for white males is a violation of the civil rights. Sure. What, what does this have to do with critical race theory, though? So what, what I'm saying is when I say things like critical race theory, I'm referring to one particular component that's used in these in, in these trainings that are being banned. The point I'm making is there's a general understanding of what's happening in this country. And every time I bring this up to someone on the left, they use a semantic or academic argument to confuse the situation. Because he's banning it even as so far as to go to, to universities and funding for them. Is, uh, oh, this is a... Um a tremendous violation of our First Amendment rights to be, to we, we you have to understand that when it comes to listen I'm not defending white male training whatever okay crap we're talking about you would need to meet the highest conceivable threshold of harm done to this country for me to even begin to believe it's acceptable for a president to unilaterally decide that a given type of academic analysis is no longer something that they will be permitting. This is uh, like, it is insane to me that a person who considers themselves anti-authoritarian could ever even begin to, to condone this. If there are problems with those individual things, and I have no doubt, by the way, corporations have been doing cringe, cringy, terrible diversity training for decades now. They've done it with, with men and sexual harassment. They've done it with like tolerance and everything like that. They've done it with LGBTQ people. They're doing it with this. That's always been going on. But there are ways to address that that don't involve this. And even if there weren't, this is way worse. Well, so, so, so hold on. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think the issue is that Trump doesn't know what he's talking about. And I think he saw a Fox News segment and then was just like, oh, we got to ban all this. When asked about it, he couldn't actually tell people. That's terrifying. It is a problem. Oh, well, terrifying. I 
wouldn't say terrifying. This guy is the nuclear I would say, arm codes. He's going to do unilateral executive action, which restrict the First Amendment rights of federal institutions because he heard it from. Th th like this is uncomfortable. I can't. I, I, well, so look, I think the degree to which we find Trump's lack of knowledge on this and his uh, overbearing action, uh, that's where we're disagreeing, I guess. My issue is this is a First Amendment violation. I mean, it's just you you can you consider yourself. No, 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 to no, no, be, no, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. The government should ban violations of the Civil Rights Act, but, and and that was the issue at play. Then did the, Trump oh. did, did 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 Trump you know blanket banning critical race theory? I guess it depends on what the actual executive order is and to what extent critical race theory is banned. But insofar as it pertains to the training specified by Christopher Rufo, then brought up by Trump, but that should be banned. This is how it's always done, though. And by the way, I know everyone loves the bring up Godwin's Law. This is how it was done in Nazi Germany, too. When book burning started to take place, they didn't just say, let's burn everything progressive. They would say, this uh, specific ideology is... G it, but, but you're not arguing the 1964 no, wait, 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 Civil no, I, Wait, 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 wait. So in, in either case, there's, there's a quote that I'm wonderfully fond of, and it's, if one considers himself a defender of human freedom, he must regrettably spend his time defending scoundrels, because it is against scoundrels, which authoritarianism is first aimed, and if it is to be stopped, it must be stopped at its beginning. Yes. When, when it even came to Nazi Germany, I understand this is a hyperbolic argument, I'm just using it because it's a clear-cut example. When it came to the types of literature they decided to burn, they didn't just say, oh, everything progressive, anti-racist, everything Jewish, let's burn that. They would say, oh, well, this, this is child abuse, but it was everything research about gay people. And if, you've sp if you use very specific problems to defend the act, the the dissolution of information on a broader topic, you're participating in so, authoritarian apologies. So, so, so yes, but I think you're talking about something else. So we'll, we'll, we can break this down first. If Trump went so far as to ban universities teaching critical race theory, then that's a serious, serious problem. I've seen people complain that there was like a, a there, I can't remember what it was. I think, maybe, I think it was West Point. I did a class on like queer theory and people complained about it. And I'm like, why are you complaining about a class on something? If people want to go and learn about it, they should learn about it and they go to university for it. The actions being taken that I have issue with that I can only specifically cite was Trump saying these specific trainings violate the law. Now, I think it's fair to say Trump didn't know what he was talking about. That's easy. He, he couldn't even answer on the debate stage. And a lot of people complained about that. But if they but violated if, the law, he wouldn't need to create any new laws to get rid of them. He didn't. It was an executive order. Well, an executive order is a function of the law, no? So it's the president saying, do this. It sounds like well, yeah, critical but it's race theory. They, they took critical race theory and used it as an excuse to create ridiculously racist functions. And then they're just so, instead and of Trump saying, called, hey, get rid of those functions, don't do that again. He's getting rid of the theory that was used. No, 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 That's no. That's no, what no. it sounds that, like. So that part of the argument is well beyond to. what we're actually talking about. That's why I'm saying if Trump went so far and that we'd have to pull up, I would agree with you. Trump should not ban knowledge or theory. But if Trump is saying the government is engaging in trainings that teach this thing to employees and those things are violations of Title VII, well, we can't legally do those things. Is white, is the idea that white people are inherently racist a critical race theory idea? I think, I think that most critical race theorists would argue that everybody carries with them racial biases, whether you're black or white. I think any academic who would say that only white people carry with them internalized biases is absolutely ridiculous. Well, we used to talk about we have um, comfort biases. So whatever you're comfortable with is what you're, you're, if you're not familiar, like familiarity biases. So if a white person was born in a black neighborhood, They'd be familiar with the black people yeah, and, white and people, not the white people. White people, by the way, who are born in like inner city kind of like black areas tend to develop the same cultural affectations as black people when it comes to relationships with the police or other institutions like that. It's about it's not about white people bad, black people good or anything like that. Even though these trainings, some of these sessions, I've seen them, some of them seem horribly cringy and ham fisted attempts by managers to try to fit some sort of nouveau standard of, you know, woke training. The fundamental idea here, at least for most critical race theorists, I imagine, is just simply we have to recognize these biases are inside of us, not just race, any type of uh, uh, inclination. Mm -hmm. The thing about the, race is what, what, what you're saying some, about yeah. uh, everyone has some kind of racist inclination. I completely agree with. I think people uh, it, it's so I learned this when I did fundraising for nonprofits. Anyone who's 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 capable of teaching you sales or fundraising will tell you absolutely people trust and like those who are just like them. And dude, so, so, so hold on. So that means when you approach someone wearing a suit, you try to act like someone wearing a suit. 
And that means there's a racial component to that, that if people see something familiar, you look like they do, they're more likely to be favorable. However, for what it's worth, I'm not going to pretend like Wikipedia is a fantastic source. I'm just not capable of pulling up the actual uh, article, which goes back to 1999 from Harris, 1993, Ladson Billings Critical Race Theory, which views white skin that some Americans possess is akin to owning a piece of property. In, in that, it grants privileges to the owner that a renter, in this case, a person of color, would not be afforded. Cheryl L. Harris and Gloria Ladson Billings describe this notion of whiteness as property, whereby whiteness is the ultimate property that whites alone can possess. Valuable just like property, the property functions of whiteness, rights to disposition, rights to use and enjoyment, regula- re- reputation and status property, and the absolute right to exclude, make the American dream more likely and attainable for whites as citizens. Yes, that would violate Title Seven of the 1964 Civil Rights Act if you told people that in a, in a government setting. I uh, genuinely don't believe it would. That's just a flourish, uh, purple prose way of saying that white uh, privilege exists. And while they may have phrased you, that, that, it there that, in a very alliterative way, I think everything there is perfectly defensible. I if, would, if I'm, someone made a stereotypical statement about black people in, in a government setting, would that violate their civil rights? It's not a stereotypical statement in a way that infers racism. It's matter uh, just a discussion well, of uh, privilege. That's your opinion. Well. If, if someone wait, do you, wait, wait, do you think it's a violation of the law in a sort of diversity training class to say that white privilege exists? Yeah, well, in this context, it would be yes. I, I genuinely don't <laughs> think that is the case. I, I if, mean, th- there, there is a big difference between treating people differently based off their race and recognizing that society treats people differently based off their it, race. You can't, you can't discriminate on the basis of race. But you're not so, by telling them. But the thing so is, going, races going, are going, different going genetically. And telling people that one race is inherently privileged over another would be racist. But I, race, don't, I don't, I, I just, I just have listen, to. Listen, oh, listen, yeah, go your, for it. Your, yeah. Your, 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 your argument about white privilege, the problem I have with it is, first of all, I recognize the concept of a majority privilege. In the United States, there is a, a dominant, uh, a much larger portion of white people than any other race, thus creating a familiarity bias that we mentioned. This is something I, I'm not trying to say that everything I'm saying is what Brett Weinstein believes, but Brett Weinstein has talked about things like this. It's if you go wild. to China, for instance, there's no white privilege. There, there, there's there's none. You're an outsider. In fact, it, it, you know, when I go to a country like Korea, they're extremely ethno-nationalist and they think they're better than everyone else in the world. You get treated better so, there as a white person than a black person, though. You ever go to but Japan? But that's just racism. Yes, I, I, I have. Well, that's privilege. And so, so people having racist views is for sure, you can call it a privilege, but you can't, under uh, the law, discriminate against one race. The that's prob- not discrimination. The problem I have with this ideology is that what's the difference between saying that and say Jewish privilege? Well, the difference would be that the Jewish privilege thing is n- incorrect, I imagine. But have you done research on it? Yeah, I certainly this have. Is, I argue is, with a lot of neo-Nazis Vox, on my channel. Vox.com, Vox.com wrote this, actually arguing you're wrong, and it was a professor who, who made the same argument, and it was the weirdest thing I ever read. And when I quoted it, a bunch of leftists tried ascribing that quote, uh, ascribing that quote to me. The problem I have with it is I've heard the exact same thing about white privilege, to Asian privilege. And I've been told that Asians are the true bearers of privilege. Then you get books like In Defense of Looting that straight up say that Jews and their, their opinion and Asians, again, their opinion, represent capital. I can't believe you would say that of your own opinion, Tim. What? I, th- 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 yeah, no, 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 but, but you no, know why I, I have to no, do that. I know, I under- of course, of course, of course. I can miss quote. <laughs> Listen. What, first of all, it's not just a majority bias. A country which, by the way, has a very pernicious history of white uh, supremacy and white privilege is Bolivia, a country recently that had a socialist victory in an election. Two-thirds of that country is indigenous. The one-third that is white has historically hold, uh, held a great deal of power because, of course, they are the descendants from the conquistadors who right. came over there and just just made a mess of things and they've held power for for centuries since so i i just i i need to i I, listen if we are to defer to legal arguments i am not a lawyer i am of the utmost confidence that saying that there is white privilege in this country does not violate any discrimination practices with regards to federal training or employment i think it is a very true and very real thing that people should know not because white people should feel ashamed i have never in once in a for a moment in my life apologized to anyone for being white or for a man or being a dashing six foot two, I think it's just a piece of information that is helpful to contextualize other pieces of information. So so I disagree on racializing it, but I will say this. If we agree on on that point, then it sounds like what Trump did isn't terrifying. In fact, would just be a matter for the courts. So if Trump wants to say this is illegal because I believe it is and you believe it isn't, then the real issue is not despotism. The real issue is, okay, you file your lawsuit, 
It'll go to the courts. We'll interpret, determine whether or not it is a violation of Title VII. No, I can't accept that because, first of all, if it's already illegal, then they should be able to file court cases just based on the evidence they already have. They wouldn't need an executive order to give them the additional justification. Well, Additionally, when he talks about critical race theory, when, when Trump, when the Republicans, whatever, they aren't talking about like this very narrow set of cringy diversity uh, uh, you know, training practices. They're talking about a broad ideology that is infesting and de-Americanizing people to make them hate whiteness, to hate this country, to hate their race, whatever. And these things, uh, frankly, we should call them what they are, blatant authoritarian fear-mongering. And when we kowtow to it by saying, okay, well, we'll let the courts deal with it. Okay, well, in some cases, maybe the worst iteration of these diversity training things could conceivably be a violation of that law. We are abetting authoritarianism, and that is something I can't allow. I would rather a country where these policies continue and some are terrible and we slowly change them via process of existing law than one where the president of the United States of America, apparently operating on poor information, unilaterally decides to just shut it all down. That is a very dangerous precedent. But this is within the confines of our existing government, what the president has the authority to do, and there are means of rectifying it if it is a violation of the law. Yeah, sure, but that doesn't so, mean it's not authoritarian. Yeah, it's some bad authority so, with yeah, the like Patriot executive, Act and stuff. Yeah, just because like, he has the no, authority no, 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 doesn't no, no, no. mean it's right. No, no, no. It, it means that we have a system that, it, for one, is imperfect, but it's good in the sense that if Trump does something, he gets sued all the time and he's lost several times. And in my opinion... I do not like the idea that there would be a government program, uh, a government training program telling people that whiteness is inherently this, that, or anything I wonder else. what's white. Like, are you white? You're Asian. No, so no, are and, you and white? I'll, and I'll tell you. I'm I'll not even you. white. My skin's oh, no, not no, no, white. No, no, I'm like pink. I'm voting Biden. I'm going to be black in a couple yeah, of days. Okay. You're not, there is <laughs> so no will, black will, human. I will, there's no yeah. white yeah. human. Let's get that out of the way. There's no, shades. Listen. No human has that color. They're, those are shades. We use them improperly, those words. But people will have biases based on what other people look like. And so the problem I have is your ideology inherently turns me into a second-class citizen. Wait, how? Because I have been to these places where they tell me I'm not welcome in either space. I've would, been told that I both simultaneously have white privilege and don't, I, and as long as I agree with them, they're willing to grant me certain access. I would, I would never abet that. I don't I, think, I know you wouldn't, but right. this is what's happening in practice. But I can't, but I can't speak I, to, I, I just, I can't speak to, I have personally met many white nationalist authoritarians, but I can't say like just by way of you existing, uh, voting for Trump, aligning with them in that respect, that your ideas are exactly their ideas. No, they hate me. They insult me and they use racist terms for what I am. Well, it, it really depends and so on how. That's why I hate identitarianism, be it from them or the left. But I'm not engaging. But, but, but wait, wait, this, but what, the I'm white not engaging. Nationalists aren't putting policies in place. The, neither Trump, are we. Trump the, removed that. What policy. I did. No, first of all, we're not talking about policy. We're talking about the individual practices of individual government departments that maybe are worthy of criticism. Again, I haven't gone to these and I have very perfect reasons to distrust sometimes right leaning media's portrayal of these events. But even saying everything there, cringy as it seems, these are not this is not identitarianism these are at worst poor ways of describing the concept of white privilege which i think is a perfectly defensible concept you can believe in white privilege you can believe in agent privilege that bears no absolutely nothing on your character as an individual and anybody who would use these concepts as a as a hammer to to uh, dismiss you or to say your ideas aren't worthwhile to me i think that's disgusting and in fact and I, you know what i'll i'll be bipartisan on this okay because i get this sometimes in the left there are people who will say you can't have that opinion you're 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 white what are you talking about? you can't you're a man you know um you're by way of your privilege and i acknowledge i have privilege your ideas on this aren't worthwhile and i say to that as i always have idiotic Ideas are valuable, people are valuable by their own merits and none else. When we talk about concepts like privilege, we're talking about lofty statistical biases. Some black people will literally live their entire lives without really meaningfully getting racially discriminated against, and some white people will get frequently uh, uh, um, messed up because they're white. It's all about averages and statistics, and anybody who uses that as an individual condemnation, I have to tell you, this is not anything that I support. And I so don't think it's representative of critical race the theory. The problem is, when you try to address the problem from racial mm -hmm. standpoints, you create the, the circumstances in which the individual will be oppressed. How? So if you create a, a, plat a, a, a training program that says, and I know, I know you said it wasn't, you, you, weren't, you didn't like it, when you take, you know, 8,900 white males or whatever, and, you know, you, you I, I think that was actually a different circumstance. But when you bring white males to a special training camp to tell them to address their privilege, those people are having their rights violated based on, a, a, if you want to call it a, a distorted or corrupted view of whatever the theory actually is, then it's being used 
to oppress individuals. Yeah, I just, so, I so think I'll, it's, it's like corporations, you know, like corporations. Let, let, let me give you an example. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Me, I worked for Fusion. They had a presidential forum. They told me I looked too white to participate. What should I do? Uh, well, I... Um, and, and wait, 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 in what in what capacity were you were you there? So I worked for this company as a senior correspondent, mm -hmm. and they were doing a presidential forum where they were going to be asking questions of presidential candidates. And I went to the president and I said, "I'm just wondering why I wasn't notified as a senior correspondent and somebody who's supposed to be hosting things for you." Mm -hmm. And they said they brought in someone else who was black, and he said, "Well, he's like, you're too white," and I was like, "I'm second generation mixed race." I was like, "I've dealt with." violence and racism and he was like yeah but come on man he's like look man these people are extremely racist you know so you can't you can't do it i think we're well, I mean, well so, I, so, I, so, I, wait so. i just want to say i mean you know i'm not going to come in favor of that but that has nothing to do with critical race theory that is corporate pr 101 sure. they do the same thing with their commercials they'll be like eh, you're a little bit too ethnic. companies do yeah yeah this is but but i have to say that has again nothing to do with critical race theory often the people who are making these decisions are people who are let me tell you quite in need of understanding if, critical race theory if you know according to long-standing critical race theorists whiteness is as a skin color is a is something you can hold that grants you access and reputation and privilege yeah, pr yeah, it's privilege. and it is a component it's because we're race blending theory. class being applicant being being applied by people who, who I, I think to be fair we can say people who are dumb but if people are <laughs> taking these ideologies and saying Whiteness is a special thing that applies to your skin color and negates who you are in, in the fact that an individual will then be oppressed or denied rights. It's a violation Just of civil the, rights law. The way it comes off to me, I mean, I can't, I can't speak to these individually, again, if, if regardless how bad they are. I will say, though, they, I mean, you've heard of the book White Fragility. I assume yeah. this is a big popular. Leftists hate this book. We hate this book because the person who wrote it is, if I may, a cynical corporate uh, 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 sellout whose primary interest is, as a diversity trainer, encouraging other corporations to get more diversity training. Diversity training doesn't work. It doesn't actually work that well. Maybe you get some marginal benefits, but in terms of the money invested, it turns out that if a person has racial biases, sitting them in a one-week seminar is not going to do anything about it. Who knew? So with that being said, when I hear about these government industries, I don't think these are being done by like far left critical race theorists. I think these are people these are people who are functionally working off the same set of misguided principles that have been dictating corporate policy for decades now and attempt to overstate how hip and cool and totally not bigoted they are. But with regards to the executive order, if one ideology begets another, and if you want to believe critical race theory well, leads well, to stuff like that. We agree on that point. Okay, okay, well, then I'm glad, so, I'm glad about so, that. So, so here's my question. Uh, well, I don't want to interrupt you. You finish your thought just so people can hear it. I yeah. don't want to, because I, I, I know what you're, I'm assuming I know what you're gonna say. Right, if critical race theory leads to that, and again, I contest, because I feel like corporations are doing basically that for ages, but um, then we must acknowledge then, of course, that there are elements of Trump's language, like the way he presents himself, the stuff that he says, that do lead to the creation of far-right militias and violence, in the same way that any political sort of extreme group will form from any type of speech. But to then executively ban conservatism in an attempt to target the extremism, I think we would recognize then, okay, maybe we should have painted with a finer brush here. So, you so, know? so let's, uh, I guess the question then is, did Trump outright ban the ideology across the board, even at universities, or did he ban the specific trainings? Well, he, he banned the trainings. Did he, now, you're gonna have to correct me if I'm wrong. Did he not say that, um, federal funding would be taken away from universities that participated in that training, or am I? I, I, I don't know about that one. Okay, I, I could be misremembering that. I'll, I'll just put it this way. The, the, the training programs I read to you mm -hmm. about taking white males on like some trip to like have them reflect on their racism or whatever. Mud wrestle. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that, you, you, would, you, would, you would say that's bad. I, I can't imagine that being effective. But can you would, can you, you denounce that with me, but also acknowledge that critical race theory as like a tool for understanding Racism based on, can be based on what I can read about critical race theory, I'd say absolutely Well, not. check it out. Race theory is talking about class and race combined because we come from a country where our ancestors were white, if you want to call us white, which I still don't think we are. And they were wealthy. And so that wealth has been passed down through generations to people with the similar skin tone. And the black people, when they're not black, they had slaves with no money. So that lack of right. wealth has been passed. So and now there's a class diversion. Yes. And there's an inherent bias in our society because of the class diversion. And so if the yeah, issue I, is, if the issue is we want to help people who are poor, we now have a problem with the likes of these programs in that you now have a whole mix of people who are both poor and uh, wealthy who are of all different races 
and there's a disproportion of people of one race who might be wealthier or, or uh, Im impoverished. If you enact racial policy, you leave people poor and you don't actually solve the problem of poverty. So is our goal to just say we want to help one race, ignoring all the others, or do we want to end poverty? In which case, these programs should be ended and our policies should be based on class and not race, so long as we've gotten rid of racism in our in our laws. Sure, the racial of course. Well, there are racial disparities that will need to be addressed as well. If you have black folk on average in a certain place and white folk on average in a better place, lifting people out of poverty won't respect won't fix the respective divide between black and white people. It'll just level the pot in general. But that's better than nothing. I mean, we're not even getting that in this country. So honestly, at this point, I mean, I'll I take think... that. But I just I need to say, because I think I found a comparison, maybe a, perhaps a more effective one with regards to this. Um, you're aware, of course, that back in the 1980s, even the 90s, um, the promotion of homosexuality as legitimate lifestyle, saying it's okay to be gay. This was called child abuse in many, many circles. This was, in fact, a mainstream Republican position for a very long time. And we all know the propaganda that they used. If there was an executive action that was taken to ban federal governments that told the people there that it was okay to be gay or that you shouldn't discriminate. That's not a good analogy, dude. Because the accusation that it abetted um, child abuse, I would be equally skeptical of that tendency. We have to be, when it comes to banning certain types of ideas in no, federal listen, government, we have to be very careful. How would you feel if in the 80s there were government training saying it was, it, uh, government training saying that being gay was wrong and they told people who were gay to go on retreats to address their gayness, you would want that banned, wouldn't you? Yeah, but I, there wasn't a, what broader idea would I be banning along with it? I would be fine with the, that the, specifically. So, so here's what I'm saying. I think, I think the real issue at heart is, did Trump ban the idea or did he ban the trainings? Well, it's, never, it's really hard to tell because Trump, anytime he signs an executive order, it's really vague. I think, I think we could, but I don't think we need to keep arguing. I think we can say we agree the trainings shouldn't happen and we, we agree that people should be allowed to learn Assuming the they're as bad as what indicated here yes. again. yeah um yeah that's that's fine i don't think they're effective anyway you know i think i mean you'll find most critical race theories don't agree with that critical race theory along with critical theory are derivatives of the frankfurt school and a generally marxist perspective on social events that is to say a sort of agitative discursive process of different classes interacting with one another leftists don't like corp corporate diversity training of course we, of course yeah we, i'm just I, like look when when you've got I don't know who Cheryl L. Harris is or Gloria Lanson Billings. I'm sure they're wonderful the people. Three research whiteness as property, and you see how that extends into a whole facet of, of racialized thinking, like affirmative action, for instance, is a component of all of this. It's not not of critical race theory. Okay. I mean, according to this, it is. Well, affirmative action was implemented uh, uh, off of reasons that had nothing to do with critical race theory. Critical race theory is just about the respective antagonisms. In fact, I think most critical race theorists, or at least most orthodox ones, you know, like leftist ones, would actually be quite critical of the idea that you could emancipate black people by giving them prioritization within a capitalist framework. And that in that respect, you're only further cementing them in a system that has caused them to fall to the place they're in today. I, I imagine that would well, be... Well, a critique of capitalism. Well, sure. I mean, it all gets lumped together, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, something that's interesting is how races are actually genetically different. Like, like, after you know, and it's that's a challenging that, conversation. That, yeah, because it can be a seem offensive, but I mean, the genetic, the reason you look different is because your genetics are different. Um, and so I don't know what's your thought on that. I, I mean, it's the, there are modern biology is very interesting. Again, I said I argue with a lot of Nazis. Uh, nowadays, uh, biologists don't even use race; they use clines as an idea, which have intersecting lines of parallel DNA. Um, uh, uh, what's the term? Um, uh, similarities uh, that can vary based on race, ethnicity, geography. The interesting stuff is when you look at all the um, how all these intersect. There's more genetic diversity in the continent of Africa than there is between the average black and white person. Meaning that if you took one African, not like black American, but African, and found another random African and then DNA tested whatever, the difference between them would be greater than if you took a random African oh, so and a it's random not the European. Color of their skin necessarily, even though they're so different races within it's just, the Africans. It's just interesting. Yeah, so, yeah. So this, the, the issue is people use race as a colloquial term for saying like the color of your skin and the certain features that exist within your you know typically your face or your body yeah so they'll use that to describe like you know asian eyes or whatever or you know black people's noses or whatever whether they're racial stereotypes which i think to an extent yes because just because the color of your skin is one way doesn't imply but uh, i bring that up to point out that some people don't get i, I guess this, this might you might agree with this i don't know that white privilege doesn't necessarily mean white skin. 
Yeah, there are ways that you can evoke white privilege while actually being quite non-white, which what, is what, what I mean is like somebody who's perhaps albino, but visually distinct. You know oh yeah, I mean? of, co of course, because even people who like black people or albino, or there's a there's a skin condition some black people have that leads to them having patches of white skin. Michael Jackson claimed that he had it, but he obviously didn't Maybe because called, it was was it vitiligo? Something mm, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, sometimes it can cover the whole face, but obviously there are other uh, indications from people who. Um, who, I guess, prioritize different races over others, that they should treat them differently or something like that. Anyway, I just, I think what I think we all need to agree upon fundamentally, and I'm sure that we all do here, at least in concept, maybe not in actual in, uh, um, practice or implementation, is that the idea that people have a different sort in life based on the color of their skin or whatever else, it's kind of cringe, it's not based. Yeah, and totally. I, I think there are a lot of deep-seated problems in this country, and I guess, my frustration here stems largely from the fact that I wish I could say, like with great confidence, that, you know, vote blue and this will get fixed. But, well, I do believe that Biden would be better for race relations than Trump, as do many Americans. Um, we know that's not true. A lot of these cities with these deeply held racial disparities are Democrat-run cities. I don't think Republicans would necessarily do better, but it does indicate that the system we have right now is not really fixing this problem. No, like, it's man, it's, de man, it's debt slaves, man, to the, yeah. to the well, banking system that wants is, interest. It's a it, that that's a great point. These cities that have the problems of police brutality, the places where these uh, these individuals have lost their lives that sparked these protests, run by Democrats. Now, again, it's, we, we don't have the metric to say that big cities run by Republicans would do any better. I think we have San Diego, which uh, is, is, has a, a Republican mayor and didn't see, I guess, uh, high crime. It's not on the high because they're list. all stone, man. <laughs> Southern maybe, California. Maybe. Well, it's, it's the so, same problem with COVID in America, right? No two cities are alike. No one country is alike. The best argument I've heard is that a lot of the cities that have high degrees of racial disparity are also run by Democrats because a multi-racial, multi-ethnic city is more likely to vote in Democrats, just based on demographic trends. San Diego has a lot of white and Hispanic people, doesn't have as many black people, so it might contribute to the trend. I don't really well, know. Well, so, so this this was a, a post, I think it was the Washington Post, they, they mapped out the highest crime cities because I think Trump said they're all run by Democrats, and they found that I think in the, um, by sh sheer numbers, that's true, but obviously, New York has more people. They have more crime. Yeah, yeah. But per capita, I think there were no Republican cities. There were two non-affiliated cities, and the rest were Democrat. And that would exclude San Diego, which I think is like the eighth biggest city mm -hmm. and doesn't have high, high, a high rate of crime. But uh, I, I think it's fair to say that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the problem is individual Democrats. I think it shows a problem might be single-party control, no political competition. So uh, in California, for instance, they've had an ongoing problem with homelessness in Los Angeles and for San Francisco. And what happens is, because I actually worked for a homeless shelter in the LA area, you keep getting Democrats who campaign on this, but they have no competition. So when they win, they just laugh and do nothing. Then you get wealthy people in, in the actual LA proper saying, not in my backyard. So then nothing gets done about it. And unless, I don't know how do you change that because what happens in these cities, people just go and they say, Democrat, all across the board, and then nothing changes because nothing has to change. Yeah, we need, uh, absolutely, we need uh, ranked choice voting in this country. This is, we are, we live in a shockingly undemocratic country. Nobody feels represented well, by either party. we're not supposed to be overtly democratic. No, no, like well, of course we have the Republicans, but we need at least, I mean, even the founding fathers said that a two-party system, or even parties in general, would, would lead to the downfall of this country, because, and there are a lot of problems with them, but if we're going to keep parties, man, ranked choice voting would allow third parties to actually exist and flourish. Right now, they never can. They can't I do agree. it. It's not possible. The I, spoiler effect will always lead towards two parties being the two dominant ones. So let's let's do this and jump into Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Hey! <laughs> my man, rocking... We're, we're going long tonight. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, super I'm long. Wow. Uh, wait, what, wait, what time is it? It's 10. 10. What, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've been talking for two hours. Yeah, more. man. Oh, okay, we all take so, a sip. You got to uh, stay hydrated, people. Take a sip, guys. Um, I I don't like any of the political establishment. I think there's very few people on either side that I'm that I like and think are good people. And there's slightly more Republicans than Democrats. But you know, I think it's because the majority of both parties are people who, like I said, didn't have to do anything. Gerrymandering heavy uh, uh, guaranteed districts, you end up with Republican areas that are always going to be Republican. So the Republicans, they don't got to do anything. They'll be like, hey, vote for me or don't. Haha, <laughs> who cares? The Democrat says the same thing. Mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi held up a glass of water and she said, in my district or AOCs, you put a D on this glass of water, it's going to get elected. That's a problem. That's a serious problem. I disavow Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> yeah, I, as I you want, should. I want it to be so uh, I like the idea of ranked choice voting. 
because to me, it would get rid of. Well, actually, I'm not entirely convinced it would get rid of Nancy Pelosi. Or, term limits or, would. How do you feel about term limits? Um, I I haven't seen any evidence that they lead to a more democratic government. I'm 50-50. I could go either way. I Though I have to say, I really do think the only reason that Nancy Pelosi is still in there right now is because of fear. Democrats are terrified of Trump. I think they have good reason to be. But you have somebody, Shahid Buttar, who's running against Nancy Pelosi to try and unseat her in her district. Um, Republican? Uh, no, a, a Democrat, a progressive, though, like uh, in line but, with but the Bernie AOC. Passed already. Yeah, no, it did. And, and that's the thing. And I think that, like, fundamentally, the Democratic Party is ready to move on to a different set of ideas, a more true fulfillment, maybe, of what it could mean for its citizens. And the party, by the, by, I, right, the right. citizenry, the actual elected officials, though, have every trick in the book that they can pull out to maintain themselves in power for as long as is humanly possible. And this is my argument for why Trump needs to win. Oh, no. Joe Biden is a 47-year establishment crony who wants to control of the executive branch to seal the doors and never allow any challenge ever again. They are upset that they lost in 2016. They weren't supposed to. They did everything to crush Bernie Sanders. And Donald Trump is the insurgent who upended the Republican Party, and they hated his guts too. Now they're beholden to him. Here's, here's my opinion, and, you, and, and, and I ask for yours in, in, in afterward. If Joe Biden gets in, he's locking the doors. They're going to shore up the fences. They're going to install their bureaucrats. They're going to make sure that you guys don't get a foot in the door ever. You got too close with Bernie Sanders. Trump, see, here's the thing. Bernie Sanders, left-wing populist. Donald Trump, right-wing populist. The elites did not like either of them. The establishment Republicans hate Trump, and that's, a, that's exemplified by the Lincoln Project and the cronies who have now, are now just espousing whatever the Democrats want them to say. If Joe Biden wins, they get back in the ivory tower, they bolt the doors shut, and they laugh at both populist wings. Trump was a bull brought to the gates who stormed in, trashed everything, and the Democrats are freaking out, but still in there. Bernie Sanders was very polite. Hello, hello, let me in, please. I'll, I'll agree with you. I'll stop hmm. saying the millionaires. If Joe Biden wins, I believe there will never be another populist, be it left, right, or, or whatever. I think if Trump wins, Joe Biden was the best they could muster. They are done. If Joe Biden gets in and Kamala Harris then ends up being that person in charge, there will never be a Bernie Sanders. There will never be a leftist populist. But if Trump gets in and the establishment withers and dies over the next four years because Trump's going nuts, he's going to fire everybody. He's stripping all these government protections from these employees. He said he's going to fire the head of the CIA. To put his own cronies in, yeah. I don't, I don't, but, but is he going to be able to do that? And if, and if he fires them, somebody has to go there. But that's, but that's still an argument beyond what he is doing. So, so maybe that's an issue. But if Donald Trump gets rid of the bureaucrats and he strips the establishment of its power, then I believe in 2024, you're going to see something new and wild, whatever it is. I don't think it's going to be Trump 12 years. I think Joe Biden is the best they could muster up to try and save the crony establishment. And the Republicans like Rick Wilson and, and the other Lincoln Project people joined forces with them showing us who they really are. Joe Biden is getting more money from Wall Street than Trump is. He gets more money from the wealthy than Trump does. He is the, he is the establishment billionaire candidate who is being protected by big tech and billionaires who are censoring stories that might hurt him. Okay. Let uh, Biden go. Okay, so we've got a lot to unpack here. Oh yeah. First of all, um, I fail to see in any meaningful way how Trump is anti-establishment. He has consolidated an enormous amount of power into the federal government. He seems as if not more comfortable with executive orders than Obama ever did. He's up drone strikes. And what's more, he has fundamentally eroded the institutions which are meant to challenge the government. The media. Is the media bad? Absolutely. But the media still serves a very useful role in this country as ineffectuously as they do. How has and Trump they done that? The media has constantly called the, the, I'm sorry, Trump has constantly called the media the enemy of the people. He's threatened to remove press badges from people who are mean to him at press conferences. I know Obama did that to Fox News. Obama, no, it's the degree to which this took place is not even comparable. <laughs> These are two different worlds. And calling uh, press the enemy of the people is like fascism 101. I don't care about right-leaning people getting their populists in office. Right-leaning populism has a name. It's fascism. I don't want no, these people. It, no, it unquestionably is. I don't want these people in office. I don't care about you the- you define fascism? Yeah, fascism is an ultra, uh, ultra-nationalist, far-right form of governments which relies on the assembly of the common will, uh, the unification of a- um, of a national narrative against enemies from both within from without it usually has to focus on things like machismo or perhaps on the belief in a type of ethnic or racial supremacy so how would you define right-wing libertarians 
right? I don't think there is a such thing as a right wing libertarian. Well, how how is that how is that possible? Because I, I have never met one. I keep talking to people who say they are, and then they stop being libertarian the moment it comes to literally there any issue a, other than taxes a, and weed. There was a dude who took his clothes off on the stage of the libertarian debate to argue about freedom, and they had a debate over whether or not kids should you should be allowed to sell heroin to kids. Yeah. Well, like, oh, well, they they, they are like, some amazing people. Um, I will not deny it, but they aren't they aren't populist libertarian I, I don't guess. tend to be wait but, but i have to say because we we have we have so much to unpack here mm -hmm. with regards to trump okay uh is joe biden a candidate that i feel proud of voting for of course not absolutely yeah i'm not even going to waste time defending that when it comes to the means for populism to interfere with the government after joe biden wins i am optimistic uh he has managed to that is to say uh, bernie sanders has extracted an enormous number of concessions from joe biden and what's more there are inc increasing signs that the popularity of the uh, of the squad and of other um more populist left-leaning progressive sometimes even socialist candidates they are starting to wean in on the democratic party the constant conflict between pelosi and aoc and the fact that at certain points pelosi has had to defer public opinion to aoc in those respects is an indication that within in that party there is a real chance at these dinosaurs i think the average age of the democratic politician is like 71 or something these hmm. dinosaurs being ousted now mind you i am a socialist i don't think aoc is radical enough but i recognize that progressive change in a given direction is preferable especially when we recognize what we're gambling with here even if i were to believe that donald trump was some sort of anti-establishment bull and i don't consolidated heavy amounts of federal power defunded institutions what, what, what does that mean well, the um, the uh, constant use of executive action, uh, the fact that he has normalized attacks on institutions which uh, attack him, like, for example, his attempt to try and get the FBI director fired during the Russiagate investigation, or the constant attacks on the press and the media, or the fact uh, that he seems to be contemptuous of the very idea of losing an wait, election itself. Wait, you, you, so... Uh He's consolidating federal power, but trying to also fire the heads of these organizations, it's, institutions. It's fair. I'm sorry. I should be more specific. Executive power. The, yes. Uh, right. But, but hasn't, hasn't he been heavily constrained in every direction? He's been sued a million times. Good, yeah, because he keeps repeatedly. breaking the law. He breaks the law constantly. Like he, well, no, he he does. Yeah, he has uh, what, engaged in scandal laws? after scandal after scandal over the course of his presidency. Just be specific. With, with what? I mean, like, we could name a scandal. Name name laws broken. Um, because we hear it a lot. I can tell you that uh, does Trump use his authority and push really hard and then get challenged in the courts and lose sometimes and win sometimes? Sure. Yes. Sure. So we can talk about the administration. First of all, the, uh, the Russiagate investigation led to literally dozens of credible indictments and arrests. Uh, with regards to their misappropriation of funds or with their collaboration with foreign governments. We have the Ukraine scandal, of course, with regards to him bartering aid with their willingness to help that him. That seems true now, though. What do you mean? That Joe Biden was, was using his son as an intermediary. You still can't withhold aid on the condition that they release that information. Well, so that's an argument about whether or not Trump had a right to withhold aid. He did, but Joe, it's, that's illegal. Joe Biden did it. He did it. He literally did it. We have him on camera. Joe Biden yeah. said, so they're both you won't get the money unless you do what I want. Yeah, I, so I can't. both criminals? Wait, I'm not. Wait, I've, I have never at any point in my life defended Joe Biden. No, no, no. no, no. I, I know, I know. But if we can make that argument, we could say then Joe Biden's doing the same thing. Yeah, the difference is that Joe Biden wasn't the president of the United States no, of America when he did it. Yeah. I mean, if you want, you can. You're free to investigate. <laughs> yeah. You're free to investigate when why you do won't this. They? I, what, what do you mean? Like, the, why? Why is like the media and its big? What do you tech mean the media? Wait, you, this this organization, this vague conspiracism. Yeah, you guys are the, the media too. No, 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 no. no. The yeah. New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have both now written that there was a big effort to not cover the Biden scandal. I would need to look into the specifics of it. In what, fact, one in of fact, the things that I don't like when we talk about like the relative the badness of these characteristics is when we start playing defense for them on the assumption that the media is going after them or not going after them. The left leaning sure. media will go after left leaning aims. Yep. Right-leaning media will go after right-leaning aims. There is no such thing as journalistic integrity or objectivity. There are only people and power and money. Well, the, so, the establishment media. I don't know what the establishment so media is. So the New York means. Times, for instance. How is that just the, what, what about Fo Fox News is the most viewed uh, news station in the country. Tucker Carlson is the largest pundit Great talk show and do you know radio. you know how many views uh, Chris Cuomo and Rachel Maddow got combined? I, I mean. Like 8 million. And do you know what, do you know what Tucker Carlson got? In, in his average was five. I'm, so if you're comparing, he's peaked at tens of millions, hasn't he? Didn't what? hasn't he peaked recently? He got like his no, ratings no, 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 no. hit like it's five five million was like the historical record. He's like the most oh, viewed. Oh my goodness! But, Sorry, but 
when you combine CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NBC, CBS, it's tenfold. Because you're because you're combining all of the left wing media, and arguably some of these are barely left leaning, with very part with one partisan right media. If you take a look at all of talk radio, if you take a look at um, uh, uh, Fox News, if you take a look at uh, take a look at OAN, for example, OAN's or, viewership is like no, it's really not it's not low. great, but it does have a lot of influence within the government because we know that Trump watches it, and Trump is himself a form of media when he talks about things with the broadcast that he give, he reflects essentially far-right partisan talking points. These are in many ways reflective of the, the political opinions that right-leaning people will have forthcoming. We, 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 we got off we, a little bit did, here. I want, I want to talk specifically, though, about uh, uh, Trump with regards to his, his practice in government. Yeah. Even if we're to leave aside the supported criminality of any candidate, because as far as I'm concerned, being the president is a crime. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> it's a weird I'm, job. I'm really not in a position I'm, I'm to. I'm okay with the president, but I'd right. like to have more this, people. This is one of the things that I've said. Uh, even if, because uh, you know, you don't want Bernie Sanders to win. You would. You, my fellow lefties, whoever's watching, would be devastated to see what even a left-leaning person has to do to be and stay president in the United States. Uh, especially with regards to foreign policy. But if we want to look past that stuff, if we want to look at stuff like climate change, or if we want to look at stuff regarding like education, or if we want to look at stuff just regarding like the fundamental gentlemen's agreements that have operated in this country for centuries now that seem to be unweaving, I don't think that the Trump presidency is anti-establishment. I think that he's very pro-corporate. I think he's very pro-government as long as it's his government. I think that his persistent refusal to acknowledge uh, the, uh, that if he loses in the election that he should actually step down peacefully is terrifying. And I think that while Joe Biden is a haughty institutionalist crony who probably has as many original thoughts in, he, in his head that weren't given to him by like focus groups as like a, a, your average chipmunk. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that he fair. is a-, a that's, we, a that's, that's me to chipmunks. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm sure there, I've known chipmunks. many wonderful Chipmunk chipmunks. Um, I, I think that he is at least with regards to climate change, which I think is a very simple, very, very easy thing to focus on, an objective uh, improvement, and that he also allows for meaningful left-wing populism as opposed to what Trump is, which is a gateway to very, very bad far-right populism. Have you read about Obamagate? Uh, yes. I, oh, you mean the thing where he spied on Trump? So, the, well, the, like the meeting with Sally Yates and Comey and Biden and, and, and Obama where uh, uh, where Joe Biden suggested using the Logan Act against Michael Flynn to falsely uh, prosecute him, where they then threatened his son with imprisonment unless he agreed to testify against Trump. Okay. Did, did any of that actually happen? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so to clarify, though, uh, the, the notes that were released in the investigation by the FBI show that there was a note scrawled that uh, ascribed Logan Act to Joe Biden in a meeting with Sally Yates. Immediately afterwards, I think it was Sally Yates who then wrote an email to herself explaining everything that happened and sent it to her. And then several government employees in the FBI took out liability insurance saying in like, I'm paraphrasing, that we're in serious trouble. We better buy insurance because we're gonna get sued over this. Okay. I, I can't speak to the specifics of this. I know that Trump has vaguely alluded at some sort of left conspiracy to deny him the presidency, which has always come off very um, so the fascist notes are released. to me. The notes are released. Uh, do you know about the Peter Stroke and Lisa Page things? I, can, I, I have to say, and I apologize if this comes off like, a, a, um, I guess, disinterested, but uh, having followed, I guess, the events leading up to, and I've explored this Obamagate thing pretty extensively, from what I've seen and from the media sources that I've looked at and the information, the analysis, I haven't seen anything that even remotely justifies the claims that Trump has made about this. Do you know about the text messages between Lisa Page and Peter Stroke? I don't know the specific. So where he said, we're going to stop him, we have an insurance policy. I, that, like this is this is all public information. I think the issue is when you talk about Russia Gate and Trump's actions, it's coming from a place of you not actually looking at the evidence. No, I I, I assure you, I have the issue is that well, if you didn't what, know about the meeting with Comey and Yates, no, and I'm, Obama I'm, I'm, and the Logan Act and what Michael Flynn was threatened with, and like do you know about the ongoing court case where Judge Sullivan is blocking the prosecute like the government from dropping its own case? No, I'm familiar with the things that you referred to here. The issue is that what usually happens with this is that there are a lot of nuances to these cases that need to be looked over thoroughly, and usually the way they're presented is extremely hyperbolic. Like Russiagate. Well, Russiagate so, provides... Well, again, keep in mind, this is the big difference between right-leaning and the claims and Russiagate. Russiagate was investigated dozens of indictments and arrests. All these not accusations... Not related to Russiagate, though. 
they well they were brought about by the investigation into Russiagate involving in, the misappropriation we have an of campaign FBI funds. A lawyer who was recently indicted on altering evidence to frame Carter Page and get false FISA warrants to investigate in the Russiagate. So some of these may have been may, may be, what, what what's the saying? Uh, fruit of the poison tree. Fruit, or whatever? fruit of the poison tree. Fruit yeah. of the poison tree. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot uh, of the Trump instance, administration Manafort, has found themselves arrested. Do you know how Paul Manafort ended up getting uh, found out? It was actually Ukrainians colluding with the DNC operative and providing documents, which which led to the investigation of Manafort. So it was all overtly political actions. There's nothing. Well, it's wait, not, uh, I, I wait, 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 wait. There's nothing necessarily wrong with political actions. We're talking about the investigation of a political of a political administration of the Trump administration. The, the, the reason I bring this up is what, and by you, the way, we, we've moved somewhat off of the electability or the the electoralism right, right. argument um, here. So, so here's the point: the, the the way you framed everything about Trump and the actions and the things he was saying firing Comey. Sounds like Comey should have been fired based on the information that's come out since he fired him. That is, oh, wait, hold on. That is, abs first of all, even if that is the case, which I sincerely doubt it is, that is absolutely not why Trump claimed to. The evidence that was provided with regards to his attempt was he wanted Comey fired because Comey was looking into him. You can't post hoc justify an illegal act so, because hold, it turns out on. later. Trump tweeted early, way, on, way early, that he was being spied on by Obama. He wasn't being spied on by Obama. The, well, so, so the, the accusations the FBI that were being, had had informants that were going and having meetings with Trump's people and then spying on them. That is what the FBI I mean, it's does. It's a so so sure. So you have people who were spying on Trump's campaign. It's a colloquial. I mean, if you want to argue semantics about the no, word that's spying. the FBI does that for every campaign. That's their job. So if you have before Trump is inaugurated a meeting with Obama, Yates, Comey, and then you have these notes, you have these text messages between FBI agents. And Trump knew about this, but it wasn't declassified, so Trump took action and fired the guy. I mean, it sounds justified. Well, he didn't fire. He attempted to fire the guy, and he wasn't able to. Comey? Yeah. The, he did uh, fire Comey. Well, no. And then the, Comey was like, I have a great recollection. Trump said this to me, and I'm like, what? No, no, no. The, um, uh, when he was being investigated for the Russiagate stuff. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, there's a cat. I think a cat just knocked she, the... Uh, no, my mic did. Fall. Oh, okay. Well, the cat ran afterwards. Well, we got to fix everything. Well, anyway, you, you, you keep talking. Carry on, yeah. yes. <laughs> no, his, his efforts uh, to, uh, to fire, there was um, the, the intermediary who he asked to fire the guy. I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, the, um, uh, the person who he attempted to uh, fire, and he said no, and then Trump fired that guy. Mm -hmm. um, could, do you was remember that, that name? Was that, uh, that, what was his name? Oh, I can't remember. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, com I'm completely, huh? Total blank. No, Sessions resigned. No, no, yeah, Sessions resigned. Look, 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 look. The, the, I'm not bringing this up to be like everything. Well, uh, yeah, I just feel, perfect. well, no, no, but I, the, the, it's just, it's in, it's interesting to me because again, it's just, it falls uh, like on this vague conspiracism. Like with regards but it's to not, the, it's not vague. I mean, look, if you read the news on these things, you'd know what I'm talking about. No, I, but I have, it's just a lot of these claims get jumbled up. And to be honest, I forget which narrative, or which universe that I'm operating in at any given point. With regards to like the uh, Russiagate investigation, there was solid evidence. They went in, they investigated. What was they the got evidence? The evidence with regards to the Rusty, uh, yeah. Russiagate investigation? Yeah, yeah. Um, wasn't there like um, uh, uh, some evidence that there may have been like meetings were held with members of the Trump administration uh, with regards to them accepting uh, deals or information from Russia? I don't know, are you sure? I mean, it's been like three years since this was politically relevant. I what, I, what I can tell you is that we know that the FISA warrants were obtained through uh, malpractice, I guess that you can put it. So we had, How? Uh, so the, they lied. Uh, an ex-FBI lawyer has been indicted and charged for altering evidence to imply that Carter Page was not an uh, was not uh, um, an asset of the CIA when he was having these meetings. When in fact he was doing it for the U.S. government. Yeah, I'd have to look and into so, that. Then. So they they essentially got bunk FISA warrants. Then we ended up with before Trump got got inaugurated, you have these notes released that, to the best of our understanding, it's it's a meeting between several individuals in the Obama administration to try and find a way to go after Michael Flynn to uh, get him to, uh, I, I guess, the FBI notes actually read, what's our goal? I think it's a text message. What's our goal? To prosecute or get him fired? My question when that came out was, why, why is the FBI trying to get a guy fired from his job? Well, well why Ob were they? Obama told Trump not to hire Michael Flynn. Trump hired him anyway. I guess Trump did it as an FU to Obama. So for some reason then, Obama has a meeting they take notes on Logan Act, maybe, for Michael Flynn. Then Michael Flynn gets accused of breaking the Logan Act. Or, or this, was, this was what launched the investigation, even though no one's ever been prosecuted under the Logan Act. It's an obscure law that says U.S. Uh, individuals can't represent themselves as agents of a government. Because as acting national security advisor, he had a conversation with the Russian ambassador asking him not to escalate uh, tension between the countries. That was the justification for launching this. this, this it, was, it was insane. Then you have text messages between P Peter Strzok and Lisa Page where they're saying, we have an insurance policy, we'll stop him. 
So Trump complains about this. Trump wants to fire these people, but then the Russian gate investiga investigation stopped him from taking any action against them. I'll tell you what, man. What? If at the end of this, we say no Trump, no Biden, but we get rid of all of these intelligence bureaucrats, I'm down. I'm totally down. Well, I mean, you you, you'll the, find most leftists aren't big fans of intelligence agencies. For yeah, sure, for sure. So when Trump says that, like, I'll put it this way. Do, do you agree with Trump then when he says that um, they're spying on me? They didn't, I don't even, didn't even get my first term. Frankly, I should be allowed a, a third term. No. Okay. But I'll tell you this. He says a lot of really weird he stuff he, sometimes. I know, now, I got, now I, I'm at something of a disadvantage here, and I, I apologize for that, because with regards to the Russiagate investigation thing, it's been a while since I've brushed up on this uh, respective information. I do know that the investigation that did lead to a number of legitimate um, investigations and, um, and arrests and indictments. And I think there's something to be said about that. I feel it's often very difficult to understand the totality of like a government conspiracy or like something going on behind the scenes until everything is sussed out through a proper investigation. And for that reason, sometimes it can be really difficult to understand not only the specificity of events that have taken place, but the severity of them as well. Because if you, if you want to, and I'm not saying you're doing this because everyone does this to some extent, if you want to, a disparate set of in pieces of information that uh, can be uh, uh, assessed and collected and presented in such a way as to give a narrative. And then once you have that narrative, you can run with it. And that's what Trump has done very often with this Obamagate thing, for example. Like, I remember when a reporter asked him what Obamagate was, and he was like, you know, and then he walked away, which I think was no, fair. I think it was Trump not knowing. Well, well then, I mean, <laughs> that's but, possible but that's too. the thing. And that's one of the issues that I have as well. The, the, I think that there has probably been more confused information put out from our government over the past four years um, than possibly any other single presidential administration, in large part because there doesn't seem to be any sort of cohesive narrative. It's just scraps of information being used whenever they're politically convenient and discarded when they're not. And this is, if I may bring this back around to what we were talking about earlier, one of the things that really concerns me about Trump. This is an anti-establishment tendency. This is just incompetent governance. This doesn't break the government in a way that makes it more fair or more representative or more kind or more decent or more efficient. This is a type of governance which just makes it worse. So do you want a competent establishment or an incompetent one? I mean, competent in certain ways when it comes to coronavirus handling, when it comes to to the um, dissemination of healthcare when it comes to proper schooling, all areas I think Trump has been woefully inadequate in, I would absolutely prefer a competent establishment because education handled properly empowers us. Not keeping us in our homes to be sick and die from coronavirus, that empowers us. There are ways the government, when managed properly, even in an establishment sense, even like even like there was someone like Obama, and I hate Obama, um, can give us tools that we need to become stronger. The best example of this that I use, and I use this when arguing with Bernie or Busters all the time, is um, they say Obama stopped the wheels of history. His, his corporate neoliberalism prevented the American people from waking up and recognizing what was wrong with the system. And I say to them, okay, I don't like Obama either. Great, sure. After Obama had two terms, guess who ended up coming in second? Narrow second. Under Hillary Clinton, the next de uh, Democratic primaries. Some nobody, independent senator, who then, in large part because people were disillusioned with Obama, but nonetheless given the tools to think and to act. That's the internet. The internet, yeah. But also, people weren't terrified of a pandemic or of global warming, at least not as much as they are today. Uh, people weren't um, uh, dealing with substandard schooling. The more people are terrified and confined and weakened by their circumstances, mm -hmm. the less politically emancipated they are. You know what makes it a real challenge, having you know, conversations like this, is just that mm -hmm. there's a lot of things you've read that I haven't, a lot of things I've read you haven't. And there are a lot of people who have read things that neither of us have or haven't. But everybody expects us to like come to a definitive understanding and solution within the span of a couple hours. I'm just bringing it up because I know that no one's going to be satisfied. Oh, I have never come to a definitive solution on anything over any length of time <laughs> so, in a so, conversation. So the reason I say this is because mm -hmm. uh, when you bring up global warming, mm -hmm. when you bring up the far right, when you bring up Russiagate, I'm like, wow. To like have a conversation on each of those subjects would take an, an hour or two, three or four hours. Like So just to briefly mention this. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, you said there's no actual right wing libertarians because I, whenever it comes to it, they actually end up, you know, being more authoritarian. Libertarianism was originally a leftist ideology and not, it not, was appropriated. Yeah, I, I not don't to get into it. Just I'm just. So yeah, to, yeah, yeah. To, I, to yeah. mention that. Then there's also like Russiagate where you're like, oh, I, it's been a while since I talked to us. And then I like the reason I brought that up was like, oh, we got to really break that down to address one point. And then climate change. There's a lot there, too. Like 
What are we doing internationally? What would Joe, like, why hasn't Joe Biden done anything about China? Not, not to open up those conversations. I'm just pointing out. There's a lot in each of those we'd have to actually break down. To yeah, of course. It's a, literally impossible to. Right. Even if you have a very specific policy-focused discussion on one issue, say school choice. That's a big one for Republicans these days. That's yeah. easily a three-hour discussion, depending <laughs> on how many sources you bring. Yeah. That can go the whole day. Are you so, for school choice? I am not for school choice, no. Why not? Why, why not? Why don't? Why shouldn't people have the right to just choose? I think it puts the blame in that. So here's my concern, right? Individual responsibility is the mantra of the Republican Party. Correct. Why are things in your life not going well? Individual responsibility. Often, sometimes that's true. We are agents capable of making our own decisions. But when it comes to systemic issues like neighborhoods with poor schooling, these people don't get bad educations because of poor decision making. They get it because their neighborhoods have been wastelands that the government hasn't invested in for decades. My concern, and this is what I fear, I wake up at night in a sweat thinking about this. It's imagine some single black lady, you know, two kids, two jobs. And now all of a sudden, school choice happens. Her local district is crap. There's one 30 minutes away she could drive her kids to, maybe even 20 minutes away. It's better. Okay, so you drive your kids to and from. Well, maybe you don't have time for that. Do you hire like a sitter to do it? No, do you, you send them to the crappy school. You like send, they would normally have to go to. Right, but that's the thing. And now when that woman writes online or writes an article or appears at a town hall and she says, what can I do? I am struggling. The answer is you should have took them to a better school. Sure. And that worries me But a why lot. take away the option? Because I think there's a better solution to the same problem. We just invest in these communities. Also, we have to keep in mind, if a lot of people choose to move to different school districts, or like take their kids there, or whatever, you know, um, the school district that's already there is going to be even worse because these schools get funding based on, you know, participation. Uh, they're going to get cut more and more, meaning it'll be even worse for the people who don't have the option to go to the other ones. I say, why give people, why enable people to leave their wasteland and blame them if they don't when we could just fix the wasteland? So, so this gets into the bigger question about socialism, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Why I'm not a fan of socialism. I'm in favor of a mixed uh, economy. I'll get you one day. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, mixed economy, I think we need regulation, but I think we need people to freely trade. And the issue I take with schools, for instance, is that when they have problems, we just dump more money into it, mm -hmm. as if a general investment fixes it. The problem, though, is we say, okay, what about review boards? What if we have like a review of the expenditures? Nobody wants to be the person to, to, to cut the job or to, to, to gut the schools. And then when people actually do, they complain the schools are being gutted. If the school isn't functioning properly, and I shouldn't say school, just government spending in general, mm -hmm. what we tend to see, like in Chicago, for, for instance, is you get a wound. This is the way I describe it. You get a wound in your, in your society where you have people who are suffering or struggling. We put a Band-Aid on it. We say, we're going we're gonna to provide funding in this area to try and solve the problem. A few years go by and this hasn't going, I don't know, throw more money into it. And they put another Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid. Yep. Eventually, mm -hmm. you just have a festering wound. It's never been solved. With a lot of Band-Aids. What do you, what, what do you because you have a lot of because they keep trying this. I don't right. disagree, by the way. Yeah. Throwing money at schools doesn't work. I think yes. we've seen this time and time and time but again. Not just schools, They're, everything. Right. Well, there are some like, for example, like uh, like the more you give like the EPA money, they can like more reliable um, testing or whatever. But um, generally speaking, yeah, I think like schools in particular, and the reason for that is because schools aren't a product of the money that goes into them. Schools are a product of the minds that are inside of them, yep. from administration to teachers to the students. And the issue is, uh, minds born under broken circumstances are just more fragile just how it is. Money on its own is not the solution. What I'd like to see, the pipe dreaming here, is a proper public works program instituted in certain districts in this country. A lot of the big, the issue that we have here is that um, the reason these kids don't care about school is because they know nothing's going to come from it. A lot of the people in their neighborhoods end up burnt out druggies anyway with absolutely nothing to do with their lives because there's just no opportunity. Public works programs, you have to invest in the community not by paying private contractors to do it, but by paying the inhabitants of that community fair, healthy salaries. You need to have um, works up there. You can have, for example, um, revitalization of the rails and the roads and the public transportation. People become less reliant on cars, I mean they have to pay less car payments. There are so many things that you can do to these neighborhoods. And this is class-based. I don't want this to be like a black or a white thing. There are white communities in this country that are struggling. And I think that if with, with these steps, we can 
we can I don't know man just the idea of an America where it's like here's a quarter of the country we just don't go there you can invest in new kinds of roads made out of bitumen which will last for like decades but they like planned obsolescence they want to build things that will break so that they can spend more money on it again corporations do yeah and that's where the money's coming from politicians want to be under budget and they want to be friends of the corporation so so I mean look there's a a lot of problems I want to say can I say one thing quickly about socialism I don't mean to interrupt I apologize um the, you say it's great. It's fantastic. It's yeah. So uh, let me just talk about that for five. What what I'm in favor of is something called a worker state. Um, this is called by some people a dictatorship of the proletariat, which is a horrible term because it was termed before the term dictatorship meant what it currently means. But it essentially means I just want a state where the workers have power. That doesn't mean bring out the guillotines or anything. It just means that when I think of like um, what is a good country. Like, what does a good democracy or a good republic look like to me? I imagine one where the people inside of it have a lot of control over what goes on in a way that's responsibly channeled. It's not just like crazy, you know, will of the masses stuff. And one of the big issues to me is that, as you just pointed out, corporations have a lot of power in this country and we defer to them quite a bit of government power as well, much in the way that the old monarchies did with with mercantilism, you know? You want to do an East India Trading Company spice run, you know? You get the King's Guard to help you. You get that fleet because the state is invested in the corporation succeeding and the corporation makes a lot of money off that mutual partnership. But if these corporations or these construction companies or even these schools, frankly, are being run by people from the community who have a lot of internal democratic control within it, I think that could go a long way towards fixing this problem we see, where we just put money into these problems and it just burns through, it falls through a hole. I, I, I think one of the problems we have with, with all government spending is that we don't know how, they, how to fail them. Whereas with businesses, they mostly just fail. The big problem I see with, with the way things are going right now, for one, I think a lot of the critiques of capitalism are more about the, the massive corporate structure and the imbalance of power, that once you reach a certain threshold of, of, of capital or wealth, you just own the system. Mm-hmm. You will never be poor. You will never fail again. Your kids will never fail. I mean, that's not necessarily true. There's generational wealth fades. Right, but right. Small businesses fail all the time. But if you're an ultra-wealthy person, you can keep pumping money in until you figure it out. So not, Or lobby to get subsidies or right, tax right, right, breaks, right. and then you just forever. So you know? these, are the, these, are the two, these are the two issues I, I, I see. And it's interesting because this argument is actually a more of a classical, I guess, uh, left and right argument of the days of yesteryear, ten, 10 years ago when it was like government versus corporations. I remember, you know, during uh, like Occupy, you had a lot of people on the left saying the government can help us. We need these programs. And the right was like, we need the free market. We need the corporate solutions. And I'm like, both are problems in different ways. Massive multinational corporations. You're both can, wrong. Right. <laughs> You're both just so awful. Government and massive corporations. We want small government and small business. So I, I, I like a mixed economy. I think we need to figure out how we do government programs in a way that if they fail, they fail. And we need to make sure we don't have massive multinational corporations with no interest in helping the people, but selling them out because they can get better laws to violate human rights in, in, in other countries where they can just hire people for a quarter and then have them do, you know, essentially slave labor and then sell garbage to the American people at, at in a marked up price yeah. and then become But this is the final yes. this is the final stage, right? And I and one one problem I have, a lot of people say this is globalism. I critique this strongly. This would happen exactly the same if we locked off all borders for corporations. Because one of the most unequal periods of American history was the Gilded Age at the beginning of the 20th century. And we were highly protectionist, highly uh, um, isolationist at that point in time. We had high taxes though, like really high taxes. Oh, uh, hey, listen. I'm not besmirching those necessarily, um, but at the time, just we, the problem isn't the internationalism, you know? I believe that corporations and government should be able to work together on an international scale. The issue is they're not doing it for us. They have a completely separate set. Marxists call this class interest between the bourgeois and the proletariat, you know? What does your average prole, an average worker want? They want clean roads. They want decent low crime, you know, good schooling, good job, all that. You know, they want water running to their house. Um, none of these systems benefit the bourgeois. None of these systems benefit the ultra wealthy. They don't go to public schools. They don't drive on roads. They don't drink tap water. They don't need to invest in these programs because they aren't a part of them. How would you define socialism? Um, in, in Or, yeah, we'll start with that. How do you define socialism? Socialism is... Um, uh, an economic system where the workers control the means of production, so you have democratic worker control of the businesses, and you've decommodified um, at least a significant portion of society. So, like, 
you no longer produce a given commodity or service for the purpose of selling it. It's provided at, at you know, free of cost, essentially. How would you define capitalism? Um, I would say that capitalism is a um, la la laissez-faire capitalism, at least, is a is a free market system uh, whereby um, private ownership of capital is afforded to essentially every citizen, and that um, the um, uh, uh, the essential the, the civic structuring of the society is done in such a way as to maximize the economic benefit of the proliferation of the free market. Where on uh, well, actually, so how would you define left and right? I'm trying to I'm trying to just create. Like economically or, or yeah. socially or so, uh, I guess economically. To be honest, I I've thought about this more and more. I don't know if there is an economic left and right. I think most people who care about economics want the same basic thing, which is good life for as many people as possible. And I feel like we just have different ideas on how to achieve that. And maybe that the implementation is the left right element. Um, but I don't think the left is like more government, the right is less government. I think that generally speaking, left leaning people want as much power in the hands of as many people as possible. And right leaning people believe certain individuals are deserving of higher levels of power that they use to adjudicate. This is the, the, the reason I, I bring this up is because, you know, you mentioning far right early on. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think anybody knows what far left or right actually means. Uh, they're definitely really arbitrary terms. I try, I, I should say, it was lazy of me to use that. I try not to use that very often because they are necessarily definitions which require sort of like immediate codification and it changes depending on the context of the conversation. I, th I think defining far left it's actually kind of easy because you tend to have tendency, not, not absolute. You have uh, leftists who are adamant in socialism, communism, and alongside that typically falls some kind of social progressivism. Mm -hmm. Typically, not always. You have the dirtbag left, which are not woke, and you have <laughs> the woke left. So there is a divergence there. But when you come to the right, it doesn't make sense at all. I think like that what what defines the right individualist. In, in, I mean, you're looking at collectivism no, no, and no, individualism. No, because the, the way we just we, we just like white nationalists are collectivists. They're not individualists at all, and they and, and many of them are authoritarian uh, collectivists. So it's like we call them far right, though. What does that really mean? Then we say that these you know uh, ANCAP extremists are far right, but they absolutely in no way align with white nationalists. Maybe it's just time to do away with those ideas. I, right. I, I should, we should eliminate all conservatism. I yes, agree. ban oh, it yeah. from the school. I, I, I actually, I think this could be my partisanship showing. No, the left and the right is what I meant. Yeah. Get rid of that. No, I, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Uh, this could be my partisanship showing, possibly. But I think one of the reasons for this is because the right is a lot more um, idiosyncratic than the left is in a lot of ways. Most left-leaning values were hammered into books 150 years ago. You know, like if you talk to like your average socialist or communist online, you're probably going to find that a lot of them have like an investment in some type of theory or literature that is very specific and very laid out and you can agree or disagree but it was written there you know and a lot of right-leaning ideas I feel are more of again I, I understand this is a product of my partisanship but sort of an emotive response to a given set of material conditions so the national argument goes the other way man I I know and it really depends on perspective like nationalism for example very few people subscribe to the intellectual tradition of nationalism Yet, we have a lot of nationalists in this country. What do you mean by the intellectual tradition? Well, the intellectual tradition of nationalism came along with the codification of the nation state. And the idea was that the individual will should be subservient to that of the nation because the nation was the, with the sort of uh, amalgamation of the people's will. The individual dies, the nation lives. Really weird Orwellian stuff, you know? Trump supporters. Well, that's, that's like authoritarian nationalism. Like the evolution yeah. you, you, of monarchy. You, but you, that, so you, you have oh. the libertarian argument over borders and some people are like no true libertarian supports borders no you can't be libertarian without borders because how do you protect your ideas like every, every I, I i see it from left right up down everybody says you know the left this the right that mm -hmm. I, I i think in terms of trying to actually identify the right and the left you've got right in terms right and left in terms of social values tradition versus pro, pro, uh, pro, uh, progressivism mm -hmm. traditionalism and then you have economics right laissez-faire capitalist versus left socialist the problem is people use them interchangeably and they essentially end up meaning nothing. This is one of the things that I really respected about Bernie Sanders. I think people disagree with, him, with me on this. I think there are a lot of people in this country who are just, let's be real, just don't like black people very much and that it forms a lot of their political opinions. And I don't think there's anything I can do about that with policy or with my channel or anything like that. But there is something the vast, vast, vast majority of the people in this country want and care about. And that is a good life for their children. I think 
virtually everyone. You'll have some anti-natalists now and again, but almost everyone wants that. And Bernie Sanders was good at tapping into that. Bernie Sanders did not align himself with any like nouveau woke tendencies with regards to progressivism. He, well, he would support, but his main messaging was very consistent all the time. Until he got on the debate stage and said, when you're white, you don't know what it's like to be poor. I yeah, agree, wait, 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 I remember that. I remember that, that was bad, that was a slip up. I, I, I know if I talked to him and he was like, he, he, yeah, of course there are but poor he, white people. He gave in, well, he, he gave in. Well, what do you and, mean and gave now in? He, like, now he, he endorsed Hillary Clinton. Now he, he, he I voted for Hillary Clinton. I'm I'm no, farther to the why? <laughs> because because she wasn't Trump because no because on fu- because she's on worse than Trump. I understand Biden at least. No, I well wait. And as, I think Biden's bad. I think I think that Hillary Clinton is an odious person. But when it comes to basic policy issues like climate change or like what economically you're going to do for the country, I think the Democrats just generally we, have a better plan for this country than the but Republicans. We had the best economy. In, in, in generations. It's a continuation Trump. of Obama era policies. What but, policy but did he implement? Said, so uh, we had tariffs. We had but the, strict wait, border controls. So, wait, he what, bailed wait, out Fr- Freddie Mae and wait, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac wait, and wait, wait, pumped one, trillions of dollars into the time, economy. So, so it looked great. One at a time. A terrible economy. One at a time. The, 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 um, the tariffs were maligned by virtually every economist in the country. And he has had to spend an enormous amount of money with subsidies used. Right, right, exactly. So I don't think that had anything to do with the economy. That could be considered a detriment. When it comes to closing down the border, I have seen no evidence that that's improved the economy. All of the, the unemployment rate, the GDP, this was a straight line continuation of Obama. Obama said policies. you wouldn't reach these numbers, and then he did. Uh, sh- I Sure, I don't think that changed anything Factories I said, Factories came back to Michigan. That uh, he, massive multi-billion he dollar investment. massively overstated the extent to which the manufacturing industry came back. He said it was like tens of that. It was like a couple thousand. And even then, having is like that's your goal, like the, a couple the, thousand. Whenever, whenever we get a presidential change, I remember this since I was little. It's like, oh, actually, the the, the success of this president is from the past president because there's it's a, everybody always does this. We look at poli- like, we look I, at policies though. If so, Obama did inherit a mess from George W. Bush. This isn't just like oh, it was because he came after Bush. It was a objective thing that had happened under Bush's presidency and Obama's policies allowed the economy to get back on track in a straight line trend that continued into Trump's years. I haven't seen any evidence that Trump's policies meaningfully affected that trend with the exception of his handling of the coronavirus pandemic which did end up spiking everything back into the into the touchdown zone. And of course, that spike down would have happened under any president. It's a pandemic. And, but recovery yeah. has been in large part hampered by a a non-existent federal response and the tone deafness of again like we have conquered coronavirus the day after the worst record number of cases since it all started i just this type of leadership even if we're to leave aside populism and whatever i think populism flourishes when people are happy and healthy because it gives them time to think and it gives them room to breathe and for that reason i think we need four years of competent Milk toast, neoliberal centrist governance under Biden. He's not competent. But it's, but it's, but he's not moderately. Com- but he's not competent, and he's and he's. How's he? He's, 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 he's fine. He's like a regular he's an angry it's racist. It's gonna be Kamala man. Harris. He's like, oh he's sure, as plastic as she comes. She's oh yeah, but I don't. She locked up people and held them past their their parole. Dates yeah, she's terrible for cheap labor. But they're all they're neither of them are competent. Yeah. That's the problem. Well, I there's well they're certainly look, more look. competent than Trump. Wait, wait, wait. I just want to say again, I'm not defending the moral character of any of these politicians. But if we want to go back to back policy by policy, promise by promise, absolutely. Absolutely, I'll wrap. It's, it's, I an make, abusive, it's an abusive relationship. But it, you but keep going back to man. Go, you're you're going back to Trump. No, we, no, no, no. I'm not going back to Trump. I didn't vote for Trump in 2016. I'm saying right now, I'm sitting back with my feet up watching a bulldog trash around the ivory tower. Okay, it's but making pe- me laugh. people are dying while you laugh. No, you, you brought this up earlier. It was a really great point. We have no metric of success for COVID. I look at what Fauci said in March when Trump was taking action. He said no one could do better. We, Why would I now change my opinion because, on this? Because he said that once and because he's in a political position where he and has he, to say the, things and, and that are positive. On? What on earth? Oh, was, Betsy, I think she's oh, oh, scratching her face. <laughs> uh, we had several governors praise Trump for his response in, I think but, it was May. Look, look, look. A the, quarter the, of the deaths from COVID worldwide in a country nurse, with nurse, four nursing percent. homes oh. where the governors of Democrat-controlled states put sick people, killing. That's not, wait, 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 again, that's not good. I feel like we're engaging in whataboutism right no, now. The, the, fa- the fact of the matter remains that this country has more federal power and more wealth than literally any other country in the history of this that's, planet. That's, that's, that, no, 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 no. These other countries 
don't have the state structure we do where the president is inhibited from taking actions. How is he? He, he absolutely had the ability he, to do a national plan. It was, wait, it was, it's, I'm sorry, I can't engage in this apologism. You say you dislike apologism? both. Apologism? Apologism. You, you say you, wait, you say that you like, don't the like either amendment. candidate, but the 10th amendment doesn't prevent a national response to the COVID crisis. This is Trump one would of, have to invoke serious powers. Yes, and people were encouraging in. him to evoke the war powers because this is a time more people have died during this than they've died this is over the past 50 years. You're making years. a political statement about whether the Republicans who wanted it or who didn't want it, the Democrats who did, were, one side was right or wrong. Yeah, I'm saying, I am, yes. I'm saying is you made the point earlier. We have no we have no bar of success on what this would have looked like no, but because that just doesn't, it is. Wait, it is. Th that doesn't. Yeah, but that's the thing. That's the apologism. Just because no. we don't have a bar where we can objectively determine how well Hillary would have done doesn't so mean we can't do you criticize. Like or do you not? No, it's not. We know that this country has done terribly. We know this administration lies about it. We know we have 4% of the world population and a quarter of the total number of deaths from COVID. And we, we, and hold on. We know, wait, 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 wait I have before to. Before you take that number, you got to take out the nursing home deaths and then tell me and what about the number. Wait, no, wait, wait, Trump, that were 2.6 comorbidities. Wait, no, that's, that's not wait, wait, an Trump, issue. Trump, Trump is the flu deaths now Trump is the president. No, that's, COVID not, deaths. that's not the issue. How is that not an issue? Wait, I, Trump is the president of the whole country, Democrats included. The Democratic governors and everything they do is all part of Trump's overall. Trump can't control the governors. Trump can't control the governors. He can control our national response, which has been non-existent. He's lied frequently about the nature of the coronavirus, the uh, uh, the extent to which it will harm this country. We know he would. For good reason. We, no, not for, for good reason. Do, do you think a panic would have been better? I think being honest would have been preferable. Wait, you earlier on Twitter, you were criticizing Fauci for saying that masks weren't effective when we right. know now that they are, but uh -huh. you'll defend the president of the United States of for America lying him. to the population? For repeating? No, Fauci never said that COVID would be no big deal. Trump was yeah, he informed. Did. He actually did. Trump. He, actually, he actually did. You need to watch the videos because he did. No, the, and, wait. And the video was put out with all of Fauci's statements. And Fauci, I've criticized Fauci over and over again. Early on, I was very And much, not Trump. And because Trump's repeating what Fauci says. Trump does not just and wait. They fight constantly. No, early on, they didn't. Early on, Trump made the mistake of just parroting Fauci. And I got to the point he where- He did not exclusively dude, parrot Fauci early you need on. To watch the, you need, you wait, need, wait, 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 I can watch the clips. Wait, I understand. I understand there was a lot of complexity here when it comes to the information that was disseminated, who did it. But that doesn't change the fact we know Trump was given information and then lied about it. And, that's your, not, and your opinion is- That's not an opinion. Yes. No, 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 no. I'm saying, and your opinion is- he shouldn't have. And mine is, I don't know. Maybe there would have been a right. panic. Maybe in, there wouldn't. Trump like in made, Canada? Trump made a call and you're criticizing him and we don't know what the result You've would have been. You've criticized Fauci for what he said about the masks. How As, can, wait, how, wait, how can you say Trump, well, maybe it would have caused a, uh, caused a panic, but then not say the same thing about Fauci when he said that masks weren't effective sometime wait, in wait, March. Wait, 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 wait. We should have wear, worn masks the entire time. Are you sure? I, we what? don't know. Are they like if made we of cloth know, and dirty? We don't know if a panic would have destroyed everything and killed 10 times the people. How would that, being honest about the extent, first of all, hundreds of thousands are dead and they're dying in large part because we don't have a consistent national policy about social distancing and about mask wearing. That is- And obesity. No, dude, dude. I don't know. Sickness Trump, in Trump, general. Trump can't issue. Uh, look, he can, Trump wait, does not have the constitutional authority to issue a mask mandate. He has. Wait, first of all, he has war powers. He absolutely can. He uses executive actions all the time. This is not something that he would do. This would not be legally challenged. He was being called for to do this, even by the Democrats. He, he was being called to do this. He disbanded the um, pandemic response team. He removed people. And consolidated it. No, no, he no, he withdrew, he withdrew so, their so, power. So who did he consolidate then? What did, did you? Can you pull the? I don't want to pull the fact check on this. Trump consolidated the roles of the pandemic response team. Factcheck.org. I've been through this like a million times. Let's see if I can find he, it. Uh, so, so Trump did disband the pandemic response team. And where did and they go? And allocated those functions into a into a group of people. Wait, was that Pence's task force? No, this was uh, uh, the existing CDC. The existing so, CDC that he defunded by like so a massive there percentage. Was a, so. Factcheck.org, the way they put it was Trump was trying to streamline the process early on and that it's been weaponized by partisans to make it seem like he just straight up got rid of it. So he got rid of it, then rem took its functions and put it into the CDC and he's cut no, the no, CDC's no. We gotta, budget. We got to pull up. No, it's factcheck.org. It's Trump dismanned. I'm familiar with the site factcheck.org. I know. Uh, she's trying to but, I mean, do we want to look at like CDC cuts or what he did with the people in no, Wuhan I'm that he pulled that out? 
if we want to pull up the source and talk about Trump con consolidating the roles of what I'm trying what I'm source. trying to talk about is the totality of evidence that he has mishandled this pandemic and it's interesting to me that you were extremely unwilling to criticize him for that because can, what's the, what's the alternative the alternative what would have happened in any other circumstance where we have no we have no control group what am I supposed to say? So, well, if wait, Trump how many would have backflip, how many how many would have had to have died before you would criticize him? I don't know. Well, give me we a number. A mil wait, so you could have let a million? So what you're telling me is that we have no idea what would have happened if Trump did anything else. We don't and now ever. We're supposed we to don't. Make a determination. That's you're you're making a tautological statement. That's how the universe works. We don't right. ever know what would so happen if other. What things am I supposed to say when Fauci early we, on praised him? When governors early on praised him? Now they're critical of him in an election. Not. Year. Oh wait. Did, wait. Wait. First of all, the the praise of governors is irrelevant. Are governors health experts? Second of all, Fauci praised him a couple of times. He's also uh -huh. under a lot of political pressure to right. do what Trump says, or otherwise there's a very re decent chance of him getting canned. Uh, Fauci has made plenty of statements which Trump has later contradicted. Trump has been back and forth on the mask issue, going so far as to make fun of people I, for wearing I masks. Do not Trump didn't wear a mask expertise. in public for months. Wait, wait, wait. But nor, again, nor, nor the clairvoyance to say if only Trump did X, Y would have happened. Then, wait, but then you can't criticize anything. What if we didn't go into the Afghanistanian war? What if some terrible thing would have happened if we hadn't done that? What if we hadn't no, gone no, no, into no, no, Iraq? No, 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 no. Uh, I think we can objectively say, wow, that war was bad. We shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I can say this is objectively very bad. And we I should can, be doing and something different. I can say different. Trump should have done these things, but I can't get overly angry about making assumptions on what I think would or wouldn't have happened. So you are of the opinion that you should not be able to criticize a no, sitting president no, think, as long as you I don't have... I using semantic arguments. This because, is not semantic at because all. Because I actually said you made a good point and we don't have a measure of success for what Trump should have done. Yeah, that's, that's so, to indicate so we can't know for sure, but we can make reasonable you're using arguments. using hindsight to make it seem like you could have done a better no, job. No, we know he lied at the time. Wait, right. I'm not, wait, wait, wait. I'm not the president. I'm not saying I could have Listen, done a better job. I'm saying that he messed up. And if you actually are anti establishment Wait. Should he have had, wait, 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 wait. If you actually are anti-establishment as you claim to be you are shockingly unwilling to criticize trump on some of the most that's objectively not, that's, that's ridiculous. Wait, wait you listed the tariffs that he did even though it destroyed american farming for essentially no benefit as a positive as a policy he did to the economy and, and then as a it, positive and then we ended up with a good economy as the no we had the good economy trillion in debt right now as we had the good economy you mentioned that as a positive even though all that did was hurt american workers you are willing to How defend him american workers the the subs the subsidies that we needed to provide farmers because they were being destroyed the man manufacturing um, but, that was being hurt from but, our inability to import came back also there's a flood. The, so Trump threatened wait, that's not that's not tariff. tariff to put tariffs on their vehicles manufactured overseas and then they brought their factories we brought back. back a shockingly no, low number of the jobs that don't come about, no, no, the, about, the, about the, panic the point was I don't know what would have happened if Trump caused a panic by coming out and saying you know America there's a dangerous pandemic why coming. not why not not constantly downplaying it like he did. This is going to be over any second. We're rounding the curve now. The heat's going to get rid of it. Constant statement. Why after did statement George saying, W. Bush come out and say, keep I, shopping, keep shopping? I don't like George W. Bush. I'm not saying you do. I'm saying there, there, there are presidents and there is a decision to make and sometimes they're hard. And we don't know what would the, have happened the issue, in a panic this is, or otherwise. This is the fundamental so it's, issue it's that I have. You're coming out and saying Trump should have told everyone. Maybe no, he should have. I'm, I don't know. You, you know what you, if you actually consistently held to this, then you would never be able to criticize anything a president does because you don't know what would have happened if they hadn't argument. done it. You're not, you're not no, what, what I'm saying, saying, wait, hold on. I would like to. What I'm saying is your standard for assessing the validity of this behavior is nonsensical. Is a panic bad? Is it, you don't know that it would have caused a panic. Trump said he also, wanted to avoid a panic. How, his why, why not not lie about it? Why not say, hey, we need, why not say we need to buckle down as a nation and we need to recognize that a that we need to be wearing masks and socially distancing? Yeah, he could have done that. Yeah, absolutely. OK, that's great. So so, so, so wait, so wait, is, why is, so wait, 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 why isn't it OK for Fauci to have been wrong about the mask? Because he didn't want to uh, incite a panic. That, that's that's not incorrect. That's right. That's great. So you're if, in favor he, of Fauci saying that you didn't need to wear no, masks. You, I, I think it's like you're 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 purposefully misunderstanding to no, like I, make I'm, an argument. No, I'm the what argument I'm that I'm making. Is, the argument that I'm making you fundamentally can't criticize Trump over masks and then act like Fauci was a saint the entire time. I have never done and that. Hold, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, it's the it's the it's the rhetorical you're view talking in terms with of other me. people. If you're if people are going to look at Trump and say Trump said all these things and then I can go back and see that Fauci was the one who said them to Trump and Trump repeated them, then my, my issue is maybe we could have done better. Maybe we could have done worse. Trump banned travel early on. He formed the task even, force. He even. brought Fauci on in the first place. And the, the New York Times is estimating if the infection rate reached a certain level, it could even be as high as six million. First, first I of all, I don't know what would have happened so in any other circumstance. Nobody ever knows. That's we don't have vision into alternate futures. We have to make reasonable Pelosi assessments based on the fact that we are Cuomo doing terribly. And Palacio contributed to all of this the same as Trump. This did. is this is exactly what I mean, and this is the issue that I have. They're all you bad. Wait, you claim to have like this. Um, 
a disaffected sort of like anti-establishment view of all of this. But you are, your channel is hyper-partisan against the left. And then when anyone criticizes Trump, you'll either defend him harshly or you'll back up and say, well, they're all bad. You are taking the choice to defend Trump. You are the partisan here. You're not a distanced anti-authoritarian. You are standing with him and you are saying, yes, I am anti-authoritarian. I am anti-establishment. But also, we don't know if him lying to the American people was bad. It could have caused a panic. So we, should, wait, should wait, 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 wait. Should I make a video right now where I just scream about Nancy Pelosi causing all of the problems? I haven't done that. Well, no, I don't know what that we has should to just do talk with about what I just well, so, so if, if Nancy Pelosi went out to Chinatown and said, everyone come party, if Bill de Blasio you, went, went out to- This is whataboutism in the extreme. You can't no, do it. You no, can't accept no. criticisms of Trump. You can't tell me that I'm whatabouting by-, by you, you can know, criticize you those people. Trump. You can criticize You'll those people. Criticize, Wait, what about but, Trump? No, what about Trump? Tim? This is whataboutism. You can criticize those people. I criticize those I people. The, I love the paradox of you whatabouting me on Trump and then claiming I'm whatabouting when I- Let's talk about Trump lying. Wait, I just- but that's Is that good or bad? Well, that's my point. If you my, you can't if, you keep defending him is, then backing up to other people. It might have been do good you, that he do lied. Do you want me to make a video I mean, where I go over how this. all of the Democrats screwed everything up? I haven't made a video They're about Fauci the... and masks. I haven't made a video about Pelosi in Chinatown. I haven't made a then video about De you, Blasio. Wait, and what does this have to do with what I was saying? You can if you want to. You want to say that I say they're all bad? They are all bad. Yeah. Okay. But... And I didn't make a video critiquing Pelosi the same as I didn't about De Blasio. I've mentioned all of it and Trump in a sort of we don't know what would have happened. But I'll tell you what: if you want to say Trump was bad for the things he did, so were they and i haven't dedicated this is entire you, thing you are describing what about ism right now listen it's this simple okay if you so actually you, you, if you wait i would really like it if you would let me if you actually think they're all bad you wouldn't be this uncomfortable with the conversation about how trump messed up who said you're, i was uncomfortable wait, hold on so but what, what you're, i'm comfortable with I, is I would, when i answer you you change the subject and then you semantic i'm arguments. trying to very specifically talk about I've trump's already failure given you my answer on panic and you haven't let it go your answer is that you don't think it's acceptable to criticize Trump because we don't that. have vision into an no. alternate universe? No, that's not no, true at all. Said, I think yeah. uh, Trump is an arrogant blagger. In this specific, in up. this specific respect, and I think you are partisan biased pro Biden, and you don't even know about wait, half the things that have happened that you're criticizing Trump wait, for. Oh wait, I'm talking about Trump's handling of the coronavirus. Right. So are and we? So don't come to me and say you're hyper partisan because you're saying I don't know about Trump when I also said I didn't know about wait, Nancy Pelosi. For, wait, first of all, wait, 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 hold on. We're, again, I don't know why you keep moving on. We're talking about Trump and coronavirus. Yes. I I acknowledge my partisanship, by the you way. I'm totally fine with that. You moved on and made a whataboutism statement about me saying, you criticize Democrats, but what about Trump? This, because I was trying to explain to you my broader issue. So don't you. use whataboutism claims that's not, against me. That's not what whataboutism when, is. When I said, whataboutism is when you say, oh, you want to talk about this? Well, what about this? What I was trying yeah, I to do, do that. was to you immediately lumped in, jumped into how you hadn't made a video on Pelosi or because Cuomo or what have you. Because you claimed I was only defending Trump when I pointed out I also did not make a video about Pelosi But we're talking about Trump. The point is... You brought up Pelosi. You brought de Blasio. You can't accuse me of whataboutism. And then when I say, actually, I haven't criticized either of them, you say, that's whataboutism. Can, can no, we, is it I'm possible? Yeah, I got a question. What do you guys think about Trump lying? about the masks in general. Do you think he did a good he thing? He didn't lie about masks. He lied, he, he lied, lied about, about the severity to yeah, avoid a panic. To avoid a run on masks to, so that- To keep the stock no, market from plummeting. Right, yeah. no, and, that's an and that, that that's, that's possible too. That's an opinion. All he said was to avoid a panic. Dude, he, he fear right. mongers all the time. He talks that's, about how that's, Antifa that's, is going to burn down suburbs. He doesn't but, care about but a did panic. He, right, like, and then when, when Antifa went to the suburbs- No, 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 no. The CIA no. lies. This is its job. The president has to lie. It's his job. That's one of his job things duties well, is to lie when uh, you need to lie. Right, and we can criticize them when they do that. Trump fear mongers constantly. Every rally of his is a treatise on how America is about to be destroyed by far left lunatics. I don't think he has a problem with panic. I think he had a problem with panic being tied to his name. Whether that be a product of the stock market dipping, which ended up happening anyway, that was pretty much inevitable given the consequences of the action, or, um, or whether that just be a matter of his personal image, which is also something presidents have to be concerned about. I think this is worthy of criticism, but it's weird to me. I agree we, with you. By the metrics of this country's performance relative to other countries, we have done shockingly poorly. And Tell at the me the end, metrics on nursing homes. I wait. I think that's bad too. So you if, can't you can't just no, talk no, about Trump. Say, you have to bring up other things. Because if you, how many deaths were caused by the nursing homes, by the way, I out of the two hundred, like forty percent or some really large number of the deaths in America. Uh, can you pull up the numbers? Yeah, I can look. Do you mean, wait, I thought you were just referring to the, uh, the New York. I think it was like 7,000 in New York. Okay, many so thousands, so yeah. if you want to ignore that, we're looking in, in at New what, 218,000? Two, look, even, I, I, again, if like. If we're going to compare the numbers, there is so much nuance in this discussion. And he's I think the president. What, what you are misunderstanding is 
I think Trump has very serious problems. I think he lies often. I think he's a blaggard. Uh, he boasts. He won't shut up. And I think most people know he's got a mouth that, that he, he couldn't stop blabbing to save his own campaign. Mm -hmm. I think he caused a lot of his own problems. And there is an actual really great argument that he should have been honest with the American people. This stemmed from me saying, I don't know. And then you turned it into, why won't you criticize the president? Because I don't know what would have happened. Well, first of all, the statement, I don't know, and the statement, I think there's an excellent argument for your point, are not the same statements even remotely. You even said there was no, there was no uh, standard by which we could... Like, but there's, as, there's no control group as I have for clarified, have there's no control group for anything like this. But we still have right. to be able to criticize. So when I say stuff like he lied uh, and he has downplayed relentlessly, even though he had information which suggested that would not be the case, and he has constantly scapegoated this onto China in a pathetic attempt to avoid any responsibility or culpability for his actions or those of his administration, or the fact that um, the, he has done absolutely nothing to invoke war powers, and one of the few instances where even I, a left-leaning person, a socialist, would say is perfectly acceptable. These are worthy criticisms, I think. It seemed to me like you were being rather defensive about them. What kind of what would he do, do with he war should power? have invoked the Insurrection Act uh, against the riots when they were at their peak? What This is what about him again. We're talking about coronavirus. What would he do so, with so, war power with coronavirus? Wait, like, have 225,000 people died to riots? Can we pull up the numbers on God, that? God, I hope no, not. I'm sure they haven't. I would but like the question to... is, at what point are you okay with authoritarianism? At, at whatever, first of all, I don't think invoking war powers is the same kind of authoritarianism. You said an executive order was. Yeah, an executive order to ban a type of speech no, for partisan reasons. No, to ban trainings, reasons. and then you inflated it he didn't, to be speech. He didn't just ban the trainings. He banned Did critical he? race theory. Do you actually know that? that can you... Do you want to look at the language of the executive order? Because I guarantee I, I, we, you it doesn't both, specifically say these trainings. We both agree the trainings would be bad, but you brought it to a speech argument and then went off on First Amendment rights and everything. Because the, the is, language of the executive order was not specifically targeting you, those training seminars. You it was said earlier that Trump's use of executive orders was him expanding federal authority. That is. But now you're also arguing he should have overridden Constitution, yeah, and as constitution I, and using war powers. Wait, first of all, that's not overriding the Constitution. That's a power delegated to the president in times of great need. Second of all, I would say that's legitimate use of it i'm a pragmatist so it's, it's, i'm it's a utilitarian opinion. what no i don't know wait, I don't, wait I don't all of it is opinion i know i think it's okay I think, wait i think it's okay to use federal power to keep hundreds of thousands from dying due to a pandemic i think it's not okay when you're attacking an entire subset of academic critique and because of some federal training programs i'm okay with x and y i don't think it's okay to use the police to 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 arrest a child for for dropping a a, a lollipop stick in the ground i think it's okay for them to go after a rapists and murderers there are contextual uses for state power that i think can be justified in different ways what? so the the issue is my my opinion was i don't know should should we criticize trump for not telling the american people i don't know I don't know what would happen if a panic started. But, uh, all the other stuff I mentioned, too, it wasn't just that. It was also the constant downplaying. It was also, even after people well, knew how severe it was. that was literally it. That was him trying to avoid a panic. But, but then he said. kept doing he it. He said, I downplayed it because I didn't yeah, want to start he a kept, panic. He kept not wanting to start a panic. Yeah, but like he, every week he'd start it over no, again and be like, and yeah. it's, we're going to get it next week. Oh, yeah. in two weeks I, I, it'll I, be done. I agree with you when he comes out and he puts out these videos where he's like, Antifa is coming. Because clearly, I don't think panic is the real issue. I think it's fair to criticism on that broad point. As for COVID, maybe that was a real threat that, you know, really could have screwed everything up to an I mean, extreme it's degree. killed like a quarter million people. That's, That's a pretty right. real threat. New York Times high estimate was like six point something million too. It wasn't just two million. It was it was the the, the, the the slider bar they had for their analysis was the worst case scenario was like six plus million. But we can, yes. But the best that we can do at this point is see how other countries have done. And we can tell just from the responses they've taken that ours has been woefully inadequate. But you already said no two countries are the same and we can't compare that them. Do, wait, we can't compare them exactly, but of course How we can, can take we info. How can we compare a federal system with 50 states to a single state of 10 million people? Well, maybe we could find a single state with 10 million people and then compare what it did to a single one of our states. Sweden. Well, Sweden did rather poorly, didn't it? Sweden's, no, Sweden's doing fantastic. They just had a massive drop-off in cases, and they're doing great. My friends in Sweden said they've never encountered problems. Testing is easily available, but cases have gone down, and they've never locked down, and everything's improved. Did they lock down their Meanwhile, borders? the UN has said the economic lockdowns will lead to mass starvation, and that now they've said we advise against them. They must be avoided at all costs. It's fair to say everyone screwed this up royally yeah that's and that is to be expected just means, us more than many other countries if I, you we know, look at all per our, capita deaths. our states stayed open so we never had closed borders in the states Europe that's the problem whole. 
to the United States. Well, no, you because can't because they closed their borders. Well, we never also, closed our Europe, state borders. Europe isn't beholden to a single executive power. The EU isn't like, it can't tell every country to adopt. Like it doesn't have war powers over the entire continent of Europe. So we it's can, an opinion on whether or not Trump should or shouldn't have. Right, what I'm saying is, it's not an issue of we know what could or would have happened. It's just an issue of, I believe things would have been better had Trump used these powers. Yeah, but that's the case with literally all public policy. We have to be able to assess these things from inferring data examples that we already have and applying to them to the different situations. We can't say, so your like, issue say is for I'm example- I'm not criticizing him saying, I don't know, whereas you're taking a position, that's well, it. Well, you don't know that, but what about all of the other things I mentioned? Like like, like him repeatedly saying that it was going to be away any time now, him making fun of people for wearing masks, yeah, him not publicly appearing. Okay, I'm glad that we agree on that. My only concern concern here is that the way you talked about it initially, where you said we don't have like a metric for objectively you analyzing. You said that. I did say that. And I said, that's no. a good point. I agree with you. Yes, but that doesn't mean you can't make inferences. I'll give you an example. Say you have two cities, different cities, different demographics, populations. One city applies a policy, works great, people get happier, wealthier, richer. Those two cities aren't exactly the same. If people in city B, the one without the policy, start saying, hey, mayor, you want to maybe do that? And the mayor said, well, our city isn't exactly like their city and then just dead stopped as like an excuse for not engaging. And I don't think that's acceptable. I think we need to look into the policies these other countries used, the uh, nature of their country, the way their balance of urban and rural populations played off each other. Did they do lockdowns? Did they do mask mandates? And if we can do that, honestly, and this is not something the Trump administration is willing to do because he has fausted all responsibility for this onto China, absolutely all of it. And he praises himself every time the opportunity comes for his handling of coronavirus. This administration, I think, frankly, is, is at least with regards to COVID handling, a death cult. And if, oh, come on. Well, no, we can agree people on are dying. But a death cult. Pe well, people are dying, and many of the people who are dying, that, or I guess not dead themselves, because that'd be voter fraud, See, are then going to go out there and affirm uh, the, the practices of a candidate who has lied to them. I just read it was a 97 to 99.4% recovery rate for the virus. Yeah, but that doesn't one, seem deadly at all. Well, I mean, if you hit millions of people with that, that'll be hundreds of thousands dead. Yeah, but, but that the flu does that too. The flu doesn't kill nearly as many or people heart as attacks. COVID. No, people I think with the flu obesity like with a, the flu. Like a third. Yeah. How many people with 2.6 uh, flu, flu's death morbidities? Rate is, is, is like a third of the COVID. The flu is also not as transmittable, and also it's not as... Um, another thing people don't talk about with COVID, this is what scares me personally. Like, coming out here, for example, I flew across. Fantastic. I love flying. I say sarcastically. <laughs> um, uh, 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 COVID-19. I'm young and healthy. Like a horse. I'll be fine. But... Sometimes there are after effects, you know? I've heard a lot of cases, people who've had COVID-19, that's a pre-existing condition, heart and lung problems, sometimes even brain problems. Yep. That really, really Blood scares clots, me. Blisters. Yeah, yeah. Ventilators mess people up too. Well, they're not doing that anymore. Yeah. I, I, but but I the secondary effects they're are serious. crushing their lungs. It's like actually terrifying. And it's because a flu could never, I mean, I guess in very rare cases, a Look, flu could do that. But I think uh, COVID is very If you serious, mix it with other diseases, think, it can really, uh, the flu can mess you up. If we were going to make any determination, I think we can look at, if we were going to go country by country, country, I think we should look at Sweden and say we, we really screwed this one up. Did they close their borders? I don't know. That's and a I good don't, question. I don't, I don't know, know, know if they did it. I'm looking so. at New Zealand. They uh, they, they apparently were full have, lockdown. Yeah. Well, they, they are crazy. Yeah. Well, they did it. They they did it. They no, have, it came back. And then they did another hard... They did another, it, 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 there was a, a light resurgence and they locked down again. I was like, oh, well, I mean, I suppose they're very sensitive well, to fluctuations. It's, but it's as the moment, I think cities. they're doing... Hawaii has a lot. Like, not, like not to disparage New Zealand's. They've got, I think, Auckland and Wellington. There are a lot of Kiwis right now who are pretty mad at what you just said, Tim. Well, it's like 4 million people so yeah, small country. Of course, it gets easier island, the smaller you get. Yeah, island nation. Um, they could easily suspend travel, do a, a short lockdown. COVID can't I swim. I swear, the food the, supply, the, man. The unhealthy United people are going to get sicker faster that, if you well, have an obesity well, that's, epidemic. Right, that's true. So the United States has other health issues which contribute. In New to Zealand, this. you have to fish for all your own food. They actually, ah. the police will shoot you if you buy anything from a grocery White store. White rice and no, fish. You no, know, you know what it is. Though? The cost of living is really high in New Zealand. Oh yeah, yeah, for right, sure. It's, it's by the way, from what I've seen though, beautiful country. I've never been there. I don't even know why I'm repping them, but I'd love to go. So, uh, and, and the and the and Lord the seasons the are inverted. Yeah, Southern they hemisphere. have. Let's go in the winter. <laughs> they have Chris, They have Christmas in like uh, July. Look, look, yeah, look. that's cool. I I, I wanted to ask you by the way, uh, just out of curiosity, and this isn't a criticism thing. I'm not a public health official. What would you do? It, you had war powers, whatever. What 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 direction do you think is best for getting America on track with COVID? Early on, I think in in a bunch of videos I did. I talked about the severity and the need for locking down our borders, but I never thought an economic lockdown, I, I, it, it, the concept didn't even exist to me. And I think at this point, based on everything we've, we've learned, it probably is a really, really bad idea. So the few things I would say is protect the vulnerable, 
um, take strong measures, keep the economy open, suspend travel and border crossings for the time being. And that's, that's probably the best we can do. And then we really want to make sure that we have control in the hands of local officials who know their regions better than anyone else. There were a few cities in New Mexico that, that shut down. It was crazy. When uh, uh, I, I drove out that way, there was a city where the sign actually said no foreign, like no outside visitors allowed. That's up to them. And I think that's, that there's a big difference between the, the way that America handles things, the way Americans will respond to things, and travel suspension, leaving it for, to, to local officials. And I think the one place where Trump did well but then did poorly was early on he was providing quick assistance. He got praised for it. But then, as you mentioned later, he started, you know, playing games with, with federal assistance, which I guess, you know, there's a conversation about the riots, but perhaps the issue is a difference between a view of America as a single nation or as a union of states and a balance of authorities. Yeah. My, my view is I don't think Trump should have used the war powers. And it's also similar to how, how many on the left want to get rid of the Electoral College. I don't because I don't think this country would run better through a top-down executive approach. I think we need to have a balance of powers at, at, at local, regional, and then federal levels. I don't think the uh, Electoral College does much to empower the small states. I think the Senate does. Um, so we should abolish that too. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, oh, well, oh yeah, sure. I mean, you can hear that argument. It's really hard to say with the COVID stuff. I agree that the localization thing is really, really important. Uh, China seemed to have handled COVID pretty well after an initial burning <laughs> period, but the pro well, co China has the ability and the to authority to do, well, they, they can do stuff we can't do. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, I mean, uh, to, to what extent is, is that effective? Like hypothetically, imagine money's not an issue. You know, if you could do a month lockdown where you suspend all rent, mortgage everything like suspend all forms of systemic you know debt payment and provide people a base stipend and then have like um uh, local officials who are tasked to provide like groceries or rations to every house if you could do that without money that would do a really 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 good job but that in america in a country this huge with this many different people with this many different ideologies that would be a well it's 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 authoritarian versus libertarian authoritarianism versus libertarianism and so I've had this argument with many libertarians who don't want to accept it, but there is a strong efficiency in, in serious authoritarian regimes, notably China. When a pandemic hit, they welded people into their homes and sacrificed the individual for the sake of the collective. They glued everyone to their seats in their house. It was a big campaign. They'd run in with the Elmer's bottle, you know? Well, they really they, would weld their doors shut. No, yeah, but, and the, and the thing is, but this would be my counter argument. I like to fashion myself a libertarian socialist. I don't like the government. Um, when it comes to this, there are two types of freedom, positive and negative freedom, you know? And I always get it mixed up, which one is which, but I'm just gonna guess and hope it's right. And you have positive freedoms, like the ability to do whatever you want, freedom from from law, you know, essentially. Yeah. And that's what most libertarians talk about. Uh, uh, are you talking about rights, like negative and positive rights? Yes, I think I, I, am, I get them mixed every a, time. Positive, a positive yeah, right please. is something granted to you, mm -hmm. and a negative right is something that can't be done to you. Um, it's, it's kind of, uh, the easiest way to put it is, a positive right to life means if Ian threatens me with a knife, you must save me. A negative right to life means Sorry, you're man. not allowed to kill me. I don't blame you. Yeah, I think I, I will. I will butcher it if I attempt to recite it verbatim. So I'll simply say this: I think there is a freedom in not living in a country with a pandemic. Uh, because there are implicit threats to my safety that come not from the autonomy or agency of any individual, but simply now from the f process of participating in society. So which freedoms do I value more? Do I value my freedom to not get locked into my house by the government for a month? Or do I value my freedom to live in a country over the next two years in which there's not a pandemic? And I don't have an answer to that. I genuinely it's, don't. It's a, it often a rural versus urban issue mm -hmm. in the United States. So people in cities, it's probably better just lock in your house for you know a short time and then get back on with it. But people who live out in the middle of nowhere are going to be like, "Screw you! I can do whatever." I oh want. yeah, true. There's no way. yeah. You go you go out to Wyoming or something. These people are never ever because we have such a diverse country. That's one of the things I love so much about that's this. That's why a national mask mandate is would not even be enforced because in I would say more than half the states and I would say probably ninety five percent of the country you know outside of the blue counties mm -hmm. they wouldn't even enforce it. Well, the ninety-five percent of the country by landmass, maybe, maybe forty. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I um, they probably wouldn't enforce Not by people, it. By I, I think, I think the best thing they probably could have done was set up a set of uh, a system of incentivizations for all the cities and governors and what have you with like oh, relative get levels paid of to COVID. wear your mask. Now we're talking. Well, or or, or like you a, get a piece of crypto every like, time you're seen in public with a mask. Like on. a state gets an extra so and so much if they can report a certain number, but then you have toxic incentives too. Like, what if they underreport cases because they want to meet a federal quota or something? 
terrible like that. Um, yeah. Hey, it's, Vash, I had a question. You said yeah. you were a libertarian socialist, but you don't like the government. Mm -hmm. You said that in quick succession. Yeah. But I always think socialism is using the government to do things. So what do you? how do you rectify that? Socialism should be about the people controlling the systems they live within. The state, uh, if it's functioning properly, and I don't think it is right now in America, should be an apparatus of the will of the people. And I so far as such mean. a thing exists. Right okay. now we're like... You're like authoritarian maybe, statehood. Maybe a little... Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the, that's the authoritarianism, the non-populist uh, element. You know, when corporations get involved or when long-standing career politicians start solidifying their power in a way that's really, really hard to remove them, then the will of the people matters less and less. I want the government, to whatever extent it does exist, to be beholden entirely to the will of the people, a perfectly democratic society. And then I want corporations to do the same thing, too. I think corporations should treat every single employee like a little citizen. Yeah, I was thinking you should give uh, stock to employees in like a scaling mechanism. Oh, man, I haven't, don't have the math on. Well, yeah, so but, Bernie's proposed, I think, like a 20% mm -hmm. stock package. I couldn't believe he did that, by the way. That was based That'd be so very cool, socialism -y. A very socialism. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't. Exp I was getting hot under my collar just imagining that getting implemented. You know? <laughs> That'd be nice because I've worked for you know startups, and when you have a percent, when you have some part of the company, you have such more incentive to make it great. I disagree. Really? Yeah. I just don't I've, care I've about it if I'm not getting if I don't have you? anything. It's That's like you? Why we're self-employed. I, I, I mean, I've, I've because I've worked on a bunch of companies where you giving up equity to people is really really difficult because you'll find a lot of people immediately go, I got equity later. Oh, no, but you have to put them on like a five-year plan where they earn only a percentage of the equity every year. So they're incentivized mean, to stay to make the equity. It doesn't, it, it like. It's called vesting stock. I think stock. you should just split the uh, the revenue from the company fairways. And that might be cool, have too. Have people vote it's out. It's not so easy how to determine how you do that. Sure. Well, there are a lot of different, this is a worker co-op. It's just a lot of different ways that you can do it. There's actually a lot of really interesting data in worker cooperatives that's come out from Latin America over the past 20 years that indicate that in certain fields, it's an extremely efficient uh, uh, form of corporate structuring because you know one of the big problems that we have with your average company you know maybe not the very high-end tech ones where the big brainy folks work at but even just in the lower end of things retail whatever restaurants people don't work too hard why you get crap wages you know you're not really respected that much because your work is pretty interchangeable it's that creative investment in the work process i think that sparks the ingenuity the investment the the work ethic in a lot of people i, I had a, a conversation with an accountant in New Jersey, I think this was like a year and a half or two years ago, and they were complaining about the $15 an hour wage hike that mm -hmm. was coming or whatever, and how it sh lost him like, he lost like 30% of his clients. They shut down immediately. Because what people don't realize is many, many of these small businesses, and most businesses are small businesses, the people who own them aren't wealthy and making tons of money. Like the guy who owns a hardware shop might make 40K a year and he might pay his employees, you know, 12 or 13 an hour. Mm -hmm. Then they come and they say, we're doing a 30%, you know, hike on all of your salary, on all, all of your costs. And he goes, then I won't make any money for my family. And so he just shuts down. Yeah. Well, the goal, the goal would be um, that if things are, are parted out, you know, equally or fairly, I shouldn't say equally, because sometimes people are deserving, I think, of more compensation, that stuff like that wouldn't happen. A model that I've seen that looks really, really nice is you have a type of like payback uh, investment on the part of anybody who's founded a given company where um, they are they get a proportional wage in addition to like a higher percentage that they pay back until they've made back a certain percentage of whatever they initially invested and then after that they're just kept in a higher tier and that way you have like the because a lot of people say you know what about rewarding ingenuity great ingenuity is phenomenal you know just got to find a way to set it up properly I wish we I wish we um um I don't know, experimented more with different ways of running governments, yeah. companies. That's what America could be. We have all these states. They're all but that's run. that's choice. People could do it. They could, yeah. Though there are systemic barriers to forming worker cooperatives. Banks tend not to loan to them because it's kind of like a spooky form of managing people. But oh. No, I, I, I kind of want to segue off uh, from this because I just thought of something. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're in favor of political violence for, as a means of revolution. If it's done, I, I mean, given that it's done well, effectively, and for good reasons, sure. So... What, what is well and effectively? Sure. I mean, like, for example, if um, if the working class and the Jewish and queer people of Nazi Germany had risen up sometime immediately after Hitler was appointed chancellor, I think most of us would agree that's pro like, I mean, things get messy. Sure. But like right. now in hindsight, like we know. And I think that like right now in the United States of America, the idea of like political violence for a revolution is it's like a, it's like a comedy. It's not going to happen. Are you kidding me? But it's not. Who's to say that the Jewish violent leader wouldn't have been worse than Hitler? Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> because think, that stemmed I from the communists being violent, Russia's then the violent. Nazis were violent in response. And then if the no. Jews had been violent in response, you'd have a, tri a three you, groups of violence. 
I, 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 I agree with you on that point. And, and, and the point I was going to make is that the, the argument about political violence isn't just it's always good, it's always bad. It's that there are certain things we accept and certain things we don't. Dude, I should, the important. American country came from political violence yeah, I just, revolution. Yeah, but I'm that's, totally cool with that. But that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's I don't that's like different. it, but The it regulars happened. were sent here when we asserted our rights. So if the Jewish community in, in, in Nazi Germany were, were like, you can't do this to us, and the Nazis came in and they rose up, I, would, I agree. Yeah. You know, political to, violence it, in, in defense of rights, et cetera. To me, it's just another tool. Take, for example, like, again, with the, with the police, you know? Imagine you've never heard of police, never heard of prisons, foreign concept to you, you know? And somebody says, hey, what if the state had the ability to lock a person up in a steel cell for an indefinite length of time if they make a mistake? And you would say- Make a mistake? Well. I mean, depends on the mistake, right? I would say violate some preordained structure. Sure, right, but e even then the law is just codified morality, right? I mean, you get flexibility with that. D different right. countries consider different things. In Singapore, if you spit gum on the street, you can get oh, to totally. jail for that. There are states where pornography can get you in jail. Like, yeah, yeah. And, oh, and I certainly don't agree with those things, but I'm sure if I argued with them, they would say, well, you have a civic duty to not pollute your streets or whatever. And ugh. But with regards to like violent revolution, it's just a tool. Uh, same as any other type of political violence, like policing, it's absolutely a form of political violence. Laws are codified by people in power to enforce a certain set of principles and police are charged to enforce it. It's legitimized political violence, but it is nonetheless that. And with regards to this violent revolution thing, there have been many tyrannical, despotic governments in human history. And the reason at any point in time why a revolution would be justified is the promise that it would make life better. Often, it doesn't, and that's the issue. If there was ever a point where I felt it would in America, then I would support it. At the moment, I absolutely do not. That's a uh, good point. Uh, I guess the way I see it is I would never trust someone to know what's best for anyone else. Yeah. And so that's, the, like, I guess, the libertarian. I guess the, the, the reason I ask is because socialism requires cooperation to an extreme degree that capitalism doesn't. I'd say it depends. I think well, that, uh, I mean, I, in, to the extent that democracy requires cooperation, then I would agree. But like if, so I think you mentioned before socialism, you viewed it as certain goods become, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, Decommodify like, industry and make sure workers are in charge of the industries, essentially. So those things still have to be produced. Mm -hmm. Someone still has to do, do that work. And that means resources still have to be allocated to those individuals. So it puts a certain group of people in charge of allocating resources to those people. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, and this is the flaw with democracy. If you go very far left, like very, very, very far left, there are some anarchists who will say that even democracy is a metric of oppression because democracy is a system by which you put people on top of you. So you must necessarily, as an anarchist, you must rid yourself of these political structures because all you're doing is choosing who will next stomp on you. Now, I think that's perhaps a little bit hypothetical, but... Bosh, I'm really glad you came on. This has been ah, fantastic. Oh man. We're going to do super chats. Yeah, what of course. I want to say, like, I hope both left and right got their hot takes of both of us. Yes. And, and you have to smear us uh, relentlessly. We have a ridiculous amount of super chats. Oh, man. Uh, it's just, it's 1130. Oh, yeah, no, I'm oh, sorry. Like, I have show some, ever. Let's read some super chats. I have no sense of time. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, uh, I think this is fantastic. Really fun. I think fun. you probably got made a bunch of things people are going to highlight. I, I'd like to think <laughs> that there were a few things I threw at you and... I don't think it's it, my intention was not ever to, to 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 be that. I think it was awesome to have a conversation, and I think uh, it was interesting hearing your perspectives. So I'm, I am really grateful you came on, and uh, I'm gonna I, I'm looking at the comments, and I, there's like somewhere like Tim socks and somewhere like Bosch socks. If I don't tweet after this, it's because Tim had me shot outside oh of the gosh. studio. It will be by me. You, uh, you you were mentioning earlier, like on your way here, the driver is like. Oh yeah, the the the, the Uber driver was because this you know the, the, the middle of nowhere. right the studio is in the middle of nowhere. The Uber driver was telling me, and I'm you know I'm on the other side of the country, so I'm already I'm already <laughs> hyped up, and he's like, you know, the Blair Witch Project was shot here. Oh my and gosh, I, these sure are some winding roads, and I'm like, yeah, it's like just like oh, there's no street lights it's all black there's mountains and it's like welcome by the way i'm sorry this is completely relevant what microphones are these these are sm7b's they sound yeah. really nice yeah. it's just these are just like this everyone uses them the i best. love them i'm using yeah. a, a at at40 i think uh, so i am I am, nice. I am i am excited for anybody who wants to you know make those clips and be like you know it's really funny because it always happens where what, both sides will think that their person won and i'm 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 more than happy to provide that entertainment <laughs> let's uh let's read some super chats because <laughs> i already see it. like uh, you're probably touching yourself. What? Says, get back to the actual argument, Beanie Man. But then uh, Yoro Zuya says, this guy's disingenuous. Don't bring him back, Tim. Oh, snap. Actually, no. I, I absolutely would love Great to have you back. Great conversation. You know. 
Yeah, because I don't think I know everything, and I probably could find you know, election night for, party. You can make it. Well, he's a busy guy. <laughs> yeah. I, I can only fly so much. Seriously? I am, uh, I'm terrified of flying. JV says, ask Vosh if he thinks Mao was better than Trump. Oh. Oh, sorry. I'm, uh, these are is that <laughs> what? Uh, it's it's apples and oranges literally um uh, uh, pro, no no <laughs> wait <laughs> wait hold on is he better or worse no mal was mal was very very bad very mal bad. killed so many people yes. um we don't I, even know he did like i think if i remember he did like three good policies in mm. an ocean like you'd have to dig for those <laughs> yeah. i i dis i dis so i dis trump, a mal. his so, wife so what you're saying is that you prefer trump over mal this amount. So <laughs> listen, if that, you're listen, this. if that, listen, if Mal, like, I'm, you're not getting me clipped. If Mal came back, listen, maybe he's reformed. Okay, you know, well, maybe. What I've heard is that it's his like wife. Trump. No, I'm just I don't believe. Listen, I don't believe in cancel culture. Okay, I think Mal should have to come on this program to, right. to give his he's side of the story. Himself. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now here's the good good comment. Mr. Okay. Comfy Pants says, "Amazing exchange, great discussion. Love your work. Appreciate it." Thanks, man. I agree. Uh, Love you too. And then Dick Johnson, I will literally pay you five dollars to never have this guy <laughs> back on. Listen, man, uh, I think this kind of stuff is important, Weird. and so I like. I, well, I'm willing to invite anybody once I have a conversation. Yeah, Some man. people were like, "Why don't you have the far right?" Dude, we didn't even talk about Magic cards and Dungeons and Dragons, yeah, which we all play. Yeah, yeah, I was we really, about that earlier. I was yeah, really psyched up fun. for that part of the Dude, conversation. Three point five. I actually, I actually said. Uh, Early on, I was like, "How about we just ditch the whole political conversation, talk about D and D?" Because yeah, like, we'll Ian's just got some DM a things. game on the fly. That'd be so fun. It's 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 eleven thirty. Is it crazy? Oh my gosh! Let's you guys. see. Uh, Fireball. I'll, 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 <laughs> now, I don't I don't know if this I'm one is dis- is. Can I dispel that on the? Phone? I don't know if this this comment is fair, so I don't know if I should actually read it. Uh-oh. Uh oh. It's it. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I you know what? Uh, uh, go for it. Why not? They said, "Ask him why he thinks child." Fraun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, should be legal and and is moral. Oh, okay. Oh. This is it's it's a it's a misinterpretation of an argument that I made like a year ago or something, and I I phrased it horribly. My basic argument is that like why is that material uh, uh bad? Because it hurts people to produce it. Yeah. Yeah. There are other commodities that hurt people to produce, like the child slaves that mine up like cobalt sure. and stuff right. and like that. So my argument was like, it's all bad. Um, however, like it sometimes it really bothers me when like people will be like, "Oh, dude, whatever." Like we make computers; they look sick, bro. Like don't think about it. That was essentially the argument that I was making. I, 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 yeah, I really don't like. There, there's so many out of context clips of me. That's why I was like, I don't even know if I should read it. But I kind of felt like you probably would have a response to it. So I bet if we had video of those child slaves, that there'd be a lot less of that. I talk about this stuff all the time. Like that, there's a lot of people who say things like, "I'm more effective. That's why I should be allowed to use this computer." I'm like, look, man, I fully acknowledge this was probably made by, you know, like the, the Foxconn laboratories are really, really yeah. bad. At least, but at least like own it, you know, right, like exactly, it'd be exactly. like, OK, this is bad, but we can do something about it. There are more slaves today on Earth than there ever have been in all of human so history. Crazy. Yeah. It's not good. All right. Let's see. Damien says brushed up, question mark. Russiagate made people like you hate more. You wouldn't be here at this point right now without the lies getting in your head. Wake up. I don't know who he's talking to. I assume that's directed. <laughs> I would assume yeah, that would yeah. be to you, yeah. Because you said you mentioned getting brushed up on Russia Gate. I, I guess I, sh- I should again. It's just been yeah, a while. Re- it's we'll a dark time. Yeah. I don't like the gate part of it. It's dumb. And now everything is gate. Because of what? Yeah, yeah they. All right, here we go. Wait. Sean Wait. Kennelly says, "Tim, I'm your biggest fan, but you completely let this guy run your show tonight. He diverted your questions. He had no clue about Russia Gate or Obama Gate, but you still used kid gloves. Thought you were better than that. Like I said early on, I look as much as we did have a bit of a back and forth and some debate." This show isn't a blood sports debate where I come here with a big stack of notes to be like, I'm taking you out. It's a conversation show. It's and IRL, I want to have people to have a conversation. That's about it. Chill. Don't, like, I'm, I'm sorry if you come here, and I mean this sincerely, like thinking that I've prepared a big list and like I'm preparing a, a takedown. I did no preparation. Be disappointed. I was like, I'd really love to have this guy in and just have a conversation. I kept trying to look up the what happened with the Philadelphia riot because I've been in a news oh, dead yeah, zone yeah. for 25. I kept trying to look up and I kept getting distracted by D&D talk. So, oh, I, got, nice. so I came in equally. It's so uh, much better. Yeah. So so look, look, look. I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts on this. And with respect, Sean, to your opinion, thank you for your super chat. I do. Like I, I let Enrique Tario come in here and, and speak a whole yeah, lot. Man. And I pushed back less than I pushed back on Vosh. Like, seriously, like, I actually raised my voice, and we, we went had a back and forth. I didn't do that with Enrique. That's great, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm trying, man. I really am. But this is not a show where I'm here to just take people down. You know, I want to bring people on, have them say their thing. I'll give them my thoughts. Sometimes it'll be more adversarial. And I think it's fair to say I was harder on you than I was on the leader of the Proud Boys. Oh, I'll, by well, the way, I'm chair. going to get the exact same comments on my Twitter feed after. I'm sure, yeah, this will be fun. Yeah, it's, it's oh, the mutual. You let I oh, yeah, 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 the mutual. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm so seeing it already. 
I wish people would just like the, most of the comments. They're actually pretty they're great. Cool. Yeah, they're like Very this is cool. really great, great conversation. Hey, I like I you guys it. too. Is this the camera? Yeah, yeah I like you guys like, too. Hi, there yeah, you yeah. Go. hello. Um, I, I the way I tell people like, dude, feel free to hate me. Like, you know, I mean, I I, I wish there was less hate, but you I don't think I'm it. perfect, and I think people can criticize you and can criticize you and whatever, man. Look, I'll tell you what. It, you know what the craziest thing to me is? I don't know. I just I'm just some dude turned a camera on, started talking about stuff on the internet. I'm not I like I got no degrees. You know, I'm not an, I'm I'm just someone who reads stuff and has opinions, and I want to talk to people who have opinions. And sometimes I probably sound like a moron. That's just the way it is. And I we have conversations. Live to cringe. I, I, That's yeah, right. Yeah, I, man. People like, I I I'm sorry if I don't live up to the expectations of some kind of like you know Walter Cronkite or something. I don't think I ever will. But uh, a lot of criticism coming your way. I'm sorry I'm not as tall as Hassan Piker. Oh, what yeah, the heck? Yeah. Come on, man. It's, I'd love to have him on as well. Personal failing. Uh, Bo Darville says this dude is in a huge bubble. How could he not know the details of Obamagate? Or is he lying? You're not alone. I no, think, I think it's fair. I, I don't assume everybody. That's why I asked instead of just saying, well, you're wrong about Russiagate. No, I, was, I asked you. I have a quick two cents about uh, Obamagate. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it is very complicated. I think this is why Trump doesn't want to talk about it. And I think this is the part of the issue that people have with it is that it's just complicated. It's OK. And I think that you should read up on it for sure. I definitely Once should. They use as that well. gate word again. They're confusing everybody by like, this annoying. gate and that gate and Gamergate. Yeah. And what? it's all between hotels detail. called Watergate. Like, let it go. Use a different word to describe these different situations. A lot of it really does come to the media that you consume, because um, even with all the complexities, you get different types of complexities depending on what you consume, uh, because what I've read in Obamagate has largely been a denunciation of certain perhaps hyperbolized claims though as is the case for many um, situations like this there usually are bits of legitimately worrying information underneath anything and uh, and I think that's totally valid and I'm happy to look more into that you know what I do I, I use a third party app called NewsGuard everybody mark off your bingo cards for me mentioning mm -hmm. it and what I try to do is I typically start with mainstream media and then I check right wing media because mainstream typically has a left bias or at least a left perspective so I try to read both. And then this is really funny because I was criticized for this, for using the Daily Mail very often. Daily Mail is, is certified as, as, as credible. And that's I, interesting. I, I really mean this. They usually have the most comprehensive take on a story. If, you, if I go to the Hill, where I, like I go to the Hill often because they're considered center and they talk politics, I'll read a story about Amy Coney Barrett that'll have like one paragraph. And then I'll search for it and find several other articles. Fox News will have two. Daily Mail will have like 15. And it'll be like breaking down the nuances and getting into depth on it. You know what actually does really good reporting? BuzzFeed News. I was actually surprised when they split off from regular BuzzFeed. I found they actually have really, really, really good uh, in-depth coverage of stuff. They've done a really good job on a lot of things. I'm Sometimes. critical of them on a lot of, a lot of other things. Notably, they, they ran a racist piece claiming that two black men fought to the death over a chicken sandwich, which I'm Ooh. not kidding. Wait, Honestly, what? Oh, I didn't hear yeah. about that. It was oh, fake man. news, and it, it really made me angry because I'm like... I know what they do. I know what they're doing, and it's disgusting. I give. I give. Uh, Wait, had the, did two? Did they actually fight to the death, or did they completely make it up, or did, dude, was it just sensationalized? A dude was at Popeyes and cut in line, and so like he walked outside, and some guy was yelling at him for cutting in line and got shot. Okay, so it was liter so literally so literally just racist. Yeah, it was. It was, it was totally yep. racist. Thing. Okay, wow. Yep. <laughs> cut those clicks, so, man. Anyway, made me mad. Buzzfeed does have some some good stories they've done. I, I actually read one recently. But often they have poor framing. I think. Okay, fair. To be to be fair, a lot of right wing right wing media has poor framing as well. For that for that, uh, it's the same issue. It's like if you're BuzzFeed is a left partisan source. Yeah, I'm rolling. But, but, I'm rolling through Breitbart articles pretty much every day uh, these days. Breitbart is uh, uh, has some good report. It's same as it's uh, like people are gonna get mad, but it's I think it's comparable to BuzzFeed. That's gonna trigger the left uh, and the right. <laughs> Dude. But, uh, Breitbart's released some some breaking stuff. Some, All right, we're we're in the, we're in the super chat section, so I'll I'll, I'll uh, let my facial expression carry the weight. <laughs> Rob, right and left, told you. Rob in one two three says Vosh said right populism can only be fascism. What is his view of left populism? Well, I think left populism can go in a lot of directions. I think that right. I think that societies become potentially more complex the further you go to the left in large part because there are so many different ideas on how to achieve the basic underlying goal, where I feel like the farther right you go, it's pretty much just absolute power of the state or absolute power of corporations. Um, I guess it's conceivable to be a right-leaning populist and not be a fascist. I, I admit I'm struggling to find them at times. Well, it, it's it's simple. It's a, it's a bunch of people in a small town who use capitalist systems, have traditional values, and want to be left alone. Sure, well, uh, but left traditional values 
left alone, like this can mean a lot of things. Isolationism, ethno-nationalism. No, if, like uh, this, this is, you know, I'm growing my, my, this is my farm. Please don't steal my stuff. Well, I and then they hope all, we could do that anywhere. And, and uh, but that's, that, that would be arguably right wing. You've got people waving American flags and Gadsden flags and saying, we love this country. And that's about it. Sure. Well, the pop the populism usually is about like the, the the manifestation of the popular will. You know, the idea that the establishment is something. But usually, the way the establishment gets codified in right leaning narratives means that like in addition to the establishment, you've other threats from without. In some states, it's been the Jews. Here, we have like for example, MS thirteen, the cartel. We have ISIS. We have um, uh, undocumented immigrants. Uh, and we have within our own country, we have Antifa, we have, you know, this sort of thing. And I guess it, fear, I think, is the underlying uh, emotional pinning to these um, so, to these tendencies. So would a far left populist be a warlord? I, well, I think I think a far Mao? left. Uh, well, uh, I think because um, <laughs> the, the issue is when you think of a populist, like you have somebody like Lenin, right? Lenin, you know, he stirs up the peasantry for a long time. He gets his armies. He marches alongside the partisans and the Democrats and such. And eventually he sees his power. And what does it become? An authoritarian state. Is that populism? I don't think so. In fact, I would argue there are elements of Lenin's government uh, that were distinctly right-leaning in spite of all the aesthetics and sort of performative socialism. So left and just, right, just, it's so confusing. Yeah, exactly. No, but that's exactly what I mean. The term left tribal. and right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think at, at the end of the day, I want people to be happy. I want people to be healthy. I think everyone in this country should be able to get good health care, good food. And I think that most of us lived under the thumb, two thumbs of corporations and of government in ways that are vastly disproportionate and unjust. Oh, how, I what think do you think the about reason, the Federal Reserve? We barely no, even we got, got into it. <laughs> I, I think, That's a whole I think, subject. I think the issue with socialism is that the only way to create a system as of right now where everyone adheres to the commodif commodification of certain things is hmm. by force. Well, let's take steps then. Um, maybe but still force. Oh, I mean, well, then any policy is force. I mean, it is because any law passed by a government is the mandated libertarian by argument it. would be yes. Yeah, of course. The government telling you you must at gunpoint. But I think, but again, that's one. What's the quote? You know, the poor man and the free man are both equally disallowed from sleeping beneath the bridge. Freedom, in a legal sense, means very little if you're starving. So, if the government, say, for example, uses its authority to provide everybody a base stipend of food and education, you may technically be removing freedoms in a certain way because now people have to do this or whatever. But on the other hand, you've given an entire population of people a different, more essential kind of freedom. It just feels too utopian. Well, but like you agree the, with public education, don't you? Um, hmm, no, not actually, no. Really? Well, the founding fathers uh, did. They thought that public ed education was about emancipating the mind of the average person, that democracy I, could only function if we were sufficiently educated. I should clarify that uh, in its current form. Oh, well, yeah, right. sure. I mean, it hasn't changed in 150 years, My, right? But when you ask me, I'm imagining as it exists today, and I'm like very much against this. It's broken, completely broken, and needs to be redone. Yeah. Then, then in a different phrase, that education should be a human I'm, right. I'm 100% I'm yeah. I'm for uh, social programs and government programs. <laughs> the issue, I think, is that we need to fix them. I feel like you know, we're operating off of civics developed hundreds of years ago that haven't scaled properly especially education yeah yeah, yeah exactly. nothing's changed since like schoolhouse so days so i'm like i said i'm for a, i'm for a mixed economy i think we should have regulations we should have taxation we should have some government programs but the problem is our government programs don't fail so when public schooling breaks we just keep dumping money into it and it's just a broken thing we keep I, sure. I but we also can't let it fail because you can't wake up one day and say like oh sorry timmy your school went bankrupt <laughs> you'll be working around the house for a year well, why these not? well the systems we have can, have to be kept up or if they if they're going to be broken then uh, accommodations have to be made by those hurt yes. and that i think so for example like our failing schools right uh, I, th I don't think if anyone defends the education system as it currently exists in this country they're delusional this education system is terrible it's broken we're worse than other countries with half our gdp it's, it's or not gdp gdp per capita it's terrible um but at the same time, if we just let every failing school just shut its doors, we would have a a, a spike in economic and everything would be bad. Parents use school as daycare, yeah, so they can go go to work. That's a good point. Now, I, I read the super chat where they said, "How does he not even know about RussiaGate?" So I'll read this one where Redway Two says, "Vosh is so obviously winning; it's not even funny." <laughs> I enjoy it. I think it's fun. I I. I, I wouldn't be surprised if everyone walked away thinking that I was a moron. It's it's fine. I don't think I'm, a, the, you know. Hey. Have Tome says, this is like watching that Joe Rogan interview with Barry Weiss. Vosh is extremely uninformed and lives in a bubble. 
You see, it goes both ways. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, it, what it reminds me of is I remember I had a hosted or like a moderated debate with um, anti-climate change guy fairly recently, like full on anti, like it's all a hoax, you know, flat earth, whatever. And um, afterwards, you know, the super chats roll and the moderator reads them and it's like, you know, the 50-50. It's like, Vosh, you did really good there. And then the next one's like, Vosh clearly lives in the, the globe head <laughs> bubble if he actually believes that temperatures are rising. And it's it's fun, you know, not, not to say this is equivalent in that respect, but I like the back and forth. <laughs> Ken W. says, Scandinavian socialist countries have school choice. Japan has school choice, and compulsory education is uh, only up to junior high. They rank higher than U.S. education. Why should we continue failed U.S. public education policies? Sure. Uh, in Japan, uh, j first of all, uh, even though uh, high school is not compulsory, you'll find that if you want to get ahead in Japan, you absolutely need to get in a to a good high school. That may That is a culturally obligatory uh, thing. Additionally, middle school goes up to ninth grade in Japan. Also, with schools like Sweden, school choice to me is acceptable in concept as long as it's not being used as a way to demonize people who are caught between a rock and a hard place when it comes to where they're taking their kids. In a school choice would be something I would 100% support as long as I felt like it was going along with a genuine effort to revitalize all of these communities. That I would be in favor of. On its own, though, I don't think so. Hmm. I, I think we got to do something, man. Yeah, we got to revive. We got a public works program. Yeah, one hundred percent. We got to start. We got to start building them roads. We you have know, the, we sh yeah, we, we do. have the money. Are, do you know much about graphene? Uh, uh, you mentioned it earlier. Incredible roads. modern material. I, pure I think, carbon. Yeah, I think we, should go we need to. Uh, I think we should start implementing programs where we're like, we have, we're going to do a public education thing. Maybe it's school choice. Maybe it's something else. And then we got to wean ourselves off these addictions. I think. I think you're right about public schools, uh, in that. If we just shut them down overnight or they went away, it would hurt a lot of people. Parents rely on this. This is why Trump's been so adamant, like, we got to get the schools open because people want to go to work and their kids, they need, you know, their kids need to go somewhere, be occupied. I hate that. I think it's a huge problem. And I think we've given away our responsibilities as parents. So I think we need to change this, but it's like a drug. We just end it. It causes massive destabilization. The same thing is true with, with, with our healthcare system. So my thing is, I've said over and over again, I would love universal health care. The difference between us and many European countries is that universal health care in Europe was born out of World War II, a, a necessity, a mandate, and it had to exist. In the U.S., we've tied our economy up to it to an extreme degree where I think it's wonderful to want a system where we can guarantee, what, what, what did we call it, um, um, non-acute uh, treatments? Are yeah. Universal, is that what you were saying? Well, yeah, acute treatment you would fund. I like the idea of doing that, but like um, chronic no. treatment I wouldn't want to fund. Right, like, right, 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 right. Like right. if you eat bad, poorly and then you get like chronic disease, so just, I, I find that that's usually dietary and I don't want to fund other people's chronic diseases. But the, the, acute problems, like they fell down the brick, their leg, there's an emergency, I, I like funding that stuff. Exactly. People shouldn't uh, – um, you, you have – it's hard to quantify where we draw that line on what would quantify, qualify as a chronic thing caused by you or whatever. But I think ultimately my point is flipping that over to get off the addiction of this like – I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story, man. I, I got a kidney stone in 24, 2014, and the bill was like $20,000 for, for going to the hospital and being given water and painkillers, twenty grand. And then I told them – it's the worst timing ever. I just changed jobs right after, right after I left Vice, and there was a week period where I was unemployed. And they were like, oh, oh, no problem. It's $4,000. I'm like, that's still a ridiculously large amount of money, but why did you just cut off so much of the price? And they were like, we thought you had insurance. I'm like, mm -hmm. that makes literally no sense. They make, no, they make it up. That's how they, the, the hospitals, they're, they're in bed with, or some say coerced by the insurance agencies, you know? They, they literally just they make up these numbers yep. and then they say, hey, insurance company, you, know, you don't have to pay this much. This guy has to pay this much. You get to pay a tenth of that. Yep. And it's, it's crazy. And well, then they drop the price for me when they realize I didn't right. have insurance. And, and some, but because it's inflated, because sometimes, you know, it's like with other debts, like uh, if, you're, if your I student do. debt gets collected, you know, um, you can actually argue it down from debt collectors. You know, if it's $30,000, you can sometimes say, like, oh my God, my car just crashed and my arm fell off and I'm dying, please God. And they'll knock it down a little bit, but they're operating in the margins, whatever they bought for it. With the hospital though, they inflate this so high that the, the, the actual relationship between the cost of care and what you have to pay is, it's, it's like fantasy. I think we could start with covering basic acute treatment, broken bones, really simple place, and like uh, flu and, and immediate sicknesses so we can make sure kids aren't dying of, you know, because their parents couldn't afford Tamiflu, like that one story. Getting to the point where we can cover chronic treatments and severe treatments could be really, really difficult. But my, my main point is I would love to live in a world where it's like you could walk in and there's no bill 
The problem is we have two very different circumstances for how some countries emerged in their national health systems versus how we developed ours. So I think it's like, what, 20% of our economy is tied to healthcare. And I think Bernie Sanders said, was it two to four million jobs, I think, mm -hmm. would be lost if we abolished. I like the idea of acute treatment plus private health care for supplemental. Uh, ultimately, getting to a point where we have a functioning system would be very, very difficult, but I'm for it. I don't want to rant well, too much I'm, on that stuff. I'm already though. angry that you can buy Pepsi with food stamps. <laughs> And then go into the doctor because you have the flu because of yep. the Pepsi. And then I, well, I'm not going to pay for it. Well, I, I, yeah. well, I do want to say, though, if we do want to drop the cost of health care in this country, we also need to start um, uh, regulating food companies way, way harder. We don't. One of the reasons why we have this obesity epidemic, it's not because people got less responsible or whatever. Our moral character didn't decline. The chemicals they put in food are designed to make them addictive. And they use whatever chemicals make them addictive. Yep. And those chemicals tend to be really, really bad for you. And I think that, listen... You, you're an American. You have a God-given right to eat as many twin Correct. pieces as you want on any given day. But I think we also have to recognize, just as a matter of, of public policy, that uh, it maybe be good to make it easier for the average person to get a hold of quick, cheap, easy food items that weren't made you know, out of the kerosene and toothpicks. Yeah, don't pollute the so environment with your body. We, we have a lot of uh, anti-Vosh comments, but... Uh, <laughs> Zephan says, I disagree with Vosh a lot, but I'm glad you've had him on and yeah, would man. like to see it again or someone similar. Also, is that a new watch? Uh, it is. It is. Oh, Fancy. Because I've, I've been doing, uh, oh. I'm, I'm trying to track fitness. We that's started wearing watches yeah, again. Yeah. Measure your biometrics or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, nice. Apparently, I have a really great heart rate. I'm very fit. Oh, awesome, dude. <laughs> He's fit. Who knew? Wait, what's your, what are your numbers? So my resting heart rate this morning was like 46. Wow. That actually is really good. I skate almost every day, and now I'm mountain biking, and... Uh, yeah, so I've been trying I, to go on a jog every uh, every morning since since lockdown. You know, like, not walk, lockdown. Man. You know, uh, coronavirus. Shut down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, shut down. Yeah. Here you go. Taiga says this guy makes me want to be a proud uh, be a proud boy. Trump twenty four. <laughs> there you go. Doing <laughs> doing my work. <laughs> Tommy Groshong says great conversation for showing how this election comes down to low information versus high information voters. <laughs> I think that could go uh, honestly, depending on which which. Go either way, man. Look, I I, I do believe that's the case. But I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, I'm not going to pretend like I know everything. I think th it's fair to say there's probably a bunch of clips of me looking like a moron. I, uh, you know, none of me whatsoever. Right no, no, that's like, yeah. It, yeah. like even the right is going to be like making memes saying you were so smart. They're painting you. <laughs> yeah, Actually, be there, great. Was one, there was one comment where someone said they agree with you on schools and they were shocked. Because, that's cool. I like you know, it. Yeah. Like socialism. Yeah. You, what you realize when you have a conversation, you, we, we're just not that different, man. No, well, I like it. Yeah, I think humans like, I, are so I, similar. I, I, I think a lot of our difference in opinions is rooted in what we've read. Well, that's I, like that's like the gist. That's why I said it earlier on. You know, fun, fundamentally, I am and always have been of the belief that given the right conditions and realistically speaking, the right media exposure, because we do live in two different worlds these days, um, because of what's recommended to two, us and stuff. Yeah. At least two, at minimum two. I think functionally, most people would want the same basic things, and I think we can find those. I think, and we can work towards them. And it's just a matter of agreeing or disagreeing on the pragmatic implementation. Yeah, the I'm founding just, fathers think, would go at it. A lot of these comments are like, Tim is really dumb. You nailed it, Tim. Vosh is so dumb. Vosh is winning. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Oh. that's that, that, I'm Riding bringing it up again for like the eighth time because I'm scrolling this through the trying to find the... comments. Yeah. To like There's a lot of a threat trend, yeah. Uh, Paul Levy says, you can't get mad at Trump for executive authority when you say he should have used more to force a national plan. Choose a side. I think there are good and bad reasons to use national authority. I Like, um, like uh, um, I'm trying to think of the right example. Um imperialism for example hate it i mean lefty right what does american imperialism do kill democratically elected latin american socialists not my thing however sometimes interventionism can be decent we had soldiers in syria for example that were helping out the rojavan army and I'm a fan. Whatever the case may be, yeah. together they were doing a phenomenal job against ISIS. And Rojava was a burgeoning anarchist project that was one of the, and still is to this day, one of the most legitimate examples of like a, a democratic anarchist society. By pulling out, we ended up endangering them. And we still have because of Turkey. And in that instance, I am in favor of military intervention. It's just a matter of how it's applied. You know the problem with uh, like these, these democratic anarchic states is? Well, they usually get uh, destroyed by larger, uh, exactly. more military. Right. Well, I, I'm of the opinion. An anarchist society can only truly exist, perpetually exist, 
in a global sense because the the existence of outside authoritarian influence is a very strong destabilizing one but what if the aliens come then we then we are well and truly gone my friend oh, okay so, so, so authoritarian. Yeah. listen anarchist world with highly authoritarian geosynchronous defense cannons i'm into it dude like an yeah. ai orbiting yeah, around it bows to it. us there's a there's a, this is an account and it's got the the antifa what is it called the strike through is that mm-hmm. the three arrows? The strike through? Oh, oh the, uh, yeah, yeah, three arrows, yeah. yeah. The, Very nice and they comment. said, dim tool, dim tool, your source on factcheck.org contradicts what you said in all caps. Oh. I accept it. I don't know. Well, like what? I said, uh, I read, I was reading a factcheck.org article and we didn't pull it up, so if yeah, I'm wrong, I wasn't I'm wrong. able to find it. Is. My bad. I haven't seen any screens. I'm not the... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I'm uh, vibing it, right now. Yeah, a lot so. of it just, it's okay. Vibing okay. with Biden. Oh, <laughs> no. You sure are. Uh, they're mad you're not wearing a mask. <gasps> he was earlier. He was. Yeah, I, he was I, I he's came. wearing a mask. None of us are wearing masks. He's he, sanitized. He he came in. We have hand sanitizer. He's wearing a mask. There we go. Right? There we go. Yeah, we there got we it. go. Okay. All right. We Someone got says, this. You don't need to wear masks. Audio feed. Feed. I tried. I did everything in yeah, my power. Low, then it was high, I was then it was literally under the desk trying to get it. There was a cat sitting on a cable. <laughs> I couldn't to? find it. Vosh is hot right now. Oh shit. Oh snap. I love it. Yes, thank you. Let's see. Albaloni facsimile says Trump blows Trump, then calls himself a centrist based. Huh. What is that? Okay. Let's see. Uh, Ender says no federal aid by Trump. Didn't Trump send a Navy medical ship to NYC, Mm -hmm. which went unused? Mm -hmm. If your argument is Trump didn't provide aid, but but he stated war powers to get businesses to convert to create masks and ventilators, yet Trump didn't use war. Uh, I got to find the war powers. War powers to get governors not to mess up, but the governors didn't mess up leading to those deaths. Blasio didn't use the medical ship, didn't use Samaritan's purse. Then we had like three months of riots where governors didn't prevent people from gathering, though. Well, mm. the the riots seemed to have not increased COVID-19 spread. There was a ton of data done on this. And it wasn't because people didn't get COVID at the riots. It was actually because the existing... By the way, by riots, we mean... Pro- I'm sorry, I shouldn't adopt this narrative. The vast majority of these gatherings are, are protests without violence. These protests... Um, they uh, well, there was transmission amongst the people there. Uh, people stay inside during protests. Because I think. Well, to be fair, we we, def- we definitely need to draw a distinction between riots and protests in this regard. Well, some because protests the, the are protests, riots. Well, no, the the protests that we're referring to are large gatherings of people marching down the street. The protests would be way more at risk for COVID nineteen because exactly. exactly. because ri- people people don't march right next to each other during riots. The riots you know, people running around randomly. Yeah. Hmm. So right. that's an important distinction so, when we're talking about COVID. So with 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 regard to the protests, it doesn't seem like it's increased COVID nineteen spread because people stay inside when there are protests because they don't want to get caught out in any of the mess. And maybe you can say that's a toxic disincentivization. But whatever the case may be, the, of course there are governors who bungle this. Um, absolutely. Um, and one of the unfortunate downsides of the way our system works is that we have to accept the fact that decentralization will lead to decentralized failures. That being said, I do think there were stronger federal steps that could have been taken, generally speaking. But we already went along with that. Austin Eris says, Vosh discounts the public response to measures that are viewed too as too authoritarian. A, a too authoritarian. Lots of people have gone crazy with things are now. Given the anti-authoritarian culture tracing to the founding people uh, would be wildly, cra- wildly crazy. I, I will say, you know about the riots in Europe right now over COVID lockdowns, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not entirely sure what that donation was referring to. Um, yeah. Well, I think what they're saying, the first part at least, you're discounting the public response to the COVID lockdown measures when people view them as authoritarian. So in, in Spain, Italy, and Prague, hmm. there's rioting over the lockdown. It's been going on for several days. And in London, there's been clashes with police. I won't call it rioting, but it's, it's overt rioting in, in, in like Italy, for instance. Yeah, I'm, like not, and- I'm, I'm honestly mixed on the effectiveness of lockdowns, just generally speaking. I think that um, I think that maybe if they had been done very early, it would have been possible for us to contact Trace. Um, and, uh, like very, very early, you know, but that would have required a response so immediate that it's almost impractical for a government of this size. At this point, I really do think it's just about really, really, really promoting the mask wearing, the social distancing. And then additionally, I think we need to divert funds towards providing businesses and schools materials that they need to um, uh, to operate more safely, yeah. whether that be plexiglass gra- bla- screens or like cleaning materials. Vitamin D, I hear, is really good for you. Uh, yeah, but I mean, everyone can use some vitamin D. I, I got, I got. I don't know. Mark Grames oh says can confirm. Tim definitely plays Orzov stacks. Lids plays what? Boros. I think Ian would play obscure Simic combo deck. Vosh plays mono green Stompy. Dude, Simic. I like green. That's no, 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 green no, 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 no. blue, right? Uh, I'm into Simic, it. green yeah. and blue. Yeah, it's good. Uh, uh, green Stompy. Orzov. You animal. Yeah, green. He's really? red green. I like Come the, on, Orzov. Man. Is that what they says? Black. 
It's, it's black and white. What? Tim doesn't play Tim's black and white. Tim's got some blue in him and no, also some red. red. Yeah. yeah. Tim's kind of fiery. He's not playing. Yeah. All of my decks are He's <laughs> white, white, blue, red. Yeah. All, all of my decks He's are blue. You don't want to give white, Tim red. black. That's dangerous. I was, yeah, blue. No, I I was I green. Hate, I, hate I hate black, too. I don't think any of us like black. <laughs> oh, snap. That's I'm talking it. about Magic no, the Gathering. I'm not racist. Whoa, 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 whoa. Nobody here was talking about Magic the Gathering. Oh, snap. Oh, no, Ian. Oh, no. Get out of here. I completely disavow. Oh, no. Oh, I don't know where I am. Check, please. I don't know what you're talking right. about. Stephanie B says, now 27, back in uni, had, had to take eth ethnic class, learned colorism, was told because I'm pale, I'm less Mexican than someone darker. Uh, Even if they didn't speak Spanish, lived in Mexico, I did. It's racist, toxic BS. Well, I don't think. Yes, Tim's intelligence and looks are highly attractive. Oh, snap. Ooh, that's the best part. Oh, I like Shout that. Out. We'll it. take it. I, I obviously don't think. Again, you, judging from the characterization, because you never know how accurate people are retelling anything, that's obviously not very good. The difference, though, distinctly, is that uh, a Mexican is an ethnicity, not a race, of course. Yeah. When it comes to race, a race is a social construct. Like, we were all talking earlier, what makes a race? Like, skin color, even that, not really. Facial features. Facial features, yeah. yeah. But even then, like, you can find people who, if, like, they're, like, they're black, people you know but if you change the tone of their skin you would instantly assume they were white looking at them you can find black people for whom that is not the case and then genetically it's a whole mess underneath the surface so when we talk about like what makes a person more white i mean am i more white than tim i it's there's obviously no yes. objective well if we look at genealogy i mean i'm all european so by that measure sure but when it comes to like culturally how do we treat people you know there are black people who get treated like pretty good because they're really really light I, skin and it's, it's really complicated i made a, a a joke in a video once about mixed race supremacy oh, like no. being sarcastic because I was, I was that's the future a, well i was reading an article that said that um people with uh parents from different parts of the planet typically have uh, uh, it, it's not hybrid vigor, but it's kind of more robust immune systems, right? Uh, more diverse genetics results in, you know, more r robust certain features or whatever. And so I was making a joke about it and I was kind of poking fun at ethno nationalism and a bunch of leftists screenshotted it to make it look like I was actually against myself. It was the weirdest, weirdest thing people have tried to smear. I, I unironically believe that, by the way. I mean, eventually, assuming we don't do some really weird na international, ethno-national stuff, uh, eventually we're all going to be a light shade of mocha, you know? Every, yeah. I, I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I think maybe, but China's ethno-nationalist. Sure, we'll, we'll, we'll see like how long. Asia's. I do not like China very much. We'll see how long that goes. And then, of course, eventually, I mean, even if it's light, if everyone's a light mocha brown, eventually the people who have settled in Africa are going to get darker, and the people who have settled in Scandinavia exactly. are going to get lighter. But whatever the case is, I, I'm just glad we can travel around the Dude, planet. do you want to know something crazy? What? There's like, I was reading this article about a place in China where the people there are very white, but with Asian features, and there's a legend of a Roman legion that was making That's its way that never came back and oh, they found think them. it settled and wow. then had a big family and created this area where all these people have like That's awesome. white Mediterranean I look it up Whoa. yeah and people don't realize that Russia is in Asia and like they don't realize what? that Russia is north of North yeah, Korea yeah they call it European but it it's yeah, all no. Asia. Yeah. It's, it's almost almost all Asia. Yeah. There yeah, so there's, there's a lot of people in Eastern Russia who have Asian features. There's a lot of uh, a lot of that like with um, features. Polynesian features as well. There are places all from like South Africa all the way up to, to Japan and Russia and even parts of Africa apparently where there's genetic clusters of people who the, the old like uh, seafaring Polynesian cultures would go to. It's actually pretty crazy how much diversity there was even before we were really an international species. Yeah, I, I think we need to clarify too when you said race is a, so race is a social construct because mm -hmm. this is something that I think is missed. Like there, there's there's a semantic difference between left and right on this one. We're talking about the there's a phenomenon where like you might see someone who is an albino black person and people will say that person is black regardless. And there are people who are who identify as black even though their skin is clearly white. Which shows that, you know, what features define what we qual qualify as like a race or whatever. The, the other argument that I, the reason I'm bringing this up is that there is a genetic component to specific races as we view them. And this is important because we actually have a law that protects people based on medical research to make sure they're getting adequate treatment. So I think sickle cell anemia is mm -hmm. more prominent mm -hmm. among African Americans. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's going yeah. down since they uh, since they got wow. well, shipped over here. Apparently, because a lot of it was uh, um, geographically determined. Mm -hmm. So like the conditions necessary, because the malaria is not yeah, really that malaria, much of a thing over here. Weird, weird thing. So, Mal air. They don't really it doesn't really have a meaning. Yeah, much. It's just bad air. You know? <laughs> the but the the uh, with regards to the social construct thing, it's all it's all a matter of like social perception. For a while, Italian people 
uh, were considered like swarthy, like kind of the way we would consider Spanish people, but now Spanish people are white. Obama yeah. is genetically half black and half white, but we all consider Dude, him black. They're like, yeah. it's just, yeah. The it's, world is not so black and white, is what they tell me. Not, yeah. But people are? Uh, no, mm, yeah. no, we're not. And yet you hate black. Do you think as we can evolve as we established this, in this conversation? Do you think we can evolve as a species to not call each other white and black? I think, well, that's the thing. We didn't until the mid-1600s. The entire modern conceptualization of race was like an ad hoc, intuitive response to a desire to scientifically separate the races. And what we ended up with was a system to cement white supremacy. It, initially, that was literally like, we're bringing slaves over from Africa. We know we're better than them. Let's study the genes as they knew it back then, skull cool. shapes, whatever. Free algae. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so, so they were like, well, of course we're different. Look at our brow shape. So there, here are the three categorizations of man. Yep. And and we what we use today are in Intuitive Asian, black, white, exactly the same. We've yep. updated a little. Same basic system. Mm -hmm. I got I got a comment that might make you angry. Give me. Are you sure? I'm ready. Do it. Hindu Andy says, tell Vosh to debate Nick Fuentes. He always dodges him. <laughs> Dude, I so the position that I'm in right here is that um, I'm totally fine to have Nick on the channel uh, if he wants to come on and he keeps like posturing on his own. All I ask, you just send me an email. We can like set up a time. It's really that simple. You know, look, but I, 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 but I, I, I never get that. I come on, Nick, that. let's do it. I, 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 I want to say this. Like, I, I know there are a lot of people that on the left who are going to insult me and insult you. I brought up a million times. But I've been reaching out to a bunch of lefties and Vosh was like, I'm totally down. It was like, the one, it was a simple booking. We, we reached out to you. We, we set it up. You came on the show. There are a lot of other people who are like, it's impossible. They, they either ignore, they deflect, they won't do it. So there's a lot of people who don't do this. But I'm, I'm grateful that you came on because it's well, yeah, not yeah, of an course. easy thing to do. I, I love talking to people. No, uh, yeah, the, uh, it's, it's, it's actually a little bit like kind of annoying, though, because I've said like 80 times, like, just email me. Please just oh, cool. yeah, oh, man. but I'll guys, find out later. but uh, it's, it's it's midnight. I think we yeah think yeah. So I'm making faces over here because <laughs> yeah. we really got to call lid because I got to get up and clip call this up in the morning. Lid. I'm calling yeah. a lid. Have, That's uh, what lid. I do. I have a, a, a early flight to catch. We're I gonna think, have to so. do this oh, again. Snap, yeah, did we going. do four hours? Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is dude! Great, man. I'm, 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 I really appreciate you coming on. I'm glad we had a lot to talk Super about. Like a second wind at 10:30. Oh my gosh! Awesome. You you brought up the time and then we were all you know we all were in big. I'm not either, man. This you will is, be in the you morning. Know what I, you know what I, think it is? I feel I think like we've been playing D and D. Well, I, I think I think a lot of the conversations that we typically have are with people that we've either heard from or ideas we've heard. And so with you, it's like we're we're getting into a lot of things and challenging, having a back and forth, which is which is good. And uh, you know, everybody thinks they're the smartest person in the universe, and we want to have real conversations with people, and you know, that's what we did. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up. Do you want to mention your, your channel or, or whatever for people who hate you to troll you or for people to like you to subscribe? Sure, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, if you, if you enjoyed what I had to say or if you didn't but are just really angry and want to let me know, uh, I'm, on, I'm on YouTube at Vosh, which is V-A-U-S-H. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I do, I do political commentary. I'm a libertarian socialist. I also play video games a lot. It's a fun time. Cool. Cool, man. Appreciate you coming on well, of course uh and we'll have you back dude whenever yeah um, for sure you can follow me on twitter instagram parlor at timcast you can follow my other channels youtube.com slash timcast youtube.com slash timcast news we are also on every single podcast platform wherever they exist of course you can follow ian yes ian crossland that is at ian crossland and you can follow me anywhere twitter instagram youtube i have a youtube channel oh, yeah. and of course you can follow at sour patch lids I am here, still here, four hours later. I'm dying over here. I'm tired, but Sour I patch. had this, such a great conversation. L-Y-D-S. Friends, I wish you good tidings and good clippings of this video. My oh, favorite gosh. is probably Ian saying he didn't <laughs> yes. like black. So, uh, I said I hate yeah, black. That was, <laughs> no black. Oh, that was man. really messed up, man. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Ian. Just necrotic and... What right, the heck, man? We're going to bed. We're going to bed. We'll <laughs> talking about all. the color. We'll the magic, magic the Gathering. Yeah, all right, it's too late. Bye, guys.